The Discourses of Epictetus Letter from Arian to Lucius Gellius with wishes for his happiness I neither wrote these discourses of Epictetus in the way in which a man might write such things, nor did I make them public myself, inasmuch as I declare that I did not even write them. But whenever I heard him say, the same I attempted to write down in his own words, as nearly as possible, for the purpose of preserving them as memorials to myself, afterwards of the thoughts and the freedom of speech of Epictetus. Accordingly, the discourses are naturally such as a man would address without preparation to another, not such as a man would write with the view of others reading them. Now, being such, I do not know how they fell into the hands of the public without either my consent or my knowledge, but it concerns me little if I shall be considered incompetent to write, and it concerns Epictetus not at all if any man shall despise his words. For at the time when he uttered them, it was plain that he had no other purpose than to move the minds of his hearers to the best things. If indeed these discourses should produce this effect, they will have, I think, the result which the words of philosophers ought to have. But if they shall not, let those who read them know that, when Epictetus delivered them, the hearer could not avoid being affected in the way that Epictetus wished him to be. But if the discourses themselves, as they are written, do not effect this result, it may be that the fault is mine, or it may be that the thing is unavoidable. Farewell. End of the letter from Arian to Lucius Gellius. Of the things which are in our power and not in our power. Of all the faculties, except that which I shall soon mention, you will find not one which is capable of contemplating itself, and consequently not capable either of approving or disapproving. How far does the grammatic art possess the contemplating power? As far as forming a judgment about what is written and spoken. And how far music? As far as judging about melody. Does either of them then contemplate itself? By no means. But when you must write something to your friend, grammar will tell you what words you should write. But whether you should write or not, grammar will not tell you. And so it is with music as to musical sounds. But whether you should sing at the present time and play on the lute, or do neither, music will not tell you. What faculty then will tell you? That which contemplates both itself and all other things. And what is this faculty? The rational faculty. For this is the only faculty that we have received which examines itself, what it is, and what power it has, and what is the value of this gift, and examines all other faculties. For what else is there which tells us that golden things are beautiful? For they do not say so themselves. Evidently, it is the faculty which is capable of judging of appearances. What else judges of music, grammar, and the other faculties, proves their uses and points out the occasions for using them? Nothing else. As then it was fit to be so, that which is best of all and supreme over all is the only thing which the gods have placed in our power, the right use of appearances. But all other things they have not placed in our power. Was it because they did not choose? I indeed think that, if they had been able, they would have put these other things also in our power, but they certainly could not. For as we exist on the earth and are bound to such a body and to such companions, how was it possible for us not to be hindered as to these things by externals? But what says Zeus? Epictetus, if it were possible, I would have made both your little body and your little property free and not exposed to hindrance. But now, be not ignorant of this, 
This body is not yours, but it is clay finely tempered. And since I was not able to do for you what I have mentioned, I have given you a small portion of us. This faculty of pursuing an object and avoiding it, and the faculty of desire and aversion, and in a word, the faculty of using the appearances of things. And if you will take care of this faculty and consider it your only possession, you will never be hindered, never meet with impediments, you will not lament, you will not blame, you will not flatter any person. Well, do these seem to you small matters? I hope not. Be content with them, then, and pray to the gods. But now, when it is in our power to look after one thing and to attach ourselves to it, we prefer to look after many things and to be bound to many things, to the body and to property, and to brother and to friend and to child and to slave. Since then we are bound to many things, we are depressed by them and dragged down. For this reason, when the weather is not fit for sailing, we sit down and torment ourselves, and continually look out to see what wind is blowing. It is the north. What is that to us? When will the west wind blow? When it shall choose, my good man, or when it shall please Aeolus. For God has not made you the manager of the winds, but Aeolus. What then? We must make the best use that we can of the things which are in our power, and use the rest according to their nature. What is their nature then? As God may please. Must I then alone have my head cut off? What? Would you have all men lose their heads that you may be consoled? Will you not stretch out your neck as Lateranus did at Rome when Nero ordered him to be beheaded? For when he had stretched out his neck and received a feeble blow which made him draw it in for a moment, he stretched it out again. And a little before, when he was visited by Epaphroditus, Nero's freedman, who asked him about the cause of offense which he had given, he said, If I choose to tell anything, I will tell your master. What then should a man have in readiness in such circumstances? What else than this? What is mine and what is not mine? And what is permitted to me and what is not permitted to me? I must die. Must I then die lamenting? I must be put in chains. Must I then also lament? I must go into exile. Does any man then hinder me from going with smiles and cheerfulness and contentment? Tell me the secret which you possess. I will not, for this is in my power. But I will put you in chains. Man, what are you talking about? Me in chains? You may fetter my leg, but my will not even Zeus himself can overpower. I will throw you into prison. My poor body, you mean. I will cut off your head. When, then, have I told you that my head alone cannot be cut off? These are the things which philosophers should meditate on, which they should write daily, in which they should exercise themselves. Thrasia used to say, I would rather be killed today than banished tomorrow. What then did Rufus say to him? If you choose death as the heavier misfortune, how great is the folly of your choice? But if, as the lighter, who has given you the choice, will you not study to be content with that which has been given to you? What then did Agrippina say? He said, I am not a hindrance to myself. When it was reported to him that his trial was going on in the Senate, he said, I hope it may turn out well, but it is the fifth hour of the day. This was the time when he was used to exercise himself and then take the cold bath. Let us go and take our exercise. 
After he had taken his exercise, one comes and tells him, You have been condemned. To banishment, he replies, or to death. To banishment. What about my property? It is not taken from you. Let us go to Arikia then, he said, and dine. This it is to have studied what a man ought to study, to have made desire, aversion, free from hindrance, and free from all that a man would avoid. I must die. If now, I am ready to die. If after a short time, I now dine because it is the dinner hour. After this, I will then die. How? Like a man who gives up what belongs to another. How a man should proceed from the principle of God being the father of all men to the rest. If a man should be able to assent to this doctrine as he ought, that we are all sprung from God in an especial manner, and that God is the Father both of men and of gods. I suppose that he would never have any ignoble or mean thoughts about himself. But if Caesar, the emperor, should adopt you, no one could endure your arrogance. And if you know that you are the son of Zeus, will you not be elated? Yet we do not so. But since these two things are mingled in the generation of man, body in common with the animals, and reason and intelligence in common with the gods, many incline to this kinship, which is miserable and mortal, and some few to that which is divine and happy. Since, then, it is of necessity that every man uses everything according to the opinion which he has about it, those the few, who think that they are formed for fidelity and modesty and a sure use of appearances, have no mean or ignoble thoughts about themselves. But with the many, it is quite the contrary. For they say, What am I, a poor, miserable man with my wretched bit of flesh? Wretched indeed but you possess something better than your bit of flesh. Why then do you neglect that which is better, and why do you attach yourself to this? Through this kinship with the flesh, some of us inclining to it become like wolves, faithless and treacherous and mischievous. Some become like lions, savage and bestial and untamed but the greater part of us become foxes and other worse animals. For what else is a slanderer and a malignant man than a fox, or some other more wretched and meaner animal? See then, and take care that you do not become some one of these miserable things. Of Progress or Improvement He who is making progress, having learned from philosophers that desire means the desire of good things, and aversion means aversion from bad things, have learned too that happiness and tranquility are not attainable by man, otherwise than by not failing to obtain what he desires, and not falling into that which he would avoid. Such a man takes from himself desire altogether, and defers it but he employs his aversion only on things which are dependent on his will. For if he attempts to avoid anything independent of his will, he knows that sometimes he will fall in with something which he wishes to avoid, and he will be unhappy. Now, if virtue promises good fortune and tranquility and happiness, certainly also the progress toward virtue is progress toward each of these things. For it is always true that, to whatever point the perfecting of anything leads us, progress is an approach toward this point. How then do we admit that virtue is such as I have said? And yet, 
seek progress in other things and make a display of it. What is the product of virtue? Tranquility. Who then makes improvement? It is he who has read many books of Chrysippus. But does virtue consist in having understood Chrysippus? If this is so, progress is clearly nothing else than knowing a great deal of Chrysippus. But now we admit that virtue produces one thing, and we declare that approaching near to it is another thing, namely, progress or improvement. Such a person, says one, is already able to read Chrysippus by himself. Indeed, sir, you are making great progress. What kind of progress? But why do you mock the man? Why do you draw him away from the perception of his own misfortunes? Will you not show him the effect on virtue that he may learn where to look for improvement? Seek it there, wretch, where your work lies. And where is your work? In desire and in aversion, that you may not be disappointed in your desire, and that you may not fall into that which you would avoid. In your pursuit and avoiding that you commit no error, in assent and suspension of assent, that you be not deceived. The first things, and the most necessary, are those which I have named. But if with trembling and lamentation you seek not to fall into that which you avoid, tell me how you are improving. Do you then show me your improvement in these things? If I were talking to an athlete, I should say, Show me your shoulders, and then he might say, Here are my halteris. You and your halteris look to that. I should reply, I wish to see the effect of the halteris. So, when you say, Take the treatise on the active powers, and see how I have studied it. I reply, Slave, I am not inquiring about this, but how you exercise pursuit and avoidance desire and aversion, how you design and purpose and prepare yourself, whether conformably to nature or not. If conformably, give me evidence of it, and I will say that you are making progress. But if not conformably, be gone, and not only expound your books, but write such books yourself. And what will you gain by it? Do you not know that the whole book costs only five denarii? Does then the expounder seem to be worth more than five denarii? Never then look for the matter itself in one place, then progress towards it in another. Where then is progress? If any of you, withdrawing himself from externals, turns to his own will, to exercise it and to improve it by labor so as to make it conformable to nature— elevated, free, unrestrained, unimpeded, faithful, modest. And if he has learned that he who desires or avoids the things which are not in his power can neither be faithful nor free, but of necessity he must change with them and be tossed about with them as in a tempest, and of necessity must subject himself to others who have the power to procure or prevent what he desires or would avoid. Finally, when he rises in the morning, if he observes and keeps these rules, bathes as a man of fidelity, eats as a modest man, in like manner, if in every matter that occurs he works out his chief principles, as the runner does with reference to running, and the trainer of the voice with reference to the voice, this is the man who truly makes progress and this is the man who has not traveled in vain. But if he has strained his efforts to the practice of reading books, and labors only at this, and has traveled for this, I tell him to return home immediately, and not to neglect his affairs there, for this for which he has traveled is nothing. But the other thing is something to study how a man can rid his life of lamentation and groaning, and saying, Woe to me, and wretched that I am, and to rid it also of misfortune and disappointment, 
and to learn what death is, and exile, and prison, and poison, that he may be able to say when he is in fetters, Dear Crito, if it is the will of the gods that it be so, let it be so. And not to say, Wretched am I, an old man, have I kept my gray hairs for this? Who is it that speaks thus? Do you think that I shall name some man of no repute and of low condition? Does not Priam say this? Does not Oedipus say this? Nay, all kings say it. For what else is tragedy than the perturbations of men who value externals exhibited in this kind of poetry? But if a man must learn by fiction that no external things which are independent of the will concern us, for my part I should like this fiction, by the aid of which I should live happily and undisturbed. But you must consider for yourselves what you wish. What then does Chrysippus teach us? The reply is, to know that these things are not false, from which happiness comes and tranquility arises. Take my books, and you will learn how true and conformable to nature are the things which make me free from perturbations. Oh, great good fortune! Oh, the great benefactor who points out the way! To Triptolemus, all men have erected temples and altars, because he gave us food by cultivation. But to him who discovered truth, and brought it to light and communicated it to all, not the truth which shows us how to live, but how to live well. Who of you for this reason has built an altar, or a temple, or has dedicated a statue, or who worships God for this? Because the gods have given the vine, or wheat, we sacrifice to them. But because they have produced in the human mind that fruit by which they design to show us the truth which relates to happiness, shall we not thank God for this? Against the Academics if a man, said Epictetus, opposes evident truths, it is not easy to find arguments by which we shall make him change his opinion. But this does not arise either from the man's strength or the teacher's weakness. For when the man, though he has been confuted, is hardened like a stone, how shall we then be able to deal with him by argument? Now, there are two kinds of hardening one of the understanding, the other of the sense of shame. When a man is resolved not to assent to what is manifest, nor to desist from contradictions. Most of us are afraid of mortification of the body, and would contrive all means to avoid such a thing. But we care not about the soul's mortification. And indeed, with regard to the soul, if a man be in such a state as not to apprehend anything, or understand at all, we think that he is in a bad condition. But if the sense of shame and modesty are deadened, this we call even power or strength. Do you comprehend that you are awake? I do not, the man replies, for I do not even comprehend when in my sleep I imagine that I am awake. Does this appearance then not differ from the other? Not at all, he replies. Shall I still argue with this man? And what fire or what iron shall I apply to him to make him feel that he is deadened? He does not perceive, but he pretends that he does not. He is even worse than a dead man. He does not see the contradiction. He is in a bad condition. Another does see it, but he is not moved and makes no improvement. He is even in a worse condition. His modesty is extirpated, and his sense of shame. And the rational faculty has not been cut off from him, but it is brutalized. Shall I name this strength of mind? Certainly not. 
unless we also name it such in catamites, through which they do and say in public whatever comes into their head. Of Providence From everything which is or happens in the world, it is easy to praise Providence if a man possesses these two qualities. The faculty of seeing what belongs and happens to all persons and things, and a grateful disposition. If he does not possess these two qualities, one man will not see the use of things which are and which happen, another will not be thankful for them, even if he does know them. If God had made colors, but had not made the faculty of seeing them, what would have been their use? None at all. On the other hand, if he had made the faculty of vision, but had not made objects such as to fall under the faculty, what in the case also would have been the use of it? None at all. Well, suppose that he had made both, but had not made light. In that case also, they would have been of no use. Who is it, then, who has fitted this to that and that to this? And who is it that has fitted the knife to the case and the case to the knife? Is it no one? And indeed, from the very structure of things which have attained their completion, we are accustomed to show that the work is certainly the act of some artificer, and that it has not been constructed without a purpose. Does then each of these things demonstrate the workman? And do not visible things and the faculty of seeing and light demonstrate him. And the existence of male and female, and the desire of each for conjunction, and the power of using the parts which are constructed, do not even these declare the workmen? If they do not, let us consider the constitution of our understanding according to which, when we meet with sensible objects, we do not simply receive impressions from them, but we also select something from them and subtract something, and add and compound by means of them these things or those, and in fact pass from some other things which, in a manner, resemble them. Is not even this sufficient to move some men, and to induce them not to forget the workmen? If not so, let them explain to us what it is that makes each several thing, or how it is possible that things so wonderful and like the contrivances of art, should exist by chance, and from their own proper motion. What, then, are these things done in us only? Many indeed in us only, of which the rational animal had peculiarly need. But you will find many common to us with irrational animals. Do they then understand what is done? By no means. For use is one thing, and understanding is another. God had need of irrational animals to make use of appearances, but of us to understand the use of appearances. It is therefore enough for them to eat and to drink and to sleep and to copulate and to do all the other things which they severally do. But for us, to whom he has given also the intellectual faculty, these things are not sufficient. For unless we act in a proper and orderly manner, and conformably to the nature and constitution of each thing, we shall never attain our true end. For where the constitutions of living beings are different, there also the acts and the ends are different. In those animals, then, whose constitution is adapted only to use, use alone is enough. But in an animal, like man, which has also the power of understanding the use Unless there be the due exercise of the understanding, he will never attain his proper end. Well then, God constitutes every animal, one to be eaten, another to serve for agriculture, another to supply cheese, and another for some like use, for which purposes what need is there to understand appearances, and to be able to distinguish them. But, God has introduced man to be a spectator of God and of his works, and not only a spectator of them, but an interpreter. 
For this reason, it is shameful for man to begin and to end where irrational animals do. But rather, he ought to begin where they begin, and to end where nature ends in us. And nature ends in contemplation and understanding, and in a way of life conformable to nature. Take care, then, not to die without having been spectators of these things. But you take a journey to Olympus to see the works of Phidias, and all of you think it a misfortune to die without having seen such things. But when there is no need to take a journey, and where a man is, there he has the works of God before him, will you not desire to see and understand them? Will you not perceive either? What you are, or what you were born for, or what this is for, which you have received the faculty of sight? But you may say, There are some things disagreeable and troublesome in life. And are there none at Olympia? Are you not scorched? Are you not pressed by a crowd? Are you not without comfortable means of bathing? Are you not wet when it rains? Have you not abundance of noise, clamor, and other disagreeable things? But I suppose that, setting all these things off against the magnificence of the spectacle, you bear and endure. Well then, and have you not received faculties by which you will be able to bear all that happens? Have you not received greatness of soul? Have you not received manliness? Have you not received endurance? And why do I trouble myself about anything that can happen if I possess greatness of soul? What shall distract my mind or disturb me, or appear painful? Shall I not use the power for the purposes for which I received it? And shall I grieve and lament over what happens? Yes, but my nose runs. For what purpose, then, slave, have you hands? Is it not that you may wipe your nose? Is it then consistent with reason that there should be running of noses in the world? Nay, how much better it is to wipe your nose than to find fault. What do you think that Hercules would have been if there had not been such a lion and hydra and stag and boar and certain unjust and bestial men? whom Hercules used to drive away and clear out. And what would have been doing if there had been nothing of the kind? Is it not plain that he would have wrapped himself up and have slept? In the first place, then, he would not have been a Hercules when he was dreaming away all his life in such luxury and ease. And even if he had been one, what would have been the use of him? and what the use of his arms and of the strength of the other parts of his body, and his endurance and noble spirit, if such circumstances and occasions had not roused and exercised him. Well then, must a man provide for himself such means of exercise, and seek to introduce a lion from some place into his country, and a boar, and a hydra, this would be folly and madness. But as they did exist and were found, they were useful for showing what Hercules was and for exercising him. Come then, do you also, having observed these things, look to the faculties which you have, and when you have looked at them, say, Bring now, O Zeus, any difficulty that thou pleasest, for I have means given to me by thee and powers for honoring myself through the things which happen. You do not so, but you sit still, trembling for fear that some things will happen, and weeping and lamenting and groaning for what does happen. And then you blame the gods. For what is the consequence of such meanness of spirit but in piety? And yet God has not only given us these faculties— by which we shall be able to bear everything that happens without being depressed or broken by it. But like a good king and a true father, he has given us these faculties free from hindrance, subject to no compulsion, unimpeded, and has put them entirely in our own power, 
without even having reserved to himself any power of hindering or impeding. You, who have received these powers free and as your own, use them not. You do not even see what you have received. And from whom? Some of you being blinded to the giver and not even acknowledging your benefactor. And others, through meanness of spirit, betaking yourselves to fault-finding and making charges against God. Yet I will show to you that you have powers and means for greatness of soul and manliness. But what powers you have for finding fault and making accusations, do you show me. Of the use of sophistical arguments and hypothetical and the like. the handling of sophistical and hypothetical arguments, and those of which derive their conclusions from questioning, and in a word, the handling of all such arguments, relates to the duties of life, though the many do not know this truth. For in every matter we inquire how the wise and good man shall discover the proper path and the proper method of dealing with the matter. Let, then, people either say that the grave man will not descend into the contest of question and answer, or that if he does descend into the contest, he will take no care about not conducting himself rashly or carelessly in questioning and answering. But if they do not allow either the one or the other of these things, they must admit that some inquiry ought to be made into these topics— on which particularly questioning and answering are employed. For what is the end proposed in reasoning? To establish true propositions, to remove the false, to withhold assent from those which are not plain. Is it enough, then, to have learned only this? It is enough a man may reply. It is then also enough for a man who would not make a mistake in the use of coined money to have heard this precept, that he should receive the genuine drachme and reject the spurious? It is not enough. What then ought to be added to this precept? What else than the faculty which proves and distinguishes the genuine and the spurious drachme? Consequently also in reasoning what has been said is not enough. But it is necessary that a man should acquire the faculty of examining and distinguishing the true and the false, and that which is not plain? It is necessary. Besides this, what is proposed in reasoning? That you should accept what follows from that which you have properly granted. Well, is it then enough in this case also to know this? It is not enough. But a man must learn how one thing is a consequence of other things, and when one thing follows from one thing, and when it follows from several collectively. Consider then if it be not necessary that this power should also be acquired by him, who purposes to conduct himself skillfully in reasoning. The power of demonstrating himself the several things which he has proposed, and the power of understanding the demonstrations of others, and of not being deceived by sophists, as if they were demonstrating. Therefore there has arisen among us the practice and exercise of conclusive arguments and figures, and it has been shown to be necessary. But, in fact, in some cases, we have properly granted the premises or assumptions, and there results from them something. And though it is not true, yet nonetheless it does result. What then ought I to do? Ought I to admit the falsehood? And how is that possible? Well, should I say that I did not properly grant that which we agreed upon, but you are not allowed to do even this? Shall I then say that the consequence does not arise through what has been conceded? But neither is this allowed. What then must be done in this case? Consider if it is not this, as to have borrowed is not enough to make a man still a debtor, but to this must be added the fact that he continues to owe the money 
and that the debt is not paid. So, it is not enough to compel you to admit the inference that you have granted the premises, but you must abide by what you have granted. Indeed, if the premises continue to the end, such as they were when they were granted, it is absolutely necessary for us to abide by what we have granted, and we must accept their consequences. But if the premises do not remain such as they were when they were granted, it is absolutely necessary for us also to withdraw from what we granted and from accepting what does not follow from the words in which our concessions were made. For the inference is now not our inference, nor does it result with our assent, since we have withdrawn from the premises which we granted. We ought then both to examine such kinds of premises, and such change and variation of them, from one meaning to another, by which in the course of answering or questioning, or in making the syllogistic conclusion, or in any other such way, the premises undergo variations, and give occasion to the foolish to be confounded, if they do not see what conclusions consequences are. For what reason ought we to examine? In order that we may not in this matter be employed in an improper manner, nor in a confused way. And the same in hypotheses and hypothetical arguments. For it is necessary sometimes to demand the granting of some hypothesis, as a kind of passage to the argument which follows. Must we then allow every hypothesis that is proposed, or not allow every one? And if not every one, which should we allow? And if a man has allowed an hypothesis, must he in every case abide by allowing it? Or must he sometimes withdraw from it but admit the consequences and not admit contradictions? Yes, but suppose that a man says, If you admit the hypothesis of a possibility, I will draw you to an impossibility. With such a person, shall a man of sense refuse to enter into a contest and avoid discussion and conversation with him? But what other man than the man of sense can use argumentation and is skillful in questioning and answering, and incapable of being cheated and deceived by false reasoning? And shall he enter into the contest, and yet not take care whether he shall engage in argument not rashly and not carelessly? And if he does not take care, how can he be such a man as we conceive him to be? But without some such exercise and preparation, can he maintain a continuous and consistent argument? Let them show this, and all these speculations become superfluous, and are absurd and inconsistent with our notion of a good and serious man. Why are we still indolent and negligent and sluggish. And why do we seek pretenses for not laboring and not being watchful and cultivating our reason? If, then, I shall make a mistake in these matters, may I not have killed my father? Slave, where was there a father in this matter that you could kill him? What, then, have you done? The only fault that was possible here is the fault which you have committed. This is the very remark which I made to Rufus when he blamed me for not having discovered the one thing omitted in a certain syllogism. I suppose, I said, that I have burnt the capital. Slave, he replied, was the thing omitted here, the capital? Or are these the only crimes, to burn the capital and to kill your father? But for a man to use the appearances presented to him rashly and foolishly and carelessly, and not to understand argument, nor demonstration, nor sophism, nor, in a word, to see in questioning and answering what is consistent with that which we have granted or is not consistent. Is there no error in this? That the faculties are not safe to the uninstructed. in as many ways as we can change things which are equivalent to one another, 
In just so many ways can we change the form of arguments and enthymemes in argumentation. This is an instance. If you have borrowed and not repaid, you owe me the money. You have not borrowed and you have not repaid. Then you do not owe me the money. To do this skillfully is suitable to no man more than to a philosopher. For if the enthymeme is an imperfect syllogism, it is plain that he who has been exercised in the perfect syllogism must be equally expert in the imperfect also. Why then do we not exercise ourselves and one another in this manner? Because, I reply, at present, though we are not exercised in these things, and not distracted from the study of morality, by me at least, still we make no progress in virtue. What then must we expect if we should add this occupation? And particularly as this would not be only an occupation which would withdraw us from more necessary things, but would also be a cause of self-conceit and arrogance, and no small cause. For great is the power of arguing and the faculty of persuasion, and particularly if it should be much exercised, and also receive additional ornament from language. And so universally, every faculty acquired by the uninstructed and weak brings with it the danger of these persons being elated and inflated by it. For by what means could one persuade a young man who excels in these matters that he ought not to become an appendage to them, but to make them an appendage to himself? Does he not trample on all such reasons and strut before us elated and inflated, not enduring that any man should reprove him and remind him of what he has neglected and to what he has turned aside? What, then? Was not Plato a philosopher? I reply, and was not Hippocrates a physician? But you see how Hippocrates speaks. Does Hippocrates then speak thus in respect of being a physician? Why do you mingle things which have been accidentally united in the same men? And if Plato was handsome and strong, ought I also to set to work and endeavor to become handsome or strong, as if this was necessary for philosophy? because a certain philosopher was at the same time handsome and a philosopher? Will you not choose to see and to distinguish in respect to what men become philosophers and what things belong to them in other respects? And if I were a philosopher, ought you also to be made lame? What then? Do I take away these faculties which you possess— by no means, for neither do I take away the faculty of seeing. But if you ask me what is the good of man, I cannot mention to you anything else than that it is a certain disposition of the will with respect to appearances. How from the fact that we are akin to God a man may proceed to the consequences. If the things are true which are said by the philosophers about the kinship between God and man, what else remains for men to do than what Socrates did? Never in reply to the question, To what country you belong, say that you are an Athenian or a Corinthian, but that you are a citizen of the world. For why do you say that you are an Athenian? And why do you not say that you belong to the small nook only into which your poor body was cast at birth? Is it not plain that you call yourself an Athenian or Corinthian from the place which has a greater authority and comprises not only that small nook itself and all your family, but even the whole country from which the stock of your progenitors is derived down to you? He then who has observed with intelligence the administration of the world, and has learned that the greatest and supreme and the most comprehensive community is that which is composed of men and God, and that from God have descended the seeds not only to my father and grandfather, but to all beings which are generated on the earth, and are produced, and are particularly to rational beings." 
for these only are by their nature formed to have communion with God, being by means of reason conjoined with him. Why should not such a man call himself a citizen of the world? Why not a son of God? And why should he be afraid of anything which happens among men? Is kinship with Caesar, the emperor, or with any other of the powerful in Rome sufficient to enable us to live in safety, and above contempt, and without any fear at all? And to have God for your maker and father and guardian, shall not this release us from sorrows and fears? But a man may say, Whence shall I get bread to eat when I have nothing? And how do slaves and runaways, on what do they rely when they leave their masters? Do they rely on their lands or slaves or their vessels of silver? They rely on nothing but themselves, and food does not fail them. And shall it be necessary for one among us who is a philosopher to travel into foreign parts, and trust to and rely on others, and not to take care of himself? And shall he be inferior to irrational animals, and more cowardly, each of which being self-sufficient neither fails to get its proper food, nor to find a suitable way of living, and one conformable to nature? I indeed think that the old man ought to be sitting here, not to contrive how you may have no mean thoughts nor mean and ignoble talk about yourselves, but to take care that there be not among us any young men of such a mind, that when they have recognized their kinship to God, and that we are fettered by these bonds, the body, I mean, and its possessions, and whatever else on account of them is necessary to us for the economy and commerce of life. They should intend to throw off these things as if they were burdens painful and intolerable, and to depart to their kinsmen. But this is the labor that your teacher and instructor ought to be employed upon, if he really were what he should be. You should come to him and say, Epictetus, we can no longer endure being bound to this poor body, and feeding it and giving it drink and rest and cleaning it, and for the sake of the body complying with the wishes of these and of those. Are not these things indifferent and nothing to us? And is not death no evil? And are we not in a manner kinsmen of God, and did we not come from him? Allow us to depart the place from which we came. Allow us to be released at last from these bonds by which we are bound and weighed down. Here there are robbers and thieves and courts of justice, and those who are named tyrants, and think that they have some power over us by means of the body and its possessions. Permit us to show them that they have no power over any man. And I on my part would say, Friends, wait for God. When he shall give the signal and release you from this service, then go to him. But for the present, endure to dwell in this place where he has put you. Short indeed is the time of your dwelling here and easy to bear for those who are so disposed. For what tyrant, or what thief, or what courts of justice are formidable to those who have thus considered as things of no value the body and the possessions of the body? Wait then, do not depart without a reason. Something like this ought to be said by the teacher to ingenuous youths. But now what happens? The teacher is a lifeless body, and you are lifeless bodies. When you have been well fitted today, you sit down and lament about the morrow, how you shall get something to eat. Wretch, if you have it, you will have it. If you have it not, you will depart from life. The door is open. Why do you grieve? Where does there remain any room for tears? And where is there occasion for flattery? Why shall one man envy another? Why should a man admire the rich or the powerful, even if they be both very strong and of violent temper? 
for what will they do to us? We shall not care for that which they can do. And what we do care for, that they cannot do. How did Socrates behave with respect to these matters? Why, in what other way than a man ought to do who was convinced that he was a kinsman of the gods? If you say to me now, said Socrates to his judges, we will acquit you on the condition that you no longer discourse in the way in which you have hitherto discoursed, nor trouble either our young or our old men. I shall answer, you make yourselves ridiculous by thinking that if one of our commanders has appointed me to a certain spot, it is my duty to keep and maintain it and to resolve to die a thousand times rather than desert it. But if God has put us in any place and way of life, we ought to desert it. Socrates speaks like a man who is really a kinsman of the gods. But we think about ourselves as if we were only stomachs and intestines and shameful parts. We fear, we desire, we flatter those who are able to help us in these matters, and we fear them also. A man asked me to write to Rome about him, a man who, as most people thought, had been unfortunate, for formerly he was a man of rank and riches, but had been stripped of all and was living here. I wrote on his behalf, in a submissive manner, but when he had read the letter he gave it back to me and said, I wish for your help, not your pity, no evil has happened to me. Thus also, Musonius Rufus, in order to try me, used to say, This and this will befall you from your master. And when I replied that these were things which happen in the ordinary course of human affairs. Why then, said he, should I ask him for anything when I can obtain it from you? For in fact, when a man has from himself, it is superfluous and foolish to receive from another. Shall I then, who am able to receive from myself greatness of soul and a generous spirit, receive from you land and money or a magisterial office? I hope not. I will not be so ignorant about my own possessions. But when a man is cowardly and mean, what else must be done for him than to write letters as you would about a corpse? Please to grant us the body of a certain person and a sextarius of poor blood. For such a person is, in fact, a carcass and a sextarius, a certain quantity of blood, and nothing more. But if he were anything more, we would know that one man is not miserable through the means of another. against those who eagerly seek preferment at Rome. If we applied ourselves as busily to our own work as the old men at Rome do to those matters about which they are employed, perhaps we also might accomplish something. I am acquainted with a man older than myself, who is now superintendent of corn at Rome, and I remember the time when he came here on his way back from exile, and what he said as he related the events of his former life, and how he declared that with respect to the future after his return, he would look after nothing else than passing the rest of his life in quiet and tranquility. For how little of life, he said, remains for me. I replied, you will not do it, but as soon as you smell Rome... You will forget all that you have said, and if admission is allowed even into the imperial palace, he will gladly thrust himself in and thank God. If you find me, Epictetus, he answered, setting even one foot within the palace, think what you please. Well, what then did he do? Before he entered the city, he was met by letters from Caesar, and as soon as he received them, he forgot all and ever after has added one piece of business to another. I wish that I were now by his side to remind him of what he said when he was passing this way, 
and to tell him how much better a seer I am than he is. Well, then, do I say that man is an animal made for doing nothing? Certainly not. But why are we not active? We are active. For example, as to myself, as soon as day comes, in a few words I remind myself of what I must read over to my pupils. Then forthwith I say to myself, But what is it to me how a certain person shall read? The first thing for me is to sleep. And indeed, what resemblance is there between what other persons do and what we do? If you observe what they do, you will understand. And what else do they do all day long than make up accounts, inquire among themselves, give and take advice about some small quantity of grain, a bit of land, and such kind of profits? Is it then the same thing to receive a petition and to read in it, I entreat you to permit me to export a small quantity of coin? And one to this effect, I entreat you to learn from Chrysippus what is the administration of the world, and what place in it the rational animal holds. Consider also who you are and what is the nature of your good and bad. Are these things like the other? Do they require equal care? And is it equally base to neglect these and those? Well then, are we the only persons who are lazy and love sleep? No, but much rather you young men are. For we old men, when we see young men amusing themselves, are eager to play with them. And if I saw you active and zealous, much more should I be eager myself to join you in your serious pursuits. Of Natural Affection When he was visited by one of the magistrates, Epictetus inquired of him about several particulars, and asked if he had children and a wife. The man replied that he had, and Epictetus inquired further, how he felt under the circumstances. Miserable, the man said. Then Epictetus asked, In what respect? For men do not marry and beget children in order to be wretched, but rather to be happy. But I, the man replied, am so wretched about my children that lately, when my little daughter was sick and was supposed to be in danger, I could not endure to stay with her. But I left home till a person sent me news that she had recovered. Well then, said Epictetus, do you think that you acted right? I acted naturally, the man said. But convince me of this, that you acted naturally, and I will convince you that everything which takes place according to nature takes place rightly. This is the case, said the man, with all or at least most fathers. I do not deny that. But the matter about which we are inquiring is whether such behavior is right. For in respect to this matter we must say that tumors also come for the good of the body, because they do come. And generally... We must say that to do wrong is natural because nearly all, or at least most of us, do wrong. Do you show me, then, how your behavior is natural? I cannot, he said. But do you rather show me how it is not according to nature, and it is not rightly done? Well, said Epictetus, if we were inquiring about white and black, what criterion should we employ for distinguishing between them? The sight, he said. And if about hot and cold and hard and soft, what criterion? The touch. Well then, since we are inquiring about things which are according to nature, and those which are done rightly or not rightly, what kind of criterion do you think that we should employ? I do not know, he said. And yet, not to know the criterion of colors and smells, and also of tastes, is perhaps no great harm. But if a man do not know the criterion of good and bad, and of things according to nature and contrary to nature, does this seem to you a small harm? The greatest harm, I think. Come, 
Tell me, do all things which seem to some persons to be good and becoming rightly appear such? And at present, as to Jews and Syrians and Egyptians and Romans, is it possible that the opinions of all of them in respect to food are right? How is it possible? He said. Well, I suppose it is absolutely necessary that, if the opinions of the Egyptians are right, the opinions of the rest must be wrong. If the opinions of the Jews are right, those of the rest cannot be right. Certainly. But where there is ignorance, there also is want of learning and training in things which are necessary. He assented to this. You then, said Epictetus, since you know this, for the future will employ yourself seriously about nothing else, and will apply your mind to nothing else than to learn the criterion of things which are according to nature, and by using it also to determine each several thing. But in the present matter, I have so much as this to aid you toward what you wish. Does affection to those of your family appear to you to be according to nature and to be good? Certainly. Well, is such affection natural and good, and is a thing consistent with reason not good? By no means. Is then that which is consistent with reason in contradiction with affection? I think not. You are right, for if it is otherwise, it is necessary that one of the contradictions being according to nature, the other must be contrary to nature. Is it not so? It is, he said. Whatever, then, we shall discover to be at the same time affectionate and also consistent with reason. This we confidently declare to be right and good. Agreed. Well, then to leave your sick child and to go away is not reasonable, and I suppose that you will not say that it is. But it remains for us to inquire if it is consistent with affection. Yes, let us consider. Did you then, since you had an affectionate disposition to your child, do right when you ran off and left her? And has the mother no affection for the child? Certainly she has. Ought then the mother also to have left her, or ought she not? She ought not. And the nurse, does she love her? She does. Ought then she also to have left her? By no means. And the pedagogue, does he not love her? He does love her. Ought then he also to have deserted her? And so should the child have been left alone and without help on account of the great affection of you, the parents, and of those about her? Or should she have died in the hands of those who neither loved her nor cared for her? Certainly not. Now, this is unfair and unreasonable. Not to allow those who have equal affection with yourself to do what you think to be proper for yourself to do because you have affection. It is absurd. Come then, if you were sick, would you wish your relations to be so affectionate, and all the rest, children and wife, as to leave you alone and deserted? By no means. And would you wish to be so loved by your own that through your excessive affection you would always be left alone in sickness? Or, for this reason, would you rather pray, if it were possible, to be loved by your enemies and deserted by them? But, if this is so, it results that your behavior was not at all an affectionate act. Well, then, was it nothing which moved you and induced you to desert your child? And how is that possible? But it might be something of the kind which moved a man at Rome to wrap up his head while a horse was running which he favored. And when, contrary to expectation, the horse won... He required sponges to recover from his fainting fit. What then is the thing which moved? The exact discussion of this does not belong to the present occasion, perhaps. But it is enough to be convinced of this. If what the philosophers say is true, that we must not look for it anywhere without, but in all cases it is one and the same thing which is the cause of our doing or not doing something of saying or not saying something, 
of being elated or depressed, of avoiding anything or pursuing, the very thing which is now the cause to me and to you, to you of coming to me and sitting and hearing, and to me of saying what I do say. And what is this? Is it any other than our will to do so? No other. But if we had willed otherwise, what else should we have been doing than that which we willed to do? This, then, was the cause of Achilles' lamentation, not the death of Patroclus. For another man does not behave thus on the death of his companion. But it was because he chose to do so. And to you this was the very cause of your then running away, that you chose to do so. And on the other side, if you should hereafter stay with her, the reason will be the same. And now you are going to Rome because you choose, and if you should change your mind, you will not go thither. And in a word, neither death, nor exile, nor pain, nor anything of the kind is the cause of our doing anything or not doing, but our own opinions and our wills. Do I convince you of this or not? You do convince me. Such then as the causes are in each case, such also are the effects. When then we are doing anything not rightly, from this day we shall impute it to nothing else than to the will, or opinion, from which we have done it. And it is that which we shall endeavor to take away and to extirpate more than the tumors and abscesses out of the body. And in like manner we shall give the same account of the cause of the things which we do right. And we shall no longer allege as causes of any evil to us, either slave or neighbor, or wife or children, being persuaded that if we do not think things to be what we do think them to be, we do not the acts which follow from such opinions. And as to thinking or not thinking, that is in our power and not in externals. It is so, he said. From this day, then, we shall inquire into and examine nothing else, what its quality is, or its state, neither land nor slaves nor horses nor dogs, nothing else than opinions. I hope so. You see then that you must become a scholasticus, an animal whom all ridicule, if you really intend to make an examination of your own opinions, and that this is not the work of one hour or day. You know yourself." Of Contentment With respect to gods, there are some who say that a divine being does not exist. Others say that it exists but is inactive and careless, and takes no forethought about anything. A third class say that such a being exists and exercises forethought, but only about great things and heavenly things, and about nothing on the earth. A fourth class say that a divine being exercises forethought both about things on the earth and heavenly things, but in a general way only, and not about things severally. There is a fifth class, to whom Ulysses and Socrates belong, who say, I move not without thy knowledge. Before all other things, then, it is necessary to inquire about each of these opinions, whether it is affirmed truly or not truly. For if there are no gods, how is it our proper end to follow them? And if they exist but take no care of anything, in this case also, how will it be right to follow them? But if indeed they do exist and look after things, Still, if there is nothing communicated from them to men, nor in fact to myself, how even so is it right to follow them? The wise and good man, then, after considering all these things, submits his own mind to him who administers the whole, as good citizens do to the law of the state. He who is receiving instruction ought to come to be instructed with this intention. How shall I follow the gods in all things? How shall I be contented with the divine administration? And how can I become free? 
For he is free to whom everything happens according to his will, and whom no man can hinder. What, then, is freedom madness? Certainly not. For madness in freedom do not consist. But you say, I would have everything result just as I like, and in whatever way I like. You are mad. You are beside yourself. Do you not know that freedom is a noble and valuable thing? But for me, inconsiderately to wish for things to happen as I inconsiderately like, this appears to be not only not noble, but even most base. For how do we proceed in the matter of writing? Do I wish to write the name of Dion as I choose? No, but I am taught to choose to write it as it ought to be written. And how with respect to music? In the same manner. And what universally in every art or science? Just the same. If it were not so, it would be of no value to know anything, if knowledge were adapted to every man's whim. Is it then in this alone, in this which is the greatest and the chief thing, I mean freedom, that I am permitted to will inconsiderately? By no means, but to be instructed in this, to learn to wish that everything may happen as it does. And how do things happen? As the disposer has disposed them? And he has appointed summer and winter, and abundance and scarcity and virtue and vice, and all such opposites for the harmony of the whole. And to each of us he has given a body, and parts of the body, and possessions, and companions. Remembering, then, this disposition of things, we ought to go to be instructed, not that we may change the constitution of things, for we have not the power to do it nor is it better that we should have the power. But in order that, as the things around us are what they are, and by nature exist, we may maintain our minds in harmony with the things which happen. For can we escape from men? And how is it possible? And if we associate with them, can we change them? Who gives us the power? What then remains? Or what method is discovered of holding commerce with them? Is there such a method by which they shall do what seems fit to them? And we, not the less, shall be in a mood which is conformable to nature. But you are unwilling to endure and are discontented? And if you are alone, you call it solitude. And if you are with men, you call them knaves and robbers. And you find fault with your own parents and children and brothers and neighbors. But you ought, when you are alone, to call this condition by the name of tranquility and freedom, and to think yourself like to the gods. And when you are with many, you ought not to call it crowd, nor trouble, nor uneasiness, but festival and assembly, and so accept all contentedly. What then is the punishment of those who do not accept? It is to be what they are. Is any person dissatisfied with being alone? Let him be alone. Is a man dissatisfied with his parents? Let him be a bad son and lament. Is he dissatisfied with his children? Let him be a bad father. Cast him into prison? What prison? Where he is already for he is there against his will. And where a man is against his will, there he is in prison. So Socrates was not in prison, for he was there willingly. Must my leg then be lamed? Wretch, do you then on account of one poor leg find fault with the world? Will you not willingly surrender it for the whole? Will you not withdraw from it? Will you not gladly part with it to him who gave it? And will you be vexed and discontented with the things established by Zeus, which he with the more, or fates, who were present in spinning the thread of your generation, 
defined and put in order. Know you not how small a part you are compared with the whole? I mean with respect to the body. For as to intelligence you are not inferior to the gods nor less. For the magnitude of intelligence is not measured by length, nor yet by height, but by thoughts. Will you not then choose to place your good in that in which you are equal to the gods? Wretch that I am to have such a father and mother! What, then, was it permitted to you to come forth and to select and to say, Let such a man at this moment unite with such a woman, that I may be produced? It was not permitted. But it was a necessity for your parents to exist first, and then for you to be begotten. Of what kind of parents? Of such as they were. Well, then, since they are such as they are, is there no remedy given to you? Now, if you did not know for what purpose you possess the faculty of vision, you would be unfortunate and wretched if you closed your eyes when colors were brought before them. But in that you possess greatness of soul and nobility of spirit for every event that may happen, and you know not that you possess them, are you not more unfortunate and wretched? Things are brought close to you which are proportionate to the power which you possess. But you turn away this power most particularly at the very time when you ought to maintain it open and discerning. Do you not rather thank the gods that they have allowed you to be above these things which they have not placed in your power, and have made you accountable only for those which are in your power? As to your parents, the gods have left you free from responsibility. And so with respect to your brothers and your body and possessions and death and life. For what then have they made you responsible? For that which alone is in your power, the proper use of appearances. Why then do you draw on yourself the things for which you are not responsible? It is indeed a giving of trouble to yourself. How everything may be done acceptably to the gods. When someone asked, How may a man eat acceptably to the gods? He answered, If he can eat justly and contentedly, and with equanimity, and temperately and orderly, Will it not be also acceptable to the gods? But when you have asked for warm water and the slave has not heard, or if he did hear, has brought only tepid water, or he is not even found to be in the house, then not to be vexed or to burst with passion, is not this acceptable to the gods? How then shall a man endure such persons as this slave? Slave yourself. Will you not bear with your own brother, who has Zeus for his progenitor, and is like a son from the same seeds and of the same descent from above? But if you have been put in any such higher place, will you immediately make yourself a tyrant? Will you not remember who you are, and whom you rule, that they are kinsmen, that they are brethren by nature, that they are the offspring of Zeus? but I have purchased them, and they have not purchased me. Do you see in what direction you are looking? That is, toward the earth, towards the pit. That it is towards these wretched laws of dead men. But toward the laws of the gods you are not looking. That the deity oversees all things. When a person asked him how a man could be convinced that all his actions are under the inspection of God, he answered, Do you not think that all things are united in one? I do, the person replied. Well, do you not think that earthly things have a natural agreement and union with heavenly things? I do. 
And how else so regularly as if by God's command? When he bids the plants to flower, do they flower? When he bids them to send forth shoots, do they shoot? When he bids them to produce fruit, how else do they produce fruit? When he bids the fruit to ripen, does it ripen? When again he bids them to cast down the fruits, how else do they cast them down? And when to shed the leaves, do they shed the leaves? And when he bids them to fold themselves up and to remain quiet and rest, how else do they remain quiet and rest? And how else at the growth and the wane of the moon, and at the approach and recession of the sun, are so great an alteration and change to the contrary seen in earthly things? But our plants and our bodies, so bound up and united with the whole, and are not our souls much more? And our souls so bound up and in contact with God, as parts of Him, and portions of Him. And does not God perceive every motion of these parts as being His own motion conate with Himself? Now, are you able to think of the divine administration, and about all things divine, and at the same time also about human affairs, and to be moved by ten thousand things at the same time in your senses and in your understanding, and to assent to some, and to dissent from others, and again at some things to suspend your judgment? And do you retain in your soul so many impressions from so many and various things, and being moved by them, do you fall upon notions similar to those first impressed? And do you retain numerous arts and the memories of ten thousand things? And is not God able to oversee all things, and to be present with all, and to receive from all a certain communication? And is the sun able to illuminate so large a part of the all, and to leave so little not illuminated, that part only which is occupied by the earth's shadow? And he who made the sun itself and makes it go round, being a small part of himself compared with the whole, cannot he perceive all things? But I cannot, the man may reply, comprehend all these things at once. But who tells you that you have equal power with Zeus? Nevertheless, he is placed by every man a guardian, every man's daemon, to whom he has committed the care of the man. A guardian who never sleeps is never deceived. For to what better and more careful guardian could he have entrusted each of us? When then you have shut the doors and made darkness within, remember never to say that you are alone, for you are not. But God is within and your daemon is within, and what need have they of light to see what you are doing? To this God you ought to swear an oath just as the soldiers do to Caesar. But they who are hired for pay swear to regard the safety of Caesar before all things, and you, who have received so many and such great favors, will you not swear, or when you have sworn, will you not abide by your oath? And what shall you swear? Never to be disobedient, never to make any charges, never to find fault with anything that he has given, and never unwillingly to do or to suffer anything that is necessary. Is this oath like the soldier's oath? The soldiers swear not to prefer any man to Caesar. In this oath, men swear to honor themselves before all. What Philosophy Promises When a man was consulting him how he should persuade his brother to cease being angry with him, Epictetus replied, Philosophy does not propose to secure for a man any external thing. If it did, or if it were not, as I say, philosophy, would be allowing something which is not within its province. For as the carpenter's material is wood, and that of the statuary is copper, so the matter of the art of living is each man's life. 
What then is my brother's? That again belongs to his own art. But with respect to yours, it is one of the external things like a piece of land, like health, like reputation. But philosophy promises none of these. In every circumstance I will maintain, she says, the governing part conformable to nature. Whose governing part? His in who I am, she says. How then shall my brother cease to be angry with me? Bring him to me and I will tell him. But I have nothing to say to you about his anger. When the man who was consulting him said, I seek to know this, how, even if my brother is not reconciled to me, shall I maintain myself in a state conformable to nature? Nothing great, said Epictetus, is produced suddenly, since not even the grape or the fig is. If you say to me now that you want a fig, I will answer to you that it requires time. Let it flower first, then put forth fruit, and then ripen. Is then the fruit of a fig tree not perfected suddenly and in one hour? And would you possess the fruit of a man's mind in so short a time, and so easily? Do not expect it, even if I tell you. Of Providence Do not wonder if for other animals than man all things are provided for the body, not only food and drink, but beds also, and that they have no need of shoes, nor bed materials, nor clothing, but we require all these additional things. For animals not being made for themselves, but for service, it was not fit for them to be made so as to need other things. For consider what it would be for us to take care not only of ourselves, but also about cattle and asses, how they should be clothed and shod, and how they should eat and drink. Now as soldiers are ready for their commander, shod, clothed, and armed, but it would be a hard thing for the Chiliarch or Tribune to go round and shoe or clothe his thousand men. So also nature has formed the animals which are made for service, all ready, prepared, and requiring no further care. So one little boy with only a stick drives the cattle. But now we, instead of being thankful that we need not take the same care of animals as of ourselves, complain to God on our own account. And yet, in the name of Zeus and the gods, any one thing of those which exist would be enough to make a man perceive the providence of God, at least a man who is modest and grateful. And speak not to me now of the great things, but only of this, that milk is produced from grass, and cheese from milk, and wool form skins. Who made these things or devised them? No one, you say. Oh, amazing shamelessness and stupidity. Well, let us omit the works of nature, and contemplate her smaller, subordinate acts. Is there anything less useful than the hair on the chin? What then? Has not nature used this hair also in the most suitable manner possible? Has she not by it distinguished the male and the female? Does not the nature of every man forthwith proclaim from a distance, I am a man? As such, approach me. As such, speak to me. Look for nothing else. See the signs. Again, in the case of women, as she has mingled something softer in the voice, so she has also deprived them of hair on the chin. You say, not so. The human animal ought to have been left without marks of distinction, and each of us should have been obliged to proclaim, I am a man. But how is not the sign beautiful and becoming and venerable? How much more beautiful than the coxcomb? How much more becoming than the lion's mane? For this reason, we ought to preserve the signs which God has given. We ought not to throw them away, nor to confound, as much as we can, the distinctions of the sexes. 
Are these the only works of providence in us? And what words are sufficient to praise them and set them forth according to their worth? For if we had understanding, ought we to do anything else both jointly and severally than to sing hymns and bless the Deity, and to tell of His benefits? Ought we not, when we are digging and plowing and eating, to sing this hymn to God? Great is God, who has given us such implements with which we shall cultivate the earth. Great is God, who has given us hands, the power of swallowing, a stomach, imperceptible growth, and the power of breathing while we sleep. This is what we ought to sing on every occasion, and to sing the greatest and most divine hymn for giving us the faculty of comprehending these things and using a proper way. Well then, since most of you have become blind, ought there not to be some man to fill this office, and on behalf of all to sing the hymn to God? For what else can I do, a lame old man, than sing hymns to God? If then I was a nightingale, I would do the part of a nightingale. If I were a swan, I would do like a swan. But now I am a rational creature, and I ought to praise God. This is my work. I do it, nor will I desert this post so long as I am allowed to keep it. And I exhort you to join in this same song. That the logical art is necessary. Since reason is the faculty which analyzes and perfects the rest, and it ought itself not to be unanalyzed, by what should it be analyzed? For it is plain that this should be done either by itself or by another thing. Either then this other thing also is reason, or something else superior to reason, which is impossible. But if it is reason... Again, who shall analyze that reason? For if that reason does this for itself, our reason also can do it. But if we shall require something else, the thing will go on to infinity and have no end. Reason, therefore, is analyzed by itself. Yes, but it is more urgent to cure our opinions and the like. Will you then hear about those things? Here, but if you should say, I know not whether you are arguing truly or falsely. And if I should express myself in any way ambiguously, and you should say to me, Distinguish, I will bear with you no longer, and I shall say to you, It is more urgent. This is the reason, I suppose, why they, the Stoic teachers, place the logical art first as in the measuring of corn, we placed first the examination of the measure. But if we do not determine first what is a modius and what is a balance, how shall we be able to measure or weigh anything? In this case, then, if we have not fully learned and accurately examined the criterion of all other things, by which the other things are learned, shall we be able to examine accurately? and to learn fully anything else. How is this possible? Yes, but the modius is only wood, and a thing which produces no fruit. But it is a thing which can measure corn. Logic also produces no fruit. As to this, indeed, we shall see. But then, even if a man should grant this, it is enough that logic has the power of distinguishing and examining other things and as we may say, of measuring and weighing them. Who says this? It is only Chrysippus, and Zeno, and Cleanthes? And does not Anisthenes say so? And who is it that has written that the examination of names is the beginning of education? And does not Socrates say so? And of whom does Xenophon write, that he began with the examination of names what each name signified? Is this, then, the great and wondrous thing to understand or interpret Chrysippus? 
who says this. What then is the wondrous thing? To understand the will of nature. Well then, do you apprehend it yourself by your own power? And what more have you need of? For if it is true that all men err involuntarily, and you have learned the truth, of necessity you must act right. But in truth I do not apprehend the will of nature. Who then tells us what it is? They say that it is Chrysippus. I proceed, and I inquire what this interpreter of nature says. I begin not to understand what he says. I seek an interpreter of Chrysippus. Well, consider how this is said, just as if it were said in the Roman tongue. What, then, is this superciliousness of the interpreter? There is no superciliousness which can justly be charged even to Chrysippus, if he only interprets the will of nature, but does not follow it himself. And much more is this so with his interpreter. For we have no need of Chrysippus for his own sake, but in order that we may understand nature. Nor do we need a diviner, sacrificer on his own account, but because we think that through him we shall know the future and understand the signs given by the gods. Nor do we need the viscera of animals for their own sake, but because through them signs are given. Nor do we look with wonder on the crow or raven, but on God, who through them gives signs. I go then to the interpreter of these things and the sacrificer, and I say, inspect the viscera for me, and tell me what signs they give. The man takes the viscera, opens them, and interprets. Man, he says, you have a will free by nature from hindrance and compulsion. This is written here in the viscera. I will show you this first in the matter of assent. Can any man hinder you from assenting to the truth? No man can. Can any man compel you to receive what is false? No man can. You see that in this matter you have the faculty of the will free from hindrance, free from compulsion, unimpeded. Well then, in the matter of desire and pursuit of an object, is it otherwise? And what can overcome pursuit except another pursuit? And what can overcome desire and aversion except another desire and aversion? But you object. If you place before me the fear of death, you do compel me. No, it is not what is placed before you that compels, but your opinion that it is better to do so and so than to die. In this matter, then, it is your opinion that compelled you. That is, will compelled will. For if God had made that part of himself which he took from himself and gave to us, of such a nature as to be hindered or compelled either by himself or by another, he would not then be God, nor would he be taking care of us as he ought. This, says the diviner, I find in the victims. These are the things which are signified to you. If you choose, you are free. If you choose, you will blame no one. You will charge no one. All will be at the same time according to your mind and the mind of God. For the sake of this divination, I go to this diviner and to the philosopher, not admiring him for this interpretation, but admiring the things which he interprets. That we ought not to be angry with the errors or faults of others. If what philosophers say is true, that all men have one principle, as in the case of assent, the persuasion that a thing is so, and in the case of dissent, the persuasion that a thing is not so, and in the case of suspense of judgment, the persuasion that a thing is uncertain, so also in the case of a movement towards any thing, the persuasion that a thing is for a man's advantage. And it is impossible to think that one thing is advantageous and to desire another, 
and to judge one thing to be proper and to move towards another. Why then are we angry with the many? They are thieves and robbers, you may say. What do you mean by thieves and robbers? They are mistaken about good and evil. Ought we then to be angry with them, or to pity them? But show them their error, and you will see how they desist from their errors. If they do not see their errors, they have nothing superior to their present opinion. Ought not then this robber and this adulterer to be destroyed? By no means say so, but speak rather in this way. This man who has been mistaken and deceived about the most important things, and blinded, not in the faculty of vision which distinguishes white and black, but in the faculty which distinguishes good and bad, should we not destroy him? If you speak thus, you will see how inhuman this is which you say, and that it is just as if you would say, Ought we not to destroy this blind and deaf man? But if the greatest harm is the privation of the greatest things, and the greatest thing in every man is the will or choice, such as it ought to be, and a man is deprived of this will, why are you also angry with him? Man, you ought not to be affected contrary to nature by the bad things of another. Pity him, rather. Drop this readiness to be offended and to hate. And these words which the many utter, These accursed and odious fellows! How have you been made so wise at once? And how are you so peevish? Why then are we angry? Is it because we value so much the things of which these men rob us? Do not admire your clothes, and then you will not be angry with the thief. Do not admire the beauty of your wife, and you will not be angry with the adulterer. Learn that a thief and an adulterer have no place in the things which are yours, but in those things which belong to others and which are not in your power. If you dismiss these things, and consider them as nothing, with whom are you still angry? But so long as you value these things, be angry with yourself, rather than with the thief and the adulterer. Consider the matter thus. You have fine clothes. Your neighbor has not. You have a window. You wish to air the clothes. The thief does not know wherein man's good consists, but he thinks that it consists in having fine clothes, the very thing which you also think. Must he not then come and take them away? When you show a cake to greedy persons, and swallow it all yourself, do you expect them not to snatch it from you? Do not provoke them. Do not have a window. Do not air your clothes. I also lately had an iron lamp placed by the side of my household gods. Hearing a noise at the door, I ran down and found that the lamp had been carried off. I reflected that he who had taken the lamp had done nothing strange. What then? Tomorrow, I said, you will find an earthen lamp, for a man only loses that which he has. I have lost my garment? The reason is that you had a garment. I have pain in my head. Have you any pain in your horns? Why then are you troubled? For we only lose those things. We have only pains about those things which we possess. But the tyrant will chain, what, the leg? He will take away, what, the neck? What then will he not chain and not take away? The will. This is why the ancients taught the maxim, Know thyself. Therefore we ought to exercise ourselves in small things, and beginning with them to proceed to the greater. I have pain in the head. Do not say, alas, I have pain in the ear. Do not say, alas, I. And I do not say that you are not allowed to groan. 
but do not groan inwardly. And if your slave is slow in bringing a bandage, do not cry out and torment yourself and say, Everybody hates me. For who would not hate such a man? For the future, relying on these opinions, walk about upright, free, not trusting to the size of your body as an athlete, for a man ought not to be invincible in the way that an ass is. Who then is the invincible? It is he whom none of the things disturb which are independent of the will. Then examining one circumstance after another, I observe, as in the case of an athlete, he has come off victorious in the first contest. Well then, as to the second, and what if there should be great heat? And what if it should be at Olympia? And the same I say in this case, if you should throw money in his way, he will despise it. Well, suppose you put a young girl in his way. What then? And what if it is in the dark? What if it should be a little reputation or abuse? And what if it should be praise? And what if it should be death? He is able to overcome all. What then if it be in heat? And what if it is in the rain? And what if he be in a melancholy or mad mood? And what if he be asleep? He will still conquer. This is my invincible athlete. How we should behave to tyrants. If a man possesses any superiority, or thinks that he does when he does not, such a man, if he is uninstructed, will of necessity be puffed up through it. For instance, the tyrant says, I am master of all. And what can you do for me? Can you give me desire which shall have no hindrance? How can you? Have you the infallible power of avoiding what you would avoid? Have you the power of moving towards an object without error? And how do you possess this power? Come, when you are in a ship, do you trust to yourself or to the helmsman? And when you are in a chariot, to whom do you trust but to the driver? And how is it in all other arts just the same? In what then lies your power? All men pay respect to me. Well, I also pay respect to my platter, and I wash it and wipe it, and for the sake of my oil flask, I drive a peg into the wall. Well, then, are these things superior to me? No, but they supply some of my wants, and for this reason I take care of them. Well, do I not attend to my ass? Do I not wash his feet? Do I not clean him? Do you not know that every man has regard to himself, and to you just the same as he has regard to his ass? For who has regard to you as a man? Show me. Who wishes to become like you? Who imitates you as he imitates Socrates? But I can cut off your head. You say right. I had forgotten that I must have regard to you as I would to a fever and the bile, and raise an altar to you as there is at Rome an altar to fever. What is it then that disturbs and terrifies the multitude? Is it the tyrant and his guards? By no means. I hope that it is not so. It is not possible that what is by nature free can be disturbed by anything else, or hindered by any other thing than by itself. But it is a man's own opinions which disturb him. For when the tyrant says to a man, I will chain your leg, he who values his leg says, Do not, I have pity. But he who values his own will says, If it appears more advantageous to you, chain it. Do you not care? I do not care. 
I will show you that I am master. You cannot do that. Zeus has set me free. Do you think that he intended to allow his own son to be enslaved? But you are master of my carcass. Take it. So, when you approach me, you have no regard to me? No, but I have regard to myself. And if you wish me to say that I have regard to you also, I tell you that I have the same regard to you that I have to my Pipkin. This is not a perverse self-regard, for the animal is constituted so as to do all things for itself. For even the sun does all the things for itself. Nay, even Zeus himself. But when he chooses to be the giver of rain, and the giver of fruits, and the father of gods and men, you see that he cannot obtain these functions and these names if he is not useful to man. And universally, he has made the nature of the rational animal such that it cannot obtain any one of its own proper interests if it does not contribute something to the common interest. In this manner and sense, it is not unsociable for a man to do everything for the sake of himself. For what do you expect? That a man should neglect himself and his own interest? And how in that case can there be one and the same principle in all animals, the principle of attachment or regard to themselves? What then, when absurd notions about things independent of our will, as if they were good and or bad, lie at the bottom of our opinions, we must of necessity pay regard to tyrants? For I wish that men would pay regard to tyrants only, and not also to the bedchamber men. How is it that the man becomes all at once wise when Caesar has made him superintendent of the close stool? How is it that we say immediately, Felician spoke sensibly to me. I wish he were ejected from the bedchamber, that he might again appear to you to be a fool. Epaphroditus had a shoemaker whom he sold because he was good for nothing. This fellow, by some good luck, was bought by one of Caesar's men and became Caesar's shoemaker. You should have seen what respect Epaphroditus paid to him. How does the good Felician do, I pray? Then if any of us asked, what is Master Epaphroditus doing? The answer was, he is consulting about something with Felician. Had he not sold the man as good for nothing? Who then made him wise all at once? This is an instance of valuing something else than the things which depend on the will. Has a man been exalted to the tribuneship? All who meet him offer their congratulations. One kisses his eyes, another the neck, and the slaves kiss his hands. He goes to his house. He finds torches lighted. He ascends the capital. He offers a sacrifice on the occasion. Now, whoever sacrificed for having had good desires, for having acted conformably to nature, for in fact we thank the gods for those things in which we place our good, a person was talking to me today about the priesthood of Augustus. I say to him, Man, let the thing alone, you will spend much for no purpose. But he replies, Those who draw up agreements will write my name. Do you then stand by those who read them and say to such persons, It is I whose name is written there. And if you can now be present on all such occasions... What will you do when you are dead? My name will remain. Write it on a stone, and it will remain. But come, what remembrance of you will there be beyond Nicopolis? But I shall wear a crown of gold. If you desire a crown at all, take a crown of roses and put it on, for it will be more elegant in appearance. About reason, how it contemplates itself. 
Every art and faculty contemplates certain things especially. When then it is itself of the same kind with the object which it contemplates, it must of necessity contemplate itself also. But when it is of an unlike kind, it cannot contemplate itself. For instance, the shoemaker's art is employed on skins, but itself is entirely distinct from the material of skins. For this reason, it does not contemplate itself. Again, the grammarian's art is employed about articulate speech. Is then the art also articulate speech? By no means. For this reason, it is not able to contemplate itself. Now, reason. For what purpose has it been given by nature? For the right use of appearances. What is it then itself? A system or combination of certain appearances. So by its nature it has the faculty of contemplating itself also. Again, sound sense. For the contemplation of what things does it belong to us. Good and evil, and things which are neither. What is it then itself? Good. And want of sense. What is it? Evil. Do you see then that good sense necessarily contemplates both itself and the opposite? For this reason, it is the chief and the first work of a philosopher to examine appearances, and to distinguish them, and to admit none without examination. You see even in the matter of coin, in which our interest appears to be somewhat concerned, how we have invented an art, and how many means the assayer uses to try the value of coin, the sight, the touch, the smell, and lastly, the hearing. He throws the coin, or denarius, down, and observes the sound, and he is not content with its sounding once, but through his great attention he becomes a musician. In like manner, where we think that to be mistaken and not to be mistaken make a great difference, there we apply great attention to discovering the things which can deceive. But in the matter of our miserable ruling faculty, yawning and sleeping we carelessly admit every appearance, for the harm is not noticed. When then you would know how careless you are with respect to good and evil, and how active with respect to things which are indifferent, or neither good nor evil, observe how you feel with respect to being deprived of the sight of the eyes, and how with respect to being deceived and you will discover that you are far from feeling as you ought to do in relation to good and evil. But this is a matter which requires much preparation and much labor and study. Well then, do you expect to acquire the greatest of arts with small labor? And yet the chief doctrine of philosophers is very brief. If you would know, read Zeno's writings and you will see for how few words it requires to say that man's end, or object, is to follow the gods, and that the nature of good is a proper use of appearances. But if you say, What is God? What is appearance? And what is particular and what is universal nature? Then indeed many words are necessary. If then Epicurus should come and say that the good must be in the body, in this case also many words become necessary. And we must be taught what is the leading principle in us, and the fundamental, and the substantial. And as it is not probable that the good of a snail is in the shell, is it probable that the good of a man is in the body? But you yourself, Epicurus, possess something better than this. What is that in you which deliberates? What is that which examines everything? What is that which forms a judgment about the body itself, that it is the principal part? And why do you light your lamp and labor for us, and write so many books? Is it that we may not be ignorant of the truth? Who we are and what we are with respect to you? Thus the discussion requires many words.
against those who wish to be admired. When a man holds his proper station in life, he does not gape after things beyond it. Man, what do you wish to happen to you? I am satisfied if I desire and avoid conformably to nature. If I employ movements towards and from an object as I am by nature formed to do, and purpose, and design, and assent. Why then do you strut before us as if you had swallowed a spit? My wish has always been that those who meet me should admire me, and those who follow me should exclaim, Oh, the great philosopher! Who are they by whom you wish to be admired? Are they not those of whom you used to say that they are mad? Well then, do you wish to be admired by madmen? On Precognitions Precognitions are common to all men, and precognition is not contradictory to precognition. For who of us does not assume that good is useful and eligible, and in all circumstances that we ought to follow and pursue it? And who of us does not assume that justice is beautiful and becoming? When, then, does this contradiction arise? It arises in the adaptation of the precognitions to the particular cases. When one man says he has done well, he is a brave man, and another says, Not so, but he has acted foolishly. Then the disputes arise among men. This is the dispute among the Jews and the Syrians and the Egyptians and the Romans, not whether holiness should be preferred to all things and in all cases should be pursued, but whether it is holy to eat pig's flesh or not holy. You will find this dispute also between Agamemnon and Achilles, for call them forth. What do you say, Agamemnon? Ought not that to be done, which is proper and right? Certainly. Well, what do you say, Achilles? Do you not admit that what is good ought to be done? I do most certainly. Adapt your precognitions, then, to the present matter. Here the dispute begins. Agamemnon says, I ought not to give up Chryseis to her father. Achilles says, you ought. It is certain that one of the two makes a wrong adaptation of the precognition of ought or duty. Further, Agamemnon says, Then if I ought to restore Chryseis, it is fit that I take his prize from some of you. Achilles replies, Would you then take her whom I love? Yes, her whom you love. Must I then be the only man who goes without a prize? And must I be the only man who has no prize? Thus the dispute begins. What then is education? Education is learning how to adapt the natural precognitions to the particular things conformably to nature, and then to distinguish that of things some are in our power, but others are not. In our power are will and all acts which depend on the will, Things not in our power are the body, the parts of the body, possessions, parents, brothers, children, country, and, generally, all with whom we live in society. In what, then, should we place the good? To what kind of things shall we adapt it? To the things which are in our power? Is not health, then, a good thing, and soundness of limb and life, and are not children and parents and country? Who will tolerate you if you deny this? Let us then transfer the notion of good to these things. Is it possible then, when a man sustains damage and does not obtain good things, that he can be happy? It is not possible. And can he maintain towards society a proper behavior? He cannot. For I am naturally formed to look after my own interest. If it is my interest to have an estate in land, 
It is my interest also to take it from my neighbor. If it is my interest to have a garment, it is my interest also to steal it from the bath. This is the origin of wars, civil commotions, tyrannies, conspiracies. And how shall I still be able to maintain my duty towards Zeus? For if I sustain damage and am unlucky, he takes no care of me. And what is he to me if he cannot help me? And further, what is he to me if he allows me to be in the condition in which I am? I now begin to hate him. Why then do we build temples? Why set up statues to Zeus as well as to evil daemons such as to fever? And how is Zeus the savior? And how the giver of rain and the giver of fruits? And in truth, if we place the nature of good in any such things, all this follows. What should we do then? This is the inquiry of the true philosopher who is in labor. Now, I do not see what the good is nor the bad. Am I not mad? Yes. But suppose that I place the good somewhere among the things which depend on the will. All will laugh at me. There will come some gray head wearing many gold rings on his fingers, and he will shake his head and say, Here, my child, it is right that you should philosophize, but you ought to have some brains also. All this that you are doing is silly. You learn the syllogism from philosophers, but you know how to act better than philosophers do. Man, why then do you blame me if I know? What shall I say to this slave? If I am silent, he will burst. I must speak in this way. Excuse me as you would excuse lovers. I am not my own master. I am mad. Against Epicurus Even Epicurus perceives that we are by nature social. But having once placed our good in the husk, he is no longer able to say anything else. For on the other hand, he strongly maintains this, that we ought not to admire nor to accept anything which is detached from the nature of good. And he is right in maintaining this. How then are we suspicious? if we have no natural affection to our children. Why do you advise the wise man not to bring up children? Why are you afraid that he may thus fall into trouble? For does he fall into trouble on account of the mouse which is nurtured in the house? What does he care if a little mouse in the house makes lamentations to him? But Epicurus knows that if once a child is born... It is no longer in our power not to love it, nor to care about it. For this reason, Epicurus says that a man who has any sense also does not engage in political matters. For he knows what a man must do who is engaged in such things. For indeed, if you intend to behave among men, as you would among a swarm of flies, what hinders you? But Epicurus, who knows this, ventures to say that we should not bring up children. But a sheep does not desert its own offspring, nor yet a wolf. And shall a man desert his child? What do you mean? That we should be as silly as sheep, but not even do they desert their offspring. Or as savage as wolves, but not even do wolves desert their young. Well, who would follow your advice? if he saw his child weeping after falling on the ground. For my part, I think that even if your mother and your father had been told by an oracle that you would say what you have said, they would not have cast you away. How we should struggle with circumstances. It is circumstances or difficulties which show what men are. Therefore, when a difficulty falls upon you, 
Remember that God, like a trainer of wrestlers, has matched you with a rough young man. For what purpose, you may say? Why, that you may become an Olympic conqueror. But it is not accomplished without sweat. In my opinion, no man has had a more profitable difficulty than you have had, if you choose to make use of it as an athlete would deal with a young antagonist. We are now sending a scout to Rome, but no man sends a cowardly scout, who, if he only hears a noise and sees a shadow anywhere, comes running back in terror and reports that the enemy is close at hand. So now, if you should come and tell us, Fearful is the state of affairs at Rome, terrible is death, terrible is exile, terrible is calumny, terrible is poverty, fly, my friends, the enemy is near. We shall answer. Be gone. Prophesy for yourself. We have committed only one fault, that we sent such a scout. Diogenes, who was sent as a scout before you, made a different report to us. He says that death is no evil, for neither is it base. He says that fame, reputation, is the noise of madmen. And what has this spy said about pain, about pleasure, and about poverty? He says that to be naked is better than any purple robe, and to sleep on the bare ground is the softest bed and he gives as proof of each thing that he affirms his own courage, his tranquility, his freedom, and the healthy appearance and compactness of his body. There is no enemy near, he says. All is peace. How so, Diogenes? See, he replies, if I am struck, if I have been wounded, if I have fled from any man... This is what a scout ought to be. But you come to us and tell us one thing after another. Will you not go back, and you will see clearer when you have laid aside fear? What then shall I do? What do you do when you leave a ship? Do you take away the helm or the oars? What then do you take away? You take what is your own, your bottle and your wallet, and now, if you think of what is your own, you will never claim what belongs to others. The emperor, Domitian, says, Lay aside your laticlave. See, I put on the augusticlave. Lay aside this also. See, I have only my toga. Lay aside your toga. See, I am now naked. But you still raise my envy. Take then all my poor body. When at a man's command, I can throw away my poor body. Do I still fear him? But a certain person will not leave to me the succession to his estate. What then? Had I forgotten that not one of these things was mine? How then do we call them mine? Just as we call the bed in the inn. If then the innkeeper at his death leaves you the beds all well, but if he leaves them to another, he will have them, and you will seek another bed. If then you shall not find one, you will sleep on the ground. Only sleep with a good will and snore, and remember that tragedies have their place among the rich and kings and tyrants. But no poor man fills a part in a tragedy except as one of the chorus. Kings indeed commence with prosperity. Ornament the palace with garlands. Then about the third or fourth act they call out, O oh, Citheron, why didst thou receive me? Slave, where are the crowns? Where are the diadem? The guards help thee not at all. When then you approach any of these persons, Remember this, that you are approaching a tragedian, not the actor, but Oedipus himself. But you say such a man is happy, for he walks about with many, and I also place myself with the many and walk about with many. 
In sum, remember this. The door is open. Be not more timid than little children, but as they say when the thing does not please them, I will play no longer. So do you. When things seem to you of such a kind, say I will no longer play, and be gone. But if you stay, do not complain. On the same. If these things are true, and if we are not silly, and are not acting hypocritically when we say that the good of man is in the will, and the evil too, and that everything else does not concern us, why are we still disturbed? Why are we still afraid? The things about which we have been busied are in no man's power. And the things which are in the power of others, we care not for. What kind of trouble have we still? But give me directions. Why should I give you directions? Has not Zeus given you directions? Has he not given to you what is your own free from hindrance and free from impediment? and what is not your own, subject to hindrance and impediment? What directions, then? What kind of orders did you bring when you came from him? Keep by every means what is your own. Do not desire what belongs to others. Fidelity, integrity, is your own. Virtuous shame is your own. Who then can take these things from you? Who else than yourself will hinder you from using them? But how do you act? When you see what is not your own, you lose that which is your own. Having such promptings and commands from Zeus, what kind do you still ask from me? Am I more powerful than he? Am I more worthy of confidence? But if you observe these, Do you want any others besides? Well, but he has not given these orders, you will say. Produce your precognitions. Produce the proofs of philosophers. Produce what you have often heard, and produce what you have said yourself. Produce what you have read. Produce what you have meditated on. And you will then see that all these things are from God. How long, then, is it fit to observe these precepts from God, and not to break up the play? As long as the play is continued with propriety. In the Saturnalia, a king is chosen by lot, for it has been the custom to play at this game. The king commands, Do you drink? Do you mix the wine? Do you sing? Do you go? Do you come? I obey that the game may not be broken up through me. But if he says, think that you are in an evil plight, I answer, I do not think so. And who will compel me to think so? Further, we agreed to play Agamemnon and Achilles. He was appointed to play Agamemnon, says to me, go to Achilles and tear from him Briseis. I go. He says, come, and I come. For as we behave in the matter of hypothetical arguments, so ought we to do in life. Suppose it to be night. I suppose that it is night. Well then, is it day? No, for I admitted the hypothesis that it was night. Suppose that you think that it is night. Suppose that I do. But also think that it is night. That is not consistent with the hypothesis. So, in this case also, suppose that you are unfortunate. Well, suppose so. Are you then unhappy? Yes. Well, then, are you troubled with an unfavorable daemon or fortune? Yes. But think also that you are in misery. This is not consistent with the hypothesis. And another, Zeus, forbids me to think so. How long, then, must we obey such orders? 
as long as it is profitable. And this means as long as I maintain that which is becoming and consistent. Further, some men are sour and of bad temper, and they say, I cannot sup with this man to be obliged to hear him telling daily how he fought in Mysia. I told you, brother, how I ascended the hill, then I began to be besieged again. But another says, I prefer to get my supper and to hear him talk as much as he likes. And do you compare these estimates or judgments? Only do nothing in a depressed mood, nor as one afflicted, nor as thinking that you are in misery, for no man compels you to that. Has it smoked in the chamber? If the smoke is moderate, I will stay. If it is excessive, I go out. For you must always remember this and hold it fast, that the door is open. Well, but you say to me, do not live in Nicopolis. I will not live there. Nor in Athens. I will not live in Athens. Nor in Rome. I will not live in Rome. Live in Giaris. I will live in Giaris, but it seems like a great smoke to live in Giaris, and I depart to the place where no man will hinder me from living, for that dwelling place is open to all. And as to the last garment, that is the poor body, no one has any power over me beyond this. This was the reason why Demetrius said to Nero, You threaten me with death, but nature threatens you. If I set my admiration on the poor body, I have given myself up to be a slave. If on my little possessions, I also make myself a slave. For I immediately make it plain with what I may be caught. As if the snake draws in his head, I tell you to strike that part of him which he guards. And do you be assured that whatever part you choose to guard, that part your master will attack. Remembering this, whom will you still flatter or fear? But I should like to sit where the senators sit. Do you see that you are putting yourself in straits? You are squeezing yourself. How then shall I see well in any other way in the amphitheater? Man, do not be a spectator at all, and you will not be squeezed. Why do you give yourself trouble? Or wait a little, and when the spectacle is over, seat yourself in the place reserved for the senators, and sun yourself. For remember this general truth, that it is we who squeeze ourselves, who put ourselves in straits, that it is our opinions squeeze us and put us in straits. For what is it to be reviled? Stand by a stone and revile it, and what will you gain? If then a man listens like a stone, what profit is there to the reviler? But if the reviler has as a stepping stone or ladder the weakness of him who is reviled, then he accomplishes something. Strip him. What do you mean by him? Lay hold of his garment. Strip it off. I have insulted you. Much good may it do you. This was the practice of Socrates. This was the reason why he always had one face. But we choose to practice and study anything rather than the means by which we shall be unimpeded and free. You say, philosophers talk paradoxes. But are there no paradoxes in the other arts? And what is more paradoxical than to puncture a man's eye in order that he may see? If anyone said this to a man ignorant of the surgical art, would he not ridicule the speaker? Where is the wonder, then, if in philosophy also many things which are true appear paradoxical to the inexperienced? <laughs> What is the law of life? When a person was reading hypothetical arguments, Epictetus said, 
This also is an hypothetical law, that we must accept what follows from the hypothesis. But much before this law is the law of life, that we must act conformably to nature. For if in every matter and circumstance we wish to observe what is natural, it is plain that in everything we ought to make it our aim that neither that which is consequent shall escape us, and that we do not admit the contradictory. First, then, philosophers exercise us in theory or contemplation of things, which is easier. And then next, they lead us to the more difficult things. For in theory, there is nothing which draws us away from following what is taught. But, in the matters of life, many are the things which distract us. He is ridiculous, then, who says that he wishes to begin with the matters of real life. For it is not easy to begin with the more difficult things. And we ought to employ this fact as an argument to those parents who are vexed at their children learning philosophy. Am I doing wrong, then, my father? And do I not know what is suitable to me and becoming? If indeed this can neither be learned nor taught, why do you blame me? But if it can be taught, teach me. And if you cannot... Allow me to learn from those who say that they know how to teach. For what do you think? Do you suppose that I voluntarily fall into evil and miss the good? I hope that it may not be so. What is then the cause of my doing wrong? Ignorance. Do you not choose then that I should get rid of my ignorance? Who was ever taught by anger the art of a pilot? or music. Do you think then that by means of your anger I shall learn the art of life? He only is allowed to speak in this way, who has shown such an intention. But if a mar, only intending to make a display at a banquet, and to show that he is acquainted with hypothetical arguments, reads them, and attends the philosophers, what other object has he? than that some man of senatorian rank who sits by him may admire. For there, at Rome, are the really great materials and opportunities, and the riches here at Nicopolis appear to be trifles there. This is the reason why it is difficult for a man to be master of the appearances, where the things which disturb the judgment are great. I know a certain person who complained as he embraced the knees of Epaphroditus, that he had only one hundred and fifty times ten thousand denarii remaining. What then did Epaphroditus do? Did he laugh at him, as we slaves of Epaphroditus did? No, but he cried out with amazement, Poor man! How then did you keep silence? How did you endure it? When Epictetus had reproved or called the person who was reading the hypothetical arguments, and the teacher who had suggested the reading was laughing at the reader, Epictetus said to the teacher, You are laughing at yourself. You did not prepare the young man, nor did you ascertain whether he was able to understand these matters. But perhaps you are only employing him as a reader. Well then, said Epictetus, if a man has not ability enough to understand a complex or syllogism, do we trust him in giving praise? Do we trust him in giving blame? Do we allow that he is able to form a judgment about good or bad? And if such a man blames anyone, does the man care for the blame? And if he praises anyone, is the man elated when in such small matters as an hypothetical syllogism— he who praises cannot see what is consequent on the hypothesis. This, then, is the beginning of philosophy, a man's perception of the state of his ruling faculty. For when a man knows that it is weak, then he will not employ it on things of the greatest difficulty. But at present, if men cannot swallow even a morsel, they buy whole volumes and attempt to devour them and this is the reason why they vomit them up or suffer indigestion. And then come gripings, defluxes, and fevers. 
such men ought to consider what their ability is. In theory, it is easy to convince an ignorant person. But in the affairs of real life, no one offers him to be convinced, and we hate the man who has convinced us. But Socrates advised us not to live a life which is not subjected to examination. In how many ways appearances exist, and what aids we should provide against them? Appearances are to us in four ways. For either things appear as they are, or they are not, and do not even appear to be, or they are and do not appear to be, or they are not and yet appear to be. Further, in all these cases to form a right judgment, to hit the mark, is the office of an educated man. But whatever it is that annoys or troubles us, to that we ought to apply a remedy. If the sophisms of Pyro and of the academics are what annoys or troubles, we must apply the remedy to them. If it is the persuasion of appearances by which some things appear to be good when they are not good, let us seek a remedy for this. If it is habit which annoys us, we must try to seek aid against habit. What aid, then, can we find against habit? The contrary habit. You hear the ignorant say, That unfortunate person is dead. His father and mother are overpowered with sorrow. He was cut off by an untimely death and in a foreign land. Hear the contrary way of speaking. Tear yourself from these expressions. Oppose to one habit the contrary habit. To sophistry oppose reason, and the exercise and discipline of reason. Against persuasive or deceitful appearances, we ought to have manifest precognitions cleared of all impurities and ready to hand. When death appears in evil, we ought to have this rule in readiness, that it is fit to avoid evil things, and that death is a necessary thing. For what shall I do? And where shall I escape it? Suppose that I am not Sarpedon, the son of Zeus, nor able to speak in this noble way. I will go and I am resolved either to behave bravely myself or to give to another the opportunity of doing so. If I cannot succeed in doing anything myself, I will not grudge another the doing of something noble. Suppose that it is above our power to act thus. Is it not in our power to reason thus? Tell me where I can escape death. Discover for me the country. Show me the men to whom I must go, whom death does not visit. Discover me a charm against death. If I have not one, what do you wish me to do? I cannot escape from death. Shall I not escape from the fear of death? but I shall die lamenting and trembling. For the origin of perturbation is this, to wish for something, and that this should not happen. Therefore I am able to change externals according to my wish. I change them, but if I cannot, I am ready to tear out the eyes of him who hinders me. For the nature of man is not to endure to be deprived of the good and not to endure the falling into the evil. Then at last, when I am neither able to change circumstances, nor to tear out the eyes of him who hinders me, I sit down and groan, and abuse whom I can, Zeus and the rest of the gods. For if they do not care for me, what are they to me? Yes, but you will be an impious man, in what respect, then, will it be worse for me than it is now? To sum it up, remember this, that unless piety and your interest be in the same thing, piety cannot be maintained in any man. Do not these things seem necessary or true? Let the followers of Pyro and the academics come and make their objections. For I, as to my part, have no leisure for these disputes, 
nor am I able to undertake the defense of common consent or opinion. If I had a suit even about a bit of land, I would call in another to defend my interests. With what evidence, then, am I satisfied? With that which belongs to the matter at hand. How indeed perception is affected, whether through the whole body or any part, perhaps I cannot explain. For both opinions perplex me, but that you and I are not the same, I know with perfect certainty. How do you know it? When I intend to swallow anything, I never carry it to your mouth, but to my own. When I intend to take bread, I never lay hold of a broom, but I always go to the bread as to a mark. And you yourselves, the pyrenists, who take away the evidence of the senses, do you act otherwise? Who among you, when he intended to enter a bath, ever went into a mill? What then? Ought we not with all our power to hold to this also? The maintaining of general opinion, and fortifying ourselves against the arguments which are directed against it. Who denies that we ought to do this? Well, he should do it who is able, who has leisure for it. But as to him who trembles and is perturbed, and is inwardly broken in heart or spirit, he must employ his time better on something else. That we ought not to be angry with men, and what are the small and the great things among men? What is the cause of assenting to anything? The fact that it appears to be true. It is not possible, then, to assent to that which appears not to be true. Why? Because this is the nature of the understanding. To incline to the true, to be dissatisfied with the false, and in matters uncertain to withhold assent. What is the proof of this? Imagine, or persuade yourself if you can, that it is now night. It is not possible. Take away your persuasion that it is day. It is not possible. Persuade yourself or take away your persuasion that the stars are even in number. It is impossible. When then any man assents to that which is false, be assured that he did not intend to assent to it as false. For every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth as Plato says, but the falsity seemed to him to be true. Well, in Acts, what have we of the like kind, as we have here truth or falsehood? We have the fit and the not fit, duty and not duty, the profitable and the unprofitable, that which is suitable to a person and that which is not, and whatever is like these. Can then a man think that a thing is useful to him, and not choose it? He cannot. How says Medea? Tis true I know what evil I shall do, but passion overpowers the better counsel. She thought that to indulge her passion and take vengeance on her husband was more profitable than to spare her children. It was so, but she was deceived. Show her plainly that she is deceived, and she will not do it. But so long as you do not show it, what can she follow except that which appears to herself or her opinion? Nothing else. Why then are you angry with the unhappy woman that she has been bewildered about the most important things and is become a viper instead of human creature? And why not, if it is possible, rather pity, as we pity the blind and the lame, so those who are blinded and maimed in the faculties which are supreme. Whoever then clearly remembers this, that to man the measure of every act is the appearance or the opinion, whether the thing appears good or bad. If good, he is free from blame. If bad, himself suffers the penalty. For it is impossible that he who is deceived can be one person, and he who suffers another person. Whoever remembers this will not be angry with any man, 
will not be vexed at any man, will not revile or blame any man, nor hate nor quarrel with any man. So then, all these great and dreadful deeds have this origin, in the appearance or opinion, yes, this origin and no other. The Iliad is nothing else than appearances and the use of appearances. It appeared to Alexander to carry off the wife of Menelaus. It appeared to Helena to follow him. If then it had appeared to Menelaus to feel that it was a gain to be deprived of such a wife, what would have happened? Not only would the Iliad have been lost, but the Odyssey also. On so small a matter then did such great things depend. But what do you mean by such great things? Wars and civil commotions and the destruction of many men and cities. And what great matter is this? It is nothing. But what great matter is the death of many oxen and many sheep and many nests of swallows or storks being burnt or destroyed? Are these things then like those? Very like. Bodies of men are destroyed and the bodies of oxen and sheep, the dwellings of men are burnt, and the nests of storks. What is there in this great or dreadful? Or show me what is the difference between a man's house and a stork's nest, as far as each is a dwelling, except that man builds his little houses of beams and tiles and bricks, and the stork builds them of sticks and mud. Are a stork and a man, then, like things? What say you? In body they are very much alike. Does a man, then, differ in no respect from a stork? Don't suppose that I say so. But there is no difference in these matters which I have mentioned. In what, then, is the difference? Seek and you will find that there is a difference in another matter. See whether it is not in a man the understanding of what he does. See if it is not in social community, in fidelity, in modesty, in steadfastness, in intelligence. Where then is the great good and evil in men? It is where the difference is. If the difference is preserved and remains fenced round, and neither modesty is destroyed, nor fidelity, nor intelligence, then the man also is preserved. But if any of these things is destroyed and stormed like a city, then the man too perishes. And in this consists the great things. Alexander, you say, sustained great damage then when the Hellenes invaded and when they ravaged Troy, and when his brothers perished. By no means, for no man is damaged by an action which is not his own. But what happened at that time was only the destruction of storks' nests. Now, the ruin of Alexander was when he lost the character of modesty, fidelity, regard to hospitality, and to decency. When was Achilles ruined? Was it when Patroclus died? Not so. But it happened when he began to be angry, when he wept for a girl, when he forgot that he was at Troy not to get a mistress, but to fight. These things are the ruin of men. This is being besieged. This is the destruction of cities. When right opinions are destroyed, when they are corrupted. When the women are carried off, when children are made captives and when men are killed, are these not evils? How is it then that you add to the facts these opinions? Explain this to me also. I shall not do that, but... How is it that you say that these are not evils? Let us come to the rules. Produce the precognitions, for it is because this is neglected that we cannot sufficiently wonder at what men do. When we intend to judge of weights, we do not judge by guess. Where we intend to judge of straight and crooked, we do not judge by guess. In all cases where it is our interest to know what is true in any matter, Never will any man among us do anything by guess. But in things which depend on the first and on the only cause of doing right or wrong, of happiness or unhappiness, 
of being unfortunate or fortunate, there only we are inconsiderate and rash. There is then nothing like scales or balance, nothing like a rule, but some appearance is presented, and straightway I act according to it. Must I then suppose that I am superior to Achilles or Agamemnon, so that they by following appearances do and suffer so many evils? And shall not the appearance be sufficient for me? And what tragedy has any other beginning? The Atreus of Euripides? What is it? An appearance? The Oedipus of Sophocles? What is it? An appearance? The Phoenix? An appearance? The Hippolytus? An appearance? What kind of a man, then, do you suppose him to be, who pays no regard to this matter? And what is the name of those who follow every appearance? They are called madmen. Do we then act at all differently? On Constancy or Firmness The Being or nature of the good, is a certain will. The being of the bad is a certain kind of will. What, then, are externals? Materials for the will, about which the will being conversant shall obtain its own good or evil. How shall it obtain the good? If it does not admire or overvalue the materials, for the opinions about the materials, if the opinions are right, make the will good. But perverse and distorted opinions make the will bad. God has fixed this law, and says, If you would have anything good, receive it from yourself. You say, No, but I will have it from another. Do not so, but receive it from yourself. Therefore, when the tyrant threatens and calls me, I say, Whom do you threaten? If he says, I will put you in chains, I say, you threaten my hands and my feet. If he says, I will cut off your head, I reply, you threaten my head. If he says, I will throw you into prison, I say, you threaten the whole of this poor body. If he threatens me with banishment, I say the same. Does he then not threaten you at all? If I feel that all these things do not concern me, he does not threaten me at all. But if I fear any of them, it is I whom he threatens. Whom then do I fear? The master of what? The master of things which are in my own power? There is no such master. Do I fear the master of things which are not in my power? And what are these things to me? Do you philosophers then... Teach us to despise kings. I hope not. Who among us teaches to claim against them the power over things which they possess? Take my poor body. Take my property. Take my reputation. Take those who are about me. If I advise any persons to claim these things, they may truly accuse me. Yes, but I intend to command your opinions also. And who has given you this power? How can you conquer the opinion of another man? By applying terror to it, he replies. I will conquer it. Do you not know that opinions conquer itself, and is not conquered by another? But nothing else can conquer will except the will itself? For this reason, too, the law of God is most powerful and most just, which is this. Let the stronger always be superior to the weaker. Ten are stronger than one. For what? For putting in chains? For killing? For dragging whither they choose? For taking away what a man has? The ten, therefore, conquer the one in this in which they are stronger. In what, then, are the ten weaker? If the one possesses right opinions and the others do not... Well, then, can the ten conquer in this matter? 
how is it possible? If we were placed in the scales, must not the heavier draw down the scale in which it is? How strange, then, that Socrates should have been treated so by the Athenians. Slave, why do you say Socrates? Speak of the thing as it is. How strange that the poor body of Socrates should have been carried off and dragged to prison by stronger men, and that any one should have given hemlock to the poor body of Socrates, and that it should breathe out the life. Do these things seem strange? Do they seem unjust? Do you, on account of these things, blame God? Had Socrates, then, no equivalent for these things? Where, then, for him was the nature of good? Whom shall we listen to, you or him? And what does Socrates say? Anatus and Miletus can kill me, but they cannot hurt me. And further, he says... If it so pleases God, so let it be. But show me that he who has the inferior principles overpowers him who is superior in principles. He will never show this, nor come near to showing it. For this is the law of nature and of God, that the superior shall always overpower the inferior. In what? In that in which it is superior. One body is stronger than another. Many are stronger than one. The thief is stronger than he who is not a thief. This is the reason why I also lost my lamp, because in wakefulness the thief was superior to me. But the man bought the lamp at this price. For a lamp he became a thief, a faithless fellow, and like a wild beast. This seemed to him a good bargain. Be it so. But a man has seized me by the cloak and is drawing me to the public place. Then others bawl out, Philosopher, what has been the use of your opinions? See, you are dragged to prison. You are going to be beheaded. And what system of philosophy could I have made, so that if a stronger man should have laid hold of my cloak, I should not be dragged off? That if ten men should have laid hold of me and cast me into prison, I should not be cast in? Have I learned nothing else, then? I have learned to see that everything which happens, if it be independent of my will, is nothing to me. I may ask, if you have not gained by this, why, then, do you seek advantage in anything else than in that in which you have learned that advantage is? Then sitting in prison, I say, the man who cries out in this way neither hears what words mean, nor understands what is said, nor does he care at all to know what philosophers say or what they do. Let him alone. But now he says to the prisoner, Come out of your prison. If you have no further need of me in prison, I come out. If you should have need of me again, I will enter the prison. How long will you act thus? So long as reason requires me to be with the body. But when reason does not require this, Take away the body and fare you well. Only we must not do it inconsiderately, nor weakly, nor for any slight reason. For on the other hand, God does not wish it to be done, and he has need of such a world and such inhabitants in it. But if he sounds the signal for retreat, as he did to Socrates, we must obey him who gives the signal as if he were a general. Well then, Ought we to say such things to the many? Why should we? Is it not enough for a man to be persuaded himself? When children come clapping their hands and crying out, Today is the good Saturnalia! Do we say, The Saturnalia are not good? By no means, we clap our hands also. Do you also, then, when you are not able to make a man change his mind, be assured that he is a child? and clap your hands with him. And if you do not choose to do this, keep silent. A man must keep this in mind, and when he is called to any such difficulty, he should know that the time has come for showing if he has been instructed. For he who has come into a difficulty is like a young man from a school who has practiced the resolution of syllogisms. 
and if any person proposes to him an easy syllogism, he says, Rather propose to me a syllogism which is skillfully complicated, that I may exercise myself on it. Even athletes are dissatisfied with slight young men and say, He cannot lift me. This is a youth of noble disposition. You do not so, but when the time of trial has come, one of you must weep and say, I wish that I had learned more. A little more of what? If you did not learn these things in order to show them in practice, why did you learn them? I think that there is someone among you who are sitting here, who is suffering like a woman in labor, and saying, Oh, that such a difficulty does not present itself to me as that which has come to this man. Oh, that I should be wasting my life in a corner when I might be crowned at Olympia. When will anyone announce to me such a contest? Such ought to be the disposition of all of you. Even among the gladiators of Caesar the Emperor, there are some who complain grievously that they are not brought forward and matched, and they offer up prayers to God and address themselves to their superintendents, entreating that they may fight. And will no one among you show himself such? I would willingly take a voyage to Rome for this purpose and see what my athlete is doing, how he is studying his subject. I do not choose such a subject, he says. Why, is it in your power to take what subject you choose? There has been given to you such a body as you have, such parents, such brethren, such a country, such a place in your country. Then you come to me and say, Change my subject. Have you not abilities which enable you to manage the subject which has been given to you? You ought to say, It is your business to propose. It is mine to exercise myself well. However, you do not say so. But you say, Do not propose to me such a topic, but such as I would choose. Do not urge against me such an objection, but such as I would choose. There will be a time, perhaps, when tragic actors will suppose that they are only masks and buskins and long cloak. I say these things, man, are your material and subject. Utter something that we may know whether you are a tragic actor or a buffoon, for both of you have all the rest in common. If anyone then should take away the tragic actor's buskins and his mask, and introduce him on the stage as a phantom. Is the tragic actor lost, or does he still remain? If he has voice, he still remains. An example of another kind. Assume the governorship of a province. I assume it, and when I have assumed it, I show how an instructed man behaves. Lay aside the laticlave, or the mark of senatorial rank, and clothing yourself in rags, come forward in this character. What then, have I not the power of displaying a good voice? That is, of doing something that I ought to do. How then do you now appear on the stage of life? As a witness summoned by God? Come forward, you, and bear testimony for me, for you are worthy to be brought forward as a witness by me. Is anything external to the will, good or bad? Do I hurt any man? Have I made every man's interest dependent on any man except himself? What testimony do you give for God? I am in a wretched condition, master or lord, and I am unfortunate. No man cares for me. No man gives me anything. All blame me. All speak ill of me. Is this the evidence that you are going to give and disgrace his summons, who has conferred so much honor on you and thought you worthy of being called to bear such testimony? But suppose that he who has the power has declared, I judge you to be impious and profane. What has happened to you? I have been judged to be impious and profane. Nothing else? Nothing else. But if the same person had passed judgment on a hypothetical syllogism, 
and had made a declaration, the conclusion that if it is day, it is light, I declare to be false. What has happened to the hypothetical syllogism? Who is judged in this case? Who has been condemned? The hypothetical syllogism, or the man who has been deceived by it? Does he then who has the power of making any declaration about you know what is pious or impious? Has he studied it? And has he learned it? Where? From whom? Then it is the fact that a musician pays no regard to him who declares that the lowest chord in the lyre is the highest. Nor yet a geometrician, if he declares that the lines from the center of a circle to the circumference are not equal. And shall he who is really instructed pay any regard to the uninstructed man when he pronounces judgment on what is pious and what is impious, on what is just and unjust? Oh, the signal wrong done by the instructed. Did they learn this here? Will you not leave these small arguments about these matters to others? To lazy fellows that they may sit in a corner and receive their sorry pay or grumble that no one gives them anything? And will you not come forward and make use of what you have learned? For it is not these small arguments that are wanted now. The writings of the Stoics are full of them. What then is the thing which is wanted? A man who shall apply them. One who by his acts shall bear testimony to his words. Assume, I entreat you, this character that we may no longer use in the schools the examples of the ancients, but may have some example of our own. To whom, then, does the contemplation of these matters, philosophical inquiries, belong? To him who has leisure. For man is an animal that loves contemplation. But it is shameful to contemplate these things as runaway slaves do. We should sit as in a theater, free from distraction, and listen at one time to the tragic actor, at another time to the lute player, and not do as slaves do. As soon as the slave has taken his station, he praises the actor, and at the same time looks around. Then if anyone calls out his master's name, the slave is immediately frightened and disturbed. It is shameful for philosophers thus to contemplate the works of nature. For what is a master? Man is not the master of man, but death is, and life, and pleasure, and pain. For if he comes without these things, bring Caesar to me, and you will see how firm I am. But when he shall come with these things, thundering and lightning, and when I am afraid of them, what do I do then except to recognize my master like the runaway slave? But so long as I have any respite from these terrors, as a runaway slave stands in the theater, so do I. I bathe, I drink, I sing. But all this I do with terror and uneasiness. But if I shall release myself from my masters, that is, from those things by means of which masters are formidable, what further trouble have I? What master have I still? What, then, ought we to publish these things to all men? No, but we ought to accommodate ourselves to the ignorant, and to say, This man recommends to me that which he thinks good for himself. I excuse him. For Socrates also excused the jailer, who had the charge of him in prison and was weeping when Socrates was going to drink the poison, and said, How generously he laments over us. Does he then say to the jailer that for this reason we have sent away the women? No, but he says it to his friends who were able to hear or understand it, and he treats the jailer as a child. What we ought to have ready in difficult circumstances... When you are going in to any great personage... Remember that another also from above sees what is going on, and that you ought to please him rather than the other. He then who sees from above asks you, In the schools, 
What used you to say about exile and bonds and death and disgrace? I used to say that they are things indifferent, neither good nor bad. What then do you say of them now? Are they changed at all? No. Are you changed then? No. Tell me then, what things are indifferent? The things which are independent of the will. Tell me also, what follows from this? The things which are independent of the will are nothing to me. Tell me also about the good. What was your opinion? A will such as we ought to have, and also such a use of appearances. End the end or purpose. What is it? To follow thee. Do you say this now also? I say the same now also. Then go into the great personage boldly, and remember these things, and you will see what a youth is who has studied these things when he is among men who have not studied them. I indeed imagine that you will have such thoughts as these. Why do we make so great and so many preparations for nothing? Is this the thing which men name power? Is this the antechamber? This the men of the bedchamber? This the armed guards? Is it for this that I listen to so many discourses? All this is nothing. But I have been preparing myself as for something great. That confidence or courage is not inconsistent with caution. The opinion of the philosophers perhaps seems to some to be a paradox. But still, let us examine as well as we can. If it is true that it is possible to do everything both with caution and with confidence. For caution seems to be in a manner contrary to confidence, and contraries are in no way consistent. That which seems to many to be a paradox in the matter under consideration, in my opinion, is of this kind. If we asserted that we ought to employ caution and confidence in the same things, men might justly accuse us of bringing together things which cannot be united, But now where is the difficulty in what is said? For if these things are true, which have been often said and often proved, that the nature of good is in the use of appearances, and the nature of evil likewise, and that things independent of our will do not admit either the nature of evil nor of good, what paradox do the philosophers assert if they say that where things are not dependent on the will— There you should employ confidence, but where they are dependent on the will, there you should employ caution. For if the bad consists in a bad exercise of the will, caution ought only to be used where things are dependent on the will. But if things independent of the will and not in our power are nothing to us, with respect to these we must employ confidence. And thus we shall both be cautious and confident, and indeed confident because of our caution. For by employing caution toward things which are really bad, it will result that we shall have confidence with respect to things which are not so. We are then in the condition of deer, when they flee from the huntsman's feathers in fright. Whither do they turn, and what do they seek refuge as safe? They turn to the nets, And thus they perish by confounding things which are objects of fear with things that they ought not to fear. Thus we also act, in what cases do we fear? In things which are independent of the will. In what cases, on the contrary, do we behave with confidence as if there were no danger? In things dependent on the will. To be deceived then, or to act rashly or shamelessly, or with base desire to seek something, does not concern us at all. If we only hit the mark in things which are independent of our will. But where there is death, or exile, or pain, or infamy, 
There we attempt to run away. There we are struck with terror. Therefore, as we may expect it to happen with those who err in the greatest matters, we convert natural confidence, that is according to nature, into audacity, desperation, rashness, shamelessness, and we convert natural caution and modesty into cowardice and meanness, which are full of fear and confusion. For if a man should transfer caution to those things in which the will may be exercised, and the acts of the will, he will immediately by willing to be cautious have also the power of avoiding what he chooses. But if he transfer it to the things which are not in his power and will, and attempt to avoid the things which are in the power of others, he will of necessity fear. He will be unstable. He will be disturbed. For death and pain is not formidable, but the fear of death or pain. For this reason we commend the poet who said, Not death is evil, but a shameful death. Confidence and courage then ought to be employed against death and caution against the fear of death. But now we do the contrary and employ against death the attempt to escape. And to our opinion about it, we employ carelessness, rashness, and indifference. These things Socrates properly used to call tragic masks. For as to children masks appear terrible and fearful from inexperience, we also are affected in like manner by events or the things which happen in life for no other reason than children are by masks. For what is a child? Ignorance. What is a child? Want of knowledge. For when a child knows these things, he is in no way inferior to us. What is death? A tragic mask. Turn it and examine it. See, it does not bite. The poor body must be separated from the spirit either now or later, as it was separated from it before. Why then are you troubled if it be separated now? For if it is not separated now, it will be separated afterwards. Why? That the period of the universe may be completed. For it has need of the present and of the future and of the past. What is pain? A mask. Turn it and examine it. The poor flesh is moved roughly, then on the contrary smoothly. If this does not satisfy or please you, the door is open. If it does, bear with things. For the door ought to be open for all occasions, and so we have no trouble. What, then, is the fruit of these opinions? It is that which ought to be the most noble and the most becoming to those who are really educated. Release from perturbation. Release from fear. Freedom. For in these matters we must not believe the many, who say that free persons only ought to be educated, but we should rather believe the philosophers who say that the educated only are free. How is this? In this manner... Is freedom anything else than the power of living as we choose? Nothing else. Tell me then, ye men, do you wish to live in error? We do not. No one then who lives in error is free. Do you wish to live in fear? Do you wish to live in sorrow? Do you wish to live in perturbation? By no means. No one, then, who is in a state of fear or sorrow or perturbation is free. But whoever is delivered from sorrows and fears and perturbations, he is at the same time also delivered from servitude. How, then, can we continue to believe you, most dear legislators, when you say, We only allow free persons to be educated. For philosophers say we allow none to be free except the educated. That is, God does not allow it. 
When then a man has turned round before the praetor his own slave, has he done nothing? He has done something. What? He has turned round his own slave before the praetor. Has he done nothing more? Yes, he is also bound to pay for him the tax called the twentieth. Well then, is not the man who has gone through this ceremony become free? No more than he has become free from perturbations. Have you who are able to turn round or free others no master? Is not money your master? Or a girl? Or a boy? Or some tyrant? Or some friend of the tyrant? Why do you tremble then when you are going off to any trial or danger of this kind? It is for this reason that I often say, Study and hold in readiness these principles by which you may determine what those things are with reference to which you ought to have confidence and courage, and those things with reference to which you ought to be cautious. Courageous in that which does not depend on your will, cautious in that which does depend on it. Well, have I not read to you, and do you not know what I was doing? In what? In my little dissertations. Show me how you are with respect to desires and aversion. And show me if you do not fail in getting what you wish. And if you do not fall into the things which you would avoid. But as to these long and labored sentences, you will take them and blot them out. What then? Did not Socrates write? And who wrote so much? But how? as he could not always have at hand one to argue against his principles, or to be argued against in turn, he used to argue with and examine himself. And he was always treating at least some one subject in a practical way. These are the things which a philosopher writes, but little dissertations and that method which I speak of, he leaves to the others, to the stupid, or to those happy men who, being free from perturbations, have leisure, or to such as are too foolish to reckon consequences. And will you now, when the opportunity invites, go and display those things which you possess, and recite them, and make an idle show, and say, See how I make dialogues? Do not so, my man, but rather say, See how I am not disappointed of that which I desire. See how I do not fall into that which I would avoid. Set death before me, and you will see. Set before me pain, prison, disgrace, and condemnation. This is the proper display of a young man who has come out of the schools. But leave the rest to others. And let no one ever hear you say a word about these things. And if any man commends you for them, do not allow it. But think that you are nobody and know nothing. Only show that you know this, how never to be disappointed in your desire, and how never to fall into that which you would avoid. Let others labor at forensic causes, problems, and syllogisms. Do you labor at thinking about death, chains, the rack? exile, and do all this with confidence and reliance on him who has called you to these sufferings, who has judged you worthy of the place in which, being stationed, you will show what things the rational governing power can do when it takes its stand against the forces which are not within the power of our will. And thus the paradox will no longer appear either impossible or a paradox that a man ought to be at the same time cautious and courageous. Courageous toward the things which do not depend on the will, and cautious in things which are within the power of the will. Of Tranquility, or Freedom from Perturbation Consider, you who are going into court, what you wish to maintain and what you wish to succeed in. For if you wish to maintain a will conformable to nature, 
You have every security, every facility. You have no troubles. For if you wish to maintain what is in your own power and is naturally free, and if you are content with these, what else do you care for? For who is the master of such things? Who can take them away? If you choose to be modest and faithful, who shall not allow you to be so? If you choose not to be restrained or compelled, who shall compel you to desire what you think that you ought not to desire? Who shall compel you to avoid what you do not think fit to avoid? But what do you say? The judge will determine against you something that appears formidable. But that you should also suffer in trying to avoid it, how can he do that? When the pursuit of objects and the avoiding of them are in your power, what else do you care for? Let this be your preface, this your narrative, this your confirmation, this your victory, this your peroration, this your applause or the approbation which you will receive. Therefore Socrates said to one who was reminding him to prepare for his trial, Do you not think, then, that I have been preparing for it all my life? By what kind of preparation? I have maintained that which was in my own power. How, then? I have never done anything unjust either in my private or in my public life. But if you wish to maintain externals also, your poor body, your little property and your little estimation— I advise you to make from this moment all possible preparation, and then consider both the nature of your judge and your adversary. If it is necessary to embrace his knees, embrace his knees. If to weep, weep. If to groan, groan. For when you have subjected to externals what is your own, then be a slave and do not resist. And do not sometimes choose to be a slave, and sometimes not choose. But with all your mind be one or the other, either free or a slave, either instructed or uninstructed, either a well-bred cock or a mean one, either endure to be beaten until you die, or yield at once. And let it not happen to you to receive many stripes and then to yield." But if these things are base, determine immediately. Where is the nature of evil and good? It is where truth is. Where truth is and where nature is, there is caution. Where truth is, there is courage where nature is. For what do you think? Do you think that if Socrates had wished to preserve externals, he would have come forward and said, Anatus and Melitus can certainly kill me? but to harm me they are not able? Was he so foolish as not to see that this way leads not to the preservation of life and fortune, but to another end? What is the reason, then, that he takes no account of his adversaries and even irritates them? Just in the same way my friend Heraclitus, who had a little suit in Rhodes about a bit of land, and had to prove to his judges that his case was just, said when he had come to the peroration of his speech, I will neither entreat you nor do I care what judgment you will give. And it is you, father, than I, who are on trial. And thus he ended the business. What need was there of this? Only do not entreat, but do not also say, I do not entreat, unless there is a fit occasion to irritate purposely the judges, as was the case with Socrates. And you, if you are preparing such a peroration, why do you wait? Why do you obey the order to submit to trial? For if you wish to be crucified, wait and the cross will come. But if you choose to submit and to plead your cause as well as you can, you must do what is consistent with this object, provided you maintain what is your own, your proper character." For this reason also it is ridiculous to say, Suggest something to me, or tell me what to do. What should I suggest to you? Well, form my mind so as to accommodate itself to any event. 
Why, that is just the same as if a man who is ignorant of letters should say, Tell me what to write when any name is proposed to me. For if I should tell him to write Dion, and then another should come and propose to him not the name of Dion, but that of Theon, what will be done? What will he write? But if you have practiced writing, you are also prepared to write or to do anything that is required. If you are not, what can I now suggest? For if circumstances require something else, what will you say, or what will you do? Remember then this general precept, and you will need no suggestion. But if you gape after externals, you must of necessity ramble up and down in obedience to the will of your master. And who is the master? He who has the power over the things which you seek to gain or try to avoid. To those who recommend persons to philosophers. Diogenes said well to one who asked from him letters of recommendation. That you are a man, he said, he will know as soon as he sees you. And he will know whether you are good or bad if he is, by experience, skillful to distinguish the good and the bad. But if he is without experience, he will never know if I write to him ten thousand times. For it is just the same as if a drachma, or a piece of silver money, asked to be recommended to a person to be tested. If he is skillful in testing silver, he will know what you are. For you, the drachma, will recommend yourself. We ought then in life also to have some skill as in the case of silver coin, that a man may be able to say like the judge of silver, Bring me any drachma and I will test it. But in the case of syllogisms, I would say, Bring any man that you please, and I will distinguish for you the man who knows how to resolve syllogisms and the man who does not. Why? Because I know how to resolve syllogisms. I have the power, which a man must have who is able to discover those who have the power of resolving syllogisms. But in life, how do I act? At one time I call a thing good, and at another time bad. What is the reason? The contrary to that which is in the case of syllogisms, ignorance, and inexperience. against a person who had once been detected in adultery. As Epictetus was saying that a man is formed for fidelity, and that he who subverts fidelity subverts the peculiar characteristic of men, there entered one of those who are considered to be men of letters, who had once been detected in adultery in the city. Then Epictetus continued, but if we lay aside this fidelity for which we are formed and make designs against our neighbor's wife, what are we doing? What else but destroying and overthrowing? Whom the man of fidelity, the man of modesty, the man of sanctity, is this all? And are we not overthrowing neighborhood and friendship and the community? And in what place are we putting ourselves? How shall I consider you, man? As a neighbor? As a friend? What kind of one? As a citizen? Wherein shall I trust you? So if you were an utensil so worthless that a man could not use you, you would be pitched out on the dung heaps, and no man would pick you up. But if being a man you are unable to fill any place which befits a man, what shall we do with you? For suppose that you cannot hold the place of a friend. Can you hold the place of a slave? And who will trust you? Are you not then content that you should also be pitched somewhere on a dung heap, as a useless utensil and a bit of dung? Then will you say, No man cares for me, a man of letters? They do not, because you are bad and useless. It is just as if the wasps complained because no man cares for them, but all fly from them, and if a man can, he strikes them and knocks them down. 
You have such a sting that you throw into trouble and pain any man that you wound with it. What would you have us do with you? You have no place where you can be put. What, then? Are not women common by nature? So I say also, for a little pig is common to all the invited guests, but when the portions have been distributed, go if you think it right, and snatch up the portion of him who reclines next to you, or slyly steal it, or place your hand down by it and lay hold of it, and if you cannot tear away a bit of the meat, grease your fingers and lick them. A fine companion over cups, and Socratic guest indeed. Well, is not the theater common to the citizens? When they have taken their seats, come, if you think proper, and eject one of them. In this way, women also are common by nature. When the legislature, like the master of a feast, has distributed them, will you not also look for your own portion, and not filch and handle what belongs to another? But I am a man of letters, and understand Archidemus. Understand Archidemus, then, and be an adulterer, and faithless, and instead of a man, be a wolf or an ape, for what is the difference? How Magnanimity is Consistent with Care Things themselves, or materials, are indifferent, but the use of them is not indifferent. How then shall a man preserve firmness and tranquility, and at the same time be careful and neither rash nor negligent? If he imitates those who play at dice, the counters are indifferent, the dice are indifferent. How do I know what the cast will be? But to use carefully and dexterously the cast of the dice, this is my business. Thus then in life also the chief business is this. Distinguish and separate things, and say, externals are not in my power, will is in my power. Where shall I seek the good and the bad? Within, in the things which are my own. But in what does not belong to you call nothing either good or bad, or profit or damage, or anything of the kind. What then? Should we use such things carelessly? In no way. For this, on the other hand, is bad for the faculty of the will, and consequently against nature. But we should act carefully because the use is not indifferent. And we should also act with firmness and freedom from perturbations, because the material is indifferent. For where the material is not indifferent, there no man can hinder me nor compel me. Where I can be hindered and compelled, the obtaining of those things is not in my power, nor is it good or bad. But the use is either good or bad, and the use is in my power. But it is difficult to mingle and to bring together these two things, the carefulness of him who is affected by the matter, or things about him, and the firmness of him who has no regard for it. But it is not impossible. And if it is, happiness is impossible. But we should act as we do in the case of a voyage. What can I do? I can choose the master of the ship, the sailors, the day, the opportunity. Then comes a storm. What more have I to care for? For my part is done. The business belongs to another, the master. But the ship is sinking. What then have I to do? I do the only thing that I can, not to be drowned full of fear, nor screaming, nor blaming God, but knowing that what has been produced must also perish. For I am not an immortal being, but a man, a part of the whole, as an hour is a part of the day. I must be present like the hour and past like the hour. What difference then does it make to me how I pass away whether by being suffocated or by a fever, for I must pass through some such means. This is just what you will see those doing who play at ball skillfully. 
No one cares about the ball as being good or bad, but about throwing and catching it. In this, therefore, is the skill, in this the art, the quickness, the judgment, so that even if I spread out my lap, I may not be able to catch it, and another, if I throw, may catch the ball. But if with perturbation and fear we receive or throw the ball, what kind of play is it then? And wherein shall a man be steady, and how shall a man see the order in the game? But one will say, throw, or do not throw, and another will say, you have thrown once. This is quarreling, not play. Socrates then knew how to play at ball. How? By using pleasantry in the court where he was tried. Tell me, he says, Anatus, how do you say that I do not believe in God? The daemons, who are they, think you? Are they not sons of gods, or are compounded of gods and men? When Anatus admitted this, Socrates said, Who then, think you, can believe that there are mules or half-asses, but not asses? And this he said as if he were playing at ball. But what was the ball in that case? Life, chains, banishment, a draft of poison, separation from wife and leaving children orphans. These were the things with which he was playing. But still did he play and threw the ball skillfully. So we should do. We must employ all the care of the players, but must show the same indifference about the ball. For we ought by all means to apply our art to some external material, not as valuing the material, but whatever it may be showing our art in it. Thus too the weaver does not make wool, but exercises his art upon such as he receives. Another gives you food and property, and is able to take them away, and your poor body also. When then you have received the material, work on it. If then you come out of the trial without having suffered anything, all who meet you will congratulate you on your escape. But he who knows how to look at such things, if he shall see that you have behaved properly in the matter, will commend you and be pleased with you. And if he shall find that you owe your escape to any want of proper behavior, he will do the contrary. For where rejoicing is reasonable, there is also congratulation reasonable. How then is it said that some external things are according to nature and others contrary to nature? It is said as it is might be said if we were separated from union or society. For the foot I shall say that it is according to nature for it to be clean. But if you take it as a foot and as a thing not detached or independent, it will befit it both to step into the mud and tread on thorns and sometimes to be cut off for the good of the whole body. Otherwise, it is no longer a foot. We should think in some such way about ourselves also. What are you? A man. If you consider yourself as detached from other men, it is according to nature to live to old age, to be rich, to be healthy. But if you consider yourself as a man and a part of a certain whole... It is for the sake of that whole that at one time you should be sick, at another time take a voyage and run into danger, and at another time be in want, and in some cases die prematurely. Why then are you troubled? Do you not know that as a foot is no longer a foot if it is detached from the body, so you are no longer a man if you are separated from other men? For what is a man? A part of a state, of that first which consists of gods and of men, then of that which is called next to it, which is a small image of the universal state. What then? Must I be brought to trial? Must another have a fever? Another sail on the sea? Another die? And another be condemned? Yes, for it is impossible in such a body in such a universe of things, among so many living together, that such things should not happen, some to one and others to others. It is your duty, then, since you are come here, 
to say what you ought, to arrange these things as it is fit. Then someone says, I shall charge you with doing me wrong. Much good may it do you. I have done my part. But whether you also have done yours, you must look to that. For there is some danger of this too, that it may escape your notice. Of Indifference The hypothetical proposition is indifferent. The judgment about it is not indifferent. But it is either knowledge or opinion or error. Thus life is indifferent. The use is not indifferent. When any man then tells you that these things also are indifferent, do not become negligent. And when a man invites you to be careful about such things, do not become abject and struck with admiration of material things. And it is good for you to know your own preparation and power, that in those matters where you have not been prepared, you may keep quiet and not be vexed if others have the advantage over you. For you too in syllogisms will claim to have the advantage over them, and if others should be vexed at this, you will console them by saying, I have learned them, and you have not. Thus also, where there is need of any practice, seek not that which is acquired from the need of such practice, but yield in that matter to those who have had practice, and be yourself content with firmness of mind. Go and salute a certain person. How? Not meanly. But I have been shut out, for I have not learned to make my way through the window, and when I have found the door shut, I must either come back or enter through the window. But still speak to him. In what way? Not meanly. But suppose that you have not got what you wanted. Was this your business and not his? Why then do you claim that which belongs to another? Always remember what is your own and what belongs to another, and you will not be disturbed. Chrysippus therefore said, Well, so long as future things are uncertain, I always cling to those which are more adapted to the conservation of that which is according to nature. For God himself has given me the faculty of such choice. But if I knew that it was fated, in the order of things, for me to be sick, I would even move toward it. For the foot also, if it had intelligence, would move to go into the mud. For why are ears of corn produced? Is it not that they may become dry? And do they not become dry that they may be reaped? For they are not separated from communion with other things. If then they had perception, ought they to wish never to be reaped? But this is a curse upon ears of corn, to be never reaped. So we must know that in the case of men too, it is a curse not to die, just the same as not to be ripened and not to be reaped. But since we must be reaped, and we also know that we are reaped, we are vexed at it. For we neither know what we are, nor have we studied what belongs to man. And those who have studied horses know what belongs to horses." But Chrysantus, when he was going to strike the enemy, checked himself when he heard the trumpet sounding a retreat. So it seemed better to him to obey the general's command than to follow his own inclination. But not one of us chooses, even when necessity summons, readily to obey it. But weeping and groaning, we suffer what we do suffer, and we call them circumstances." What kind of circumstances, man? If you give the name of circumstances to the things which are around you, all things are circumstances. But if you call hardships by this name, what hardship is there in the dying of that which has been produced? But that which destroys is either a sword, or a wheel, or the sea, or a tile, or a tyrant. Why do you care about the way of going down to Hades? 
all ways are equal. But if you will listen to the truth, the way which the tyrant sends you is shorter. A tyrant never killed a man in six months, but a fever is often a year about it. All these things are only sound and the noise of empty names. I am in danger of my life from Caesar. And am I not in danger who dwell in Nicopolis, where there are so many earthquakes? And when you are crossing the Hadriatic, what hazard do you run? Is it not the hazard of your life? But I am in danger also as to opinion. Do you mean your own? How? For who can compel you to have any opinion which you do not choose? But is it as to another man's opinion? And what kind of danger is yours if others have false opinions? But I am in danger of being banished. What is it to be banished? To be somewhere else than at Rome? Yes. What then if I should be sent to Giara? If that suits you, you will go there. But if it does not, you can go to another place instead of Giara. Whether he also will go who sends you to Giara, whether he choose or not. Why then do you go up to Rome as if it were something great? It is not worth all this preparation, that an ingenious youth should say, It was not worth while to have heard so much, and to have written so much, and to have sat so long by the side of an old man who is not worth much. Only remember that division by which your own and not your own are distinguished. Never claim anything which belongs to others. A tribunal and a prison are each a place, one high and the other low. But the will can be maintained equal if you choose to maintain it equal in each. And we shall then be imitators of Socrates, when we are able to write paeans in prison. But in our present disposition, consider if we could endure in prison another person saying to us, Would you like me to read paeans to you? Why do you trouble me? Do you not know the evils which hold me? Can I in such circumstances listen to paeans? What circumstances? I am going to die. And will other men be immortal? How we ought to use divination. Through an unreasonable regard to divination, many of us omit many duties. For what more can the diviner see than death, or danger, or disease, or generally things of that kind? If then I must expose myself to danger for a friend, and if it is my duty even to die for him, what need have I then for divination? Have I not within me a diviner who has told me the nature of good and of evil, and has explained to me the signs or marks of both? What need have I, then, to consult the viscera of victims or the flight of birds? And why do I submit when he says, It is for your interest? For does he know what is for my interest? Does he know what is good? And as he has learned the signs of the viscera, has he also learned the signs of good and evil? For if he knows the signs of these, he knows the signs both of the beautiful and of the ugly, and of the just and of the unjust. Do you tell me, man, what is the thing which is signified for me? Is it life or death, poverty or wealth? But whether these things are for my interest, or whether they are not, I do not intend to ask you. Why don't you give your opinion on matters of grammar? And why do you give it here about things on which we are all in error, and disputing with one another? The woman, therefore, who intended to send by a vessel a month's provisions to Gratula in her banishment— made a good answer to him who said that Domitian would seize what she sent. 
I would rather, she replied, that Domitian should seize all than that I should not send it. What then leads us to frequent use of divination? Cowardice. The dread of what will happen. This is the reason why we flatter the diviners. Pray, master, shall I succeed to the property of my father? Let us see, let us sacrifice on the occasion. Yes, master, as fortune chooses. When he has said, You shall succeed to the inheritance. We thank him as if we receive the inheritance from him. The consequence is that they play upon us. What then should we do? We ought to come to divination without desire or aversion. As the wayfarer asks of the man whom he meets which of the two roads leads to his journey's end. Without any desire for that which leads to the right rather than to the left. For he has no wish to go by any road except the road which leads to his end. In the same way, Ought we to come to God also as a guide, as we use our eyes, not asking them to show us rather such things as we wish, but receiving the appearances of things such as the eyes present them to us? But now we, trembling, take the auger or bird interpreter by the hand, and while we invoke God we entreat the auger and say, Master, have mercy on me. Suffer me to come safe out of this difficulty. Wretch, would you have then anything other than what is best? Is there then anything better than what pleases God? Why do you, as far as is in your power, corrupt your judge and lead astray your adviser? What is the nature of the good? God is beneficial, but the good also is beneficial. It is consistent, then, that where the nature of God is, there also the nature of the good should be. What, then, is the nature of God? Flesh? Certainly not. An estate in land? By no means. Fame? No. Is it intelligence, knowledge, right reason? Yes. Herein, then, simply seek the nature of the good, for I suppose that you do not seek it in a plant. No. Do you seek it in an irrational animal? No. If then you seek it in a rational animal, why do you still seek it anywhere except in the superiority of rational over irrational animals? Now, plants have not even the power of using appearances, and for this reason you do not apply the term good to them. The good then requires the use of appearances. Does it require this use only? For if you say that it requires this use only, say that the good and that happiness and unhappiness are in irrational animals also. But you do not say this, and you do right. For if they possess even in the highest degree the use of appearances, yet they have not the faculty of understanding the use of appearances, and there is good reason for this, for they exist for the purpose of serving others, and they exercise no superiority. For the ass, I suppose, does not exist for any superiority over others. No, but because we had need of a back which is able to bear something. And in truth we had need also of his being able to walk. And for this reason he received also the faculty of making use of appearances, for otherwise he would not have been able to walk. And here, then, the matter stopped. For if he had also received the faculty of comprehending the use of appearances, it is plain that consistently with reason, he would not then have been subjected to us, nor would he have done us these services. 
but he would have been equal to us and like to us. Will you not then seek the nature of good in the rational animal? For if it is not there, you will not choose to say that it exists in any other thing, plant or animal. What then? Are not plants and animals also the works of God? They are, but they are not superior things, nor yet parts of the gods. But you are a superior thing. You are a portion separated from the deity. You have in yourself a certain portion of him. Why then are you ignorant of your own noble descent? Why do you not know whence you came? Will you not remember when you are eating? who you are who eat and whom you feed. When you are in conjunction with a woman, will you not remember who you are who do this thing? When you are in social intercourse, when you are exercising yourself, when you are engaged in discussion, know you not that you are nourishing a god, that you are exercising a god? Wretch, you are carrying about a god with you, and you know it not. Do you think that I mean some god of silver or of gold and external? You carry him within yourself, and you perceive not that you are polluting him by impure thoughts and dirty deeds. And if an image of God were present, you would not dare to do any of the things which you are doing. But when God himself is present within and sees all, and here's all. You are not ashamed of thinking such things and doing such things, ignorant as you are of your own nature and subject to the anger of God. Then, why do we fear when we are sending a young man from the school into active life, lest he should do anything improperly, eat improperly, have improper intercourse with women, and lest the rags in which he is wrapped should debase him? lest fine garments should make him proud. This youth, if he acts thus, does not know his own God. He knows not with whom he sets out into the world. But we can endure when he says, I wish I had you, God, with me. Have you not God with you? And do you seek for any other when you have him? Or will God tell you anything else than this? If you were a statue of Phidias, either Athena or Zeus, you would think both of yourself and of the artist. And if you had any understanding or power of perception, you would try to do nothing unworthy of him who made you or of yourself, and try not to appear in an unbecoming dress or attitude to those who look on you. But now, because Zeus has made you, for this reason do you care not how you shall appear? And yet is the artist in the one case like the artist in the other? Or the work in the one case like the other? And what work of an artist, for instance, has in itself the faculties which the artist shows in making it? Is it not marble or bronze or gold or ivory? And the Athena of Phidias when she has once extended the hand and received in it the figure of victory, stands in that attitude forever. But the works of God have power of motion. They breathe. They have the faculty of using the appearances of things and the power of examining them. Being the work of such an artist, do you dishonor him? And what shall I say, not only that he made you, but also entrusted you to yourself? and made you a deposit to yourself. Will you not think of this too? But do you also dishonor your guardianship? But if God had entrusted an orphan to you, would you thus neglect him? He has delivered yourself to your own care and says, I had no one fitter to entrust him to than yourself. Keep him for me such as he is by nature, modest, faithful, erect, unterrified, free from passion and perturbation. 
and then you do not keep him such. But some will say, whence has this fellow got the arrogance which he displays and these supercilious looks? I have not yet so much gravity as befits a philosopher, for I do not yet feel confidence in what I have learned and in what I have assented to. I still fear my own weakness. Let me get confidence, and then you shall see a countenance such as I ought to have, and an attitude such as I ought to have. Then I will show to you the statue when it is perfected, when it is polished. What do you expect? A supercilious countenance. Does the Zeus at Olympia lift up his brow? No, his look is fixed as becomes him who is ready to say, Irrevocable is my word and shall not fail. Such will I show myself to you, faithful, modest, noble, free from perturbation. What, and immortal too, exempt from old age and from sickness? No, but dying as becomes a god, sickening as becomes a god. This power I possess, this I can do, but the rest I do not possess, nor can I do. I will show the nerves or strength of a philosopher. What nerves are these? A desire never disappointed, an aversion which never falls on that which it would avoid, a proper pursuit, a diligent purpose, an ascent which is not rash. These you shall see. That when we cannot fulfill that which the character of a man promises, we assume the character of a philosopher. It is no common or easy thing to do this only, to fulfill the promise of a man's nature. For what is a man? The answer is a rational and mortal being. Then by the rational faculty, from whom are we separated? From wild beasts. And from what others? From sheep and like animals. Take care, then, to do nothing like a wild beast. But if you do, you have lost the character of a man. You have not fulfilled your promise. See that you do nothing like a sheep, but if you do, in this case also the man is lost. What then do we do as sheep? When we act gluttonously, when we act lewdly, when we act rashly, filthily, inconsiderately, to what have we declined? To sheep. What have we lost? The rational faculty. When we act contentiously and harmfully and passionately and violently, to what have we declined? To wild beasts. Consequently, some of us are great wild beasts, and others little beasts of a bad disposition and small, whence we may say, let me be eaten by a lion. But in all these ways the promise of a man acting as a man is destroyed. For when is a conjunctive or complex proposition maintained? When it fulfills what its nature promises, so that the preservation of a complex proposition is when it is a conjunction of truths. When is a disjunctive maintained? When it fulfills what it promises. When are flutes, a lyre, a horse, a dog, preserved? when they severally keep their promise. What is the wonder, then, if man also in like manner is preserved, and in like manner is lost? Each man is improved and preserved by corresponding acts, the carpenter by acts of carpentry, the grammarian by acts of grammar. But if a man accustoms himself to write ungrammatically, of necessity his art will be corrupted and destroyed. Thus modest actions preserve the modest man, 
and immodest actions destroy him. And actions of fidelity preserve the faithful man, and the contrary actions destroy him. And on the other hand, contrary actions strengthen contrary characters. Shamelessness strengthens the shameless man. Faithlessness, the faithless man. Abusive words, the abusive man. Anger, the man of an angry temper. An unequal receiving and giving make the avaricious man more avaricious. For this reason, philosophers admonish us not to be satisfied with learning only, but also to add study and then practice. For we have long been accustomed to do contrary things, and we put in practice opinions which are contrary to true opinions. If then we shall not also put in practice right opinions, we shall be nothing more than the expositors of the opinions of others. For now who among us is not able to discourse according to the rules of art about good and evil things in this fashion? That of things some are good and some are bad and some are indifferent. The good then are virtues, and the things which participate in virtues, and the bad are the contrary, and the indifferent are wealth, health, reputation. Then if the midst of our talk there should happen some greater noise than usual, or some of those who are present should laugh at us, we are disturbed. Philosopher, where are the things which you were talking about? Whence did you produce and utter them? From the lips and thence only. Why then do you corrupt the aids provided by others? Why do you treat the weightiest matters as if you were playing a game of dice? For it is one thing to lay up bread and wine as in a storehouse, and another thing to eat. That which has been eaten is digested, distributed, and become sinews, flesh, bones, blood, healthy color, healthy breath. Whatever is stored up, when you choose, you can readily take and show it. But you have no other advantage from it except so far as to appear to possess it. For what is the difference between explaining these doctrines and those of men who have different opinions? Sit down now, and explain according to the rules of art the opinions of Epicurus, and perhaps you will explain his opinions in a more useful manner than Epicurus himself. Why then do you call yourself a Stoic? Why do you deceive the many? Why do you act the part of a Jew when you are a Greek? Do you not see how or why each is called a Jew, or a Syrian, or an Egyptian? And when we see a man inclining to two sides, we are accustomed to say, This man is not a Jew, but he acts as one. But when he has assumed the effects of one who has been imbued with Jewish doctrine, and has adopted that sect, then he is in fact, and he is named, a Jew. Thus we too, being falsely imbued or baptized, are in name Jews, but in fact we are something else. Our affects or feelings are inconsistent with our words. We are far from practicing what we say, and that of which we are proud, as if we knew it. Thus, being unable to fulfill even what the character of a man promises, we even add to it the profession of a philosopher, which is as heavy a burden as if a man who was unable to bear ten pounds should attempt to raise the stone which Ajax lifted. How we may discover the duties of life from names. Consider who you are. In the first place, you are a man. And this is one who has nothing superior to the faculty of the will, but all other things subjected to it and the faculty itself he possesses unenslaved and free from subjection. Consider then from what things you have been separated by reason. You have been separated from wild beasts. You have been separated from domestic animals. 
Further, you are a citizen of the world and a part of it. Not one of the subservient or serving, but one of the principal or ruling parts. For you are capable of comprehending the divine administration and of considering the connection of things. What, then, does the character of a citizen promise or profess? To hold nothing as profitable to himself, to deliberate about nothing as if he were detached from the community, but to act as the hand or foot would do, if they had reason and understood the constitution of nature. For they would never put themselves in motion, nor desire anything otherwise than with reference to the whole. Therefore the philosophers say well, that if the good man had foreknowledge of what would happen, he would cooperate towards his own sickness and death and mutilation. Since he knows that these things are assigned to him according to the universal arrangement, and that the whole is superior to the part, and the state to the citizen. But now, because we do not know the future, it is our duty to stick to the things which are in their nature more suitable for our choice. For we were made among other things for this. After this, remember that you are a son. What does this character promise? To consider that everything which is the son's belongs to the father. To obey him in all things, never to blame him to another nor to say or do anything which does him injury, to yield to him in all things and give way, cooperating with him as far as you can. After this, know that you are a brother also, and that to this character it is due to make concessions, to be easily persuaded, to speak good of your brother, never to claim in opposition to him any of the things which are independent of the will but readily to give them up, that you may have the larger share in what is dependent on the will. For see what a thing it is, in place of a lettuce, if it should so happen, or a seat, to gain for yourself goodness of disposition. How great is the advantage! Next to this, if you are a senator of any state, remember that you are a senator. If a youth that you are a youth, if an old man, that you are an old man. For each of such names, if it comes to be examined, marks out the proper duties. But if you go and blame your brother, I say to you, you have forgotten who you are and what is your name. In the next place, if you were a smith and made a wrong use of the hammer, you would have forgotten the smith, and if you have forgotten the brother and instead of a brother have become an enemy, would you appear not to have changed one thing for another in that case? And if instead of a man, who is a tame animal and social, you are become a mischievous wild beast, treacherous and biting, have you lost nothing? But... I suppose you must lose a bit of money that you may suffer damage. And does the loss of nothing else do a man damage? If you had lost the art of grammar or music, would you think the loss of it a damage? And if you shall lose modesty, moderation, and gentleness, do you think the loss nothing? And yet the things first mentioned are lost by some cause external and independent of the will, and the second by our own fault. And as to the first, neither to have them nor to lose them is shameful. But as to the second, not to have them and to lose them is shameful and matter of reproach and a misfortune. What does the pathic lose? He loses the character of man. What does he lose who makes the pathic what he is? Many other things. And he also loses the man no less than the other. What does he lose who commits adultery? He loses the character of the modest, the temperate, the decent, the citizen, 
the neighbor. What does he lose who is angry? Something else. What does the coward lose? Something else. No man is bad without suffering some loss and damage. If then you look for the damage and the loss of money only, all these men receive no harm or damage. It may be they have even profit and gain when they acquire a bit of money by any of these deeds. But consider that if you refer everything to a small coin, not even he who loses his nose is in your opinion damaged. Yes, you say, for he is mutilated in his body. Well, but does he who has lost his smell only lose nothing? Is there then no energy of the soul which is an advantage to him who possesses it, and a damage to him who has lost it? Tell me what sort of energy you mean. Have we not a natural modesty? We have. Does he who loses this sustain no damage? Is he deprived of nothing? Does he part with nothing of the things which belong to him? Have we not naturally fidelity? Natural affection? A natural disposition to help others? A natural disposition to forbearance? The man then who allows himself to be damaged in these matters... Can he be free from harm and uninjured? What then? Shall I not hurt him who has hurt me? In the first place, consider what hurt is, and remember what you have heard from the philosophers. For if the good consists in the will or purpose and tension, and the evil also in the will, see if what you say is not this. What then? Since that man has hurt himself by doing an unjust act to me, shall I not hurt myself by doing some unjust act to him? Why do we not imagine to ourselves or mentally think of something of this kind? But where there is any detriment to the body or to our possession, there is harm there. And where the same thing happens to the faculty of the will, there is, you suppose, no harm? For he who has been deceived, or he who has done an unjust act, neither suffers in the head, nor in the eye, nor in the hip, nor does he lose his estate. And we wish for nothing else than security to these things. But whether we shall have the will modest and faithful, or shameless and faithless, we care not the least except only in the school so far as a few words are concerned. Therefore, our proficiency is limited to these few words, but beyond them, it does not exist even in the slightest degree. What the Beginning of Philosophy Is The Beginning of Philosophy to him at least who enters on it in the right way and by the door, is a consciousness of his own weakness, an inability about necessary things. For we come into the world with no natural notion of a right-angled triangle, or of a diesis or quarter-tone, or of a half-tone. But we learn each of these things by a certain transmission according to art. And for this reason, those who do not know them do not think that they know them. But as to good and evil, and beautiful and ugly, and becoming and unbecoming, and happiness and misfortune, and proper and improper, and what we ought to do and what we ought not to do, whoever came into the world without having an innate idea of them. Wherefore, we all use these names, and we endeavor to fit the preconceptions to these several cases or things thus. He has done well. He has not done well. He has done as he ought, not as he ought. He has been unfortunate. He has been fortunate. He is unjust. He is just. Who does not use these names? 
Who among us defers the use of them till he has learned them? As he defers the use of the words about lines or geometrical figures or sounds? And the cause of this is that we come into the world already taught, as it were, by nature, some things on this matter. And proceeding from these we have added to them self, or conceit. For why, a man says, do I not know the beautiful and the ugly? Have I not the notion of it? You have. Do I not adapt it to the particulars? You do. Do I not then adapt it properly? In that lies the whole question. And conceit is added here. For beginning from these things which are admitted, men proceed to that which is matter of dispute, by means of unsuitable adaptation. For if they possess this power of adaptation in addition to those things, what would hinder them from being perfect? But now, since you think that you properly adapt the preconceptions to the particulars, tell me whence you derive this. Assume that you do so because I think so. But it does not seem so to another, and he thinks that he also makes a proper adaptation. Or does he not think so? He does think so. Is it possible, then, that both of you can properly apply the preconceptions to things about which you have contrary opinions? It is not possible. Can you then show us anything better towards adapting the preconceptions beyond your thinking that you do? Does the madman do any other things than the things which seem to him right? Is then this criterion sufficient for him also? It is not sufficient. Come then to something which is superior to seeming. What is this? Observe. This is the beginning of philosophy, a perception of the disagreement of men with one another, and an inquiry into the cause of the disagreement, and a condemnation and distrust of that which only seems, and a certain investigation of that which seems whether it seems rightly, and a discovery of some rule, as we have discovered, a balance in the determination of weights, and a carpenter's rule or square in the case of straight and crooked things. This is the beginning of philosophy. Must we say that all things are right which seem so to all? And how is it possible that contradictions can be right? Not all, then, but all which seem to us to be right. How more to you than those which seem right to the Syrians? Why more than what seem right to the Egyptians? Why more than what seems right to me or to any other man? Not at all more. What then seems to every man is not sufficient for determining what is. For neither in the case of weights or measures are we satisfied with the bare appearance, but in each case we have discovered a certain rule. In this matter, then, there is no rule superior to what seems. And how is it possible that the most necessary things among men should have no sign or mark and be incapable of being discovered? There is, then, some rule. And why, then, do we not seek the rule and discover it, and afterwards use it without varying from it, not even stretching out the finger without it? For this, I think, is that which, when it is discovered, cures of their madness those who use mere seeming as a measure, and misuse it. So that for the future proceeding from certain things or principles known, and made clear, we may use, in the case of particular things, the preconceptions which are distinctly fixed. What is the matter presented to us about which we are inquiring? Pleasure, for example. Subject it to the rule, throw it into the balance. 
Ought the good to be such a thing that it is fit that we have confidence in it? Yes. And in which we ought to confide? It ought to be. Is it fit to trust to anything which is insecure? No. Is then pleasure anything secure? No. Take it, then, and throw it out of the scale, and drive it far away from the place of good things. But if you are not sharp-sighted, and one balance is not enough for you, bring another. Is it fit to be elated over what is good? Yes. Is it proper, then, to be elated over present pleasure? See that you do not say that it is proper. But if you do, I shall then not think you worthy even of the balance. Thus things are tested and weighed when the rules are ready. And to philosophize is this, to examine and confirm the rules, and then to use them when they are known is the act of a wise and good man. Of Disputation or Discussion What things a man must learn in order to be able to apply the art of disputation has been accurately shown by our philosophers, the Stoics. But with respect to the proper use of the things, we are entirely without practice. Only give to any of us whom you please an illiterate man to discuss with, and he cannot discover how to deal with the man. But when he has moved the man a little, if he answers beside the purpose, he does not know how to treat him. But he then either abuses or ridicules him and says, He is an illiterate man. It is not possible to do anything with him. Now a guide, when he has found a man out of the road, leads him into the right way. He does not ridicule or abuse him and then leave him. Do you also show the illiterate man the truth, and you will see that he follows. But so long as you do not show him the truth, do not ridicule him, but rather feel your own incapacity. How then did Socrates act? He used to compel his adversary in disputation to bear testimony to him and he wanted no other witness. Therefore he could say, I care not for other witnesses, but I am always satisfied with the evidence or testimony of my adversary, and I do not ask the opinion of others, but only the opinion of him who is disputing with me. For he used to make the conclusions drawn from natural notions so plain that every man saw the contradiction if it existed, and withdrew from it thus. Does the envious man rejoice? By no means, but he is rather pained. Well, do you think that envy is pain over evils? And what envy is there of evils? Therefore he made his adversary say that envy is pain over good things. Well then, would any man envy those who are nothing to him? By no means. Thus, having completed the notion and distinctly fixed it, he would go away without saying to his adversary, Define to me envy. And if the adversary had defined envy, he did not say, You have defined it badly, for the terms of the definition do not correspond to the thing defined. These are technical terms, and for this reason disagreeable and hardly intelligible to illiterate men which terms we, philosophers, cannot lay aside. But that the illiterate man himself, who follows the appearances presented to him, should be able to concede anything or reject it, we can never by the use of these terms move him to do. Accordingly, being conscious of our own inability, we do not attempt the thing, at least such of us as have any caution do not but the greater part and the rash, when they enter into such disputations, confuse themselves and confuse others, and finally abusing their adversaries and abused by them, 
they walk away. Now this was the first and chief peculiarity of Socrates, never to be irritated in argument, never to utter anything abusive, anything insulting, but to bear with abusive persons and to put an end to the quarrel. If you would know what great power he had in this way, read the Symposium of Xenophon, and you will see how many quarrels he put an end to. Hence, with good reason, in the poets also this power is most highly praised. Quickly with skill he settles great disputes. From the Hesiod, Theogony, verse 87. Well then, the matter is not now very safe, and particularly at Rome. For he who attempts to do it must not do it in a corner, you may be sure, but must go to a man of consular rank, if it so happen, or to a rich man and ask him, Can you tell me, sir, to whose care you have entrusted your horse? I can tell you. Have you entrusted them to any person indifferently and to one who has no experience of horses? By no means. Well, then, can you tell me to whom you entrust your gold or silver things or your vestments? I don't entrust even these to anyone indifferently. Well, your own body. Have you already considered about entrusting the care of it to any person? Certainly. To a man of experience, I suppose, and one acquainted with elliptic or with the healing art. Without doubt. Are these the best things that you have? Or do you also possess something else which is better than all of these? What kind of a thing do you mean? That I mean which makes use of these things and tests each of them and deliberates. Is it the soul that you mean? You think right, for it is the soul that I mean. In truth, I do think that the soul is a much better thing than all the others which I possess. Can you then show us in what way you have taken care of the soul? For it is not likely that you, who are so wise a man and have a reputation in this city, inconsiderately and carelessly allow the most valuable thing that you possess to be neglected and to perish? Certainly not. But have you taken care of the soul yourself? And have you learned from another to do this? Or have you discovered the means yourself? Here comes the danger that in the first place he may say, What is this to you, my good man? Who are you? Next, if you persist in troubling him, there is danger that he may raise his hands and give you blows. I was once myself also an admirer of this mode of instruction, until I fell into these dangers. On Anxiety or Solicitude When I see a man anxious, I say, What does this man want? If he did not want something which is not in his power, how could he be anxious? For this reason a lute player, when he is singing by himself, has no anxiety. But when he enters the theater... He is anxious even if he has a good voice and plays well on the lute, for he not only wishes to sing well, but also to obtain applause. But this is not in his power. Accordingly, where he has skill, there he has confidence. Bring any single person who knows nothing of music, and the musician does not care for him. But in the matter where a man knows nothing and has not been practiced, there he is anxious. What matter is this? He knows not what a crowd is, or what the praise of a crowd is. However, he has learned to strike the lowest chord and the highest. But what the praise of the many is, and what power it has in life, he neither knows nor has he thought about it. Hence he must of necessity tremble and grow pale. I cannot then say that a man is not a lute player when I see him afraid, but I can say something else, and not one thing. 
but many. And first of all, I call him a stranger and say, this man does not know in what part of the world he is. But though he has been here so long, he is ignorant of the laws of the state and the customs, and what is permitted and what is not, and he has never employed any lawyer to tell him and to explain the laws. But a man does not write a will if he does not know how it ought to be written, or he employs a person who does know. Nor does he rashly seal a bond or write a security. But he uses his desire without a lawyer's advice, and aversion, and pursuit or movement, and attempt, and purpose. How do you mean without a lawyer? He does not know that he wills what is not allowed, and does not will that which is of necessity, and he does not know either what is his own or what is another man's. But if he did know, he would never be impeded, he would never be hindered, he would not be anxious. How so? Is any man then afraid about things which are not evils? No. Is he afraid about things which are evils, but still so far within his power that they may not happen? Certainly he is not. If then the things which are independent of the will are neither good nor bad, and all things which do depend on the will are within our power, and no man can either take them from us or give them to us if we do not choose, where is room left for anxiety? But we are anxious about our poor body, our little property, about the will of Caesar, but not anxious about things internal. Are we anxious about not forming a false opinion? No, for this is in my power. About not exerting our movements contrary to nature? No, not even about this. When then you see a man pale, as the physician says, judging from the complexion this man's spleen is disordered, that man's liver, so also say this man's desire and aversion are disordered. He is not in the right way. He is in a fever. For nothing else changes the color or causes trembling or chattering of the teeth or causes a man to sink in his knees and shift from foot to foot. For this reason, when Zeno was going to meet Antigonus, he was not anxious. For Antigonus had no power over any of the things which Zeno admired. And Zeno did not care for those things over which Antigonus had power. But Antigonus was anxious when he was going to meet Zeno, for he wished to please Zeno. But this was a thing external or out of his power. But Zeno did not want to please Antigonus, for no man who is skilled in any art wishes to please one who has no such skill. Should I try to please you? Why? I suppose you know the measure by which one man is estimated by another. Have you taken pains to learn what is a good man and what is a bad man, and how a man becomes one or the other? Why then, are you not good yourself? How, he replies, am I not good? Because no good man laments or groans or weeps. No good man is pale and trembles or says, How will he receive me? How will he listen to me? Slave, just as it pleases him. Why do you care about what belongs to others? Is it now his fault if he receives badly what proceeds from you? Certainly. And is it possible that a fault should be one man's and the evil in another? No. Why then are you anxious about that which belongs to others? Your question is reasonable, but I am anxious how I shall speak to him. Cannot you then speak to him as you choose? but I fear that I may be disconcerted. If you are going to write the name of Dion, are you afraid that you would be disconcerted? By no means. Why? Is it not because you have practiced writing the name? Certainly. Well, if you were going to read the name, would you not feel the same? And why? Because every art has a certain strength and confidence in the things which belong to it. Have you, then, not practiced speaking? And what else did you learn in the school? 
syllogisms and sophistical propositions? For what purpose? Was it not for the purpose of discoursing skillfully? And is not discoursing skillfully the same as discoursing seasonably and cautiously and with intelligence? And also without making mistakes and without hindrance, and besides all this, with confidence? Yes. When, then, you are mounted on a horse and go into a plane, are you anxious at being matched against a man who is on foot, and anxious in a matter in which you are practiced and he is not? Yes, but that person to whom I am going to speak has power to kill me. Speak the truth, then, unhappy man, and do not brag, nor claim to be a philosopher, nor refuse to acknowledge your masters, but so long as you present this handle in your body, follow every man who is stronger than yourself. Socrates used to practice speaking. He who talked as he did to the tyrants, to the diecasts or judges, he who talked in his prison. Diogenes had practiced speaking. He who spoke as he did to Alexander, to the pirates, to the person who bought him. These men were confident in the things which they practiced. But do you walk off to your own affairs and never leave them? Go and sit in a corner and weave syllogisms and propose them to another. There is not in you the man who can rule a state. To Nassau. When a certain Roman entered with his son and listened to one reading, Epictetus said, This is the method of instruction. And he stopped. When the Roman asked him to go on, Epictetus said, Every art, when it is taught, causes labor to him who is unacquainted with it and is unskilled in it. And indeed the things which proceed from the arts immediately show their use in the purpose for which they were made. And most of them, contains something attractive and pleasing. For indeed, to be present and to observe how a shoemaker learns is not a pleasant thing. But the shoe is useful and also not disagreeable to look at. And the discipline of a smith when he is learning is very disagreeable to one who chances to be present and is a stranger to the art. But the work shows the use of the art. But you will see this much more in music. For if you are present while a person is learning, the discipline will appear most disagreeable. And yet the results of music are pleasing and delightful to those who know nothing of music. And here we conceive the work of a philosopher to be something of this kind. He must adapt his wish to what is going on, so that neither any of the things which are taking place shall take place contrary to our wish, nor any of the things which do not take place shall not take place when we wish that they should. From this, the result is to those who have so arranged the work of philosophy, not to fail in the desire, nor to fall in with that which they would avoid, without uneasiness, without fear, without perturbation to pass through life themselves, together with their associates maintaining the relations both natural and acquired, as the relation of son of father, of brother, of citizen, of man, of wife, of neighbor, of fellow traveler, of ruler, of ruled. The work of a philosopher we conceive to be something like this. It remains next to inquire how this must be accomplished. We see, then, that the carpenter, when he has learned certain things, becomes a carpenter. The pilot, by learning certain things, becomes a pilot. May it not, then, in philosophy also not be sufficient to wish to be wise and good, and that there is also a necessity to learn certain things? We inquire, then, what these things are. The philosophers say that we ought first to learn that there is a God, and that He provides for all things. Also, that it is not possible to conceal from Him our acts, or even our intentions and thoughts. The next thing is to learn what is the nature of the gods, 
for such as they are discovered to be, he who would please and obey them, must try with all his power to be like them. If the divine is faithful, man also must be faithful. If it is free, man must also be free. If beneficent, man also must be beneficent. If magnanimous, man also must be magnanimous. As being then an imitator of God, he must do and say everything consistently with this fact. With what then must we begin? If you will enter on the discussion, I will tell you that you must first understand names or words. So then you say that I do not now understand names. You do not understand them. How then do I use them? Just as the illiterate use written language, as cattle use appearances. For use is one thing, understanding is another. But if you think that you understand them, produce whatever word you please, and let us try whether we understand it. But it is a disagreeable thing for a man to be confuted who is now old, and it may be has now served his three campaigns. I too know this, for now you are come to me as if you were in want of nothing. And what could you even imagine to be wanting in you? You are rich. You have children and a wife, perhaps, and many slaves. Caesar knows you. In Rome you have many friends. You render their dues to all, you know how to requite him who does you a favor and to repay in the same kind him who does you a wrong. What do you lack? If then I shall show you that you lack the things most necessary and the chief things for happiness, and that hitherto you have looked after everything rather than what you ought, and to crown all, that you neither know what God is nor what man is, nor what is good, nor what is bad. And as to what I have said about your ignorance of other matters, that may perhaps be endured. But if I say that you know nothing about yourself, how is it possible that you should endure me and bear the proof and stay here? It is not possible, but you immediately go off in bad humor. And yet what harm have I done you? Unless the mirror also injures the ugly man because it shows him to himself such as he is. Unless the physician also is supposed to insult the sick man when he says to him, Man, do you think that you ail nothing? But you have a fever. Go without food today. Drink water. And no one says, What an insult! But if you say to a man, Your desires are inflamed, your aversions are low, your intentions are inconsistent, your pursuits or movements are not conformable to nature, your opinions are rash and false. The man immediately goes away and says, He has insulted me. Our way of dealing is like that of a crowded assembly. Beasts are brought to be sold, and oxen, and the greater part of the men come to buy and sell. And there are some few who come to look at the market and to inquire how it is carried on, and why, and who fixes the meeting, and for what purpose. So it is here also in this assembly of life. Some, like cattle, trouble themselves about nothing except their fodder. For to all of you who are busy about possessions and lands and slaves and magisterial offices, these are nothing except fodder. But there are a few who attend the assembly, men who love to look on and consider what is the world, who governs it. Has it no governor? And how is it possible that a city or a family cannot continue to exist not even the shortest time without an administrator and guardian. And that so great and beautiful a system should be administered with such order, and yet without a purpose, and by chance. There is then an administrator. 
What kind of administrator and how does he govern? And who are we, who were produced by him, and for what purpose? Have we some connection with him, and some relation toward him? Or none? This is the way in which these few are affected. And then they apply themselves only to this one thing, to examine the meeting, and then to go away. What then? They are ridiculed by the many, as the spectators at the fair are by the traitors. And if the beasts had any understanding, they would ridicule those who admired anything else than fodder. To or against those who obstinately persist in what they have determined. When some persons have heard these words, that a man ought to be constant or firm, and that the will is naturally free and not subject to compulsion, but that all other things are subject to hindrance, to slavery, and are in the power of others, they suppose that they ought, without deviation, to abide by everything which they have determined. But, in the first place, that which has been determined ought to be sound or true. I require tone or sinews in the body, but such as exists in a healthy body, in an athletic body. But if it is plain to me that you have the tone of a frenzied man, and you boast of it, I shall say to you, Man, seek the physician. This is not tone, but atony, or deficiency in right tone. In a different way, something of the same kind is felt by those who listen to these discourses in a wrong manner, which was the case with one of my companions, who for no reason resolved to starve himself to death. I heard of it when it was the third day of his abstinence from food, and I went to inquire what had happened. I have resolved, he said, but still tell me what it was which induced you to resolve. For if you have resolved rightly, we shall sit with you and assist you to depart. But if you have made an unreasonable resolution, change your mind. We ought to keep our determinations. What are you doing, man? We ought to keep not to all our determinations, but to those which are right. For if you are now persuaded that it is night, do not change your mind if you think fit, but persist and say, We ought to abide by our determinations. Will you not make the beginning and lay the foundation in an inquiry whether the determination is sound or not sound? And so then build on it firmness and security. But if you lay a rotten and ruinous foundation, will not your miserable little building fall down the sooner? The more and the stronger are the materials which you shall lay on it. Without any reason, would you withdraw from us out of life a man who is a friend and a companion? A citizen of the same city, both the great and the small city. Then while you are committing murder and destroying a man who has done no wrong, do you say that you ought to abide by your determinations? And if it ever in any way came into your head to kill me, ought you to abide by your determinations? Now this man was with difficulty persuaded to change his mind. But it is impossible to convince some persons at present, so that I seem now to know, what I did not know before, the meaning of the common saying, that you can neither persuade nor break a fool. May it never be my lot to have a wise fool for my friend. Nothing is more untractable. I am determined, the man says. Madmen are also. But the more firmly they form a judgment on things which do not exist, the more elibor they require. Will you not act like a sick man and call in the physician? I am sick, master. Help me. Consider what I must do. It is my duty to obey you. So it is here also. I know not what I ought to do, but I am come to learn. 
Not so. But speak to me about other things. Upon this I have determined. What other things? For what is greater and more useful than for you to be persuaded that it is not sufficient to have made your determination and not to change it? This is the tone or energy of madness, not of health. I will die if you compel me to this. Why, man? What has happened? I have determined. I have had a lucky escape that you have not determined to kill me. I take no money. Why? I have determined. Be assured that with the very tone or energy which you now use in refusing to take, there is nothing to hinder you at some time from inclining without reason to take money and then saying, I have determined. As in a distempered body, subject to defluxions, the humor inclines sometimes to these parts and then to those. So too a sickly soul knows not which way to incline. But if to this inclination and movement there is added a tone or obstinate resolution, then the evil becomes past help and cure. That we do not strive to use our opinions about good and evil. Where is the good? In the will. Where is the evil? In the will. Where is neither of them? In those things which are independent of the will. Well then, does anyone among us think of these lessons out of the schools? Does anyone meditate or strive by himself to give an answer to things as in the case of questions? Is it day? Yes. Is it night? No. Well, is the number of stars even? I cannot say. When money is shown or offered to you, have you studied to make the proper answer, that money is not a good thing? Have you practiced yourself in these answers, or only against sophisms? Why do you wonder, then, if, in the cases which you have studied, in those you have improved, but in those which you have not studied, in those you remain the same. When the rhetorician knows that he has written well, that he has committed to memory what he has written, and brings an agreeable voice, why is he still anxious? Because he is not satisfied with having studied. What then does he want? To be praised by the audience? For the purpose then of being able to practice declamation, he has been disciplined. But with respect to praise and blame, he has not been disciplined. For when did he hear from anyone what praise is? What blame is? What the nature of each is? What kind of praise should be sought? Or what kind of blame should be shunned? And when did he practice this discipline which follows these words or things? Why then do you still wonder? If in the matters which a man has learned, there he surpasses others, and in those in which he has not been disciplined, there he is the same with the many. So the lute player knows how to play, sings well, has a fine dress, and yet he trembles when he enters on the stage. For these matters he understands, but he does not know what a crowd is, nor the shouts of a crowd, nor what ridicule is. Neither does he know what anxiety is, whether it is our work or the work of another, whether it is possible to stop it or not. For this reason, if he has been praised, he leaves the theater puffed up. But if he has been ridiculed, the swollen bladder has been punctured and subsides. This is the case also with ourselves. What do we admire? Externals. About what things are we busy? Externals. And have we any doubt, then, why we fear or why we are anxious? What then happens when we think the things which are coming on us to be evils? 
It is not in our power not to be afraid. It is not in our power not to be anxious. Then we say, Lord God, how shall I not be anxious? Fool, have you not hands? Did not God make them for you? Sit down now and pray that your nose may not run. Wipe yourself, rather, and do not blame him. Well then, has he given to you nothing in the present case? Has he not given to you endurance? Has he not given to you magnanimity? Has he not given to you manliness? When you have such hands, do you still look for one who shall wipe your nose? But we neither study these things nor care for them. Give me a man who cares how he shall do anything, not for the obtaining of a thing, but who cares about his own energy. What man, when he is walking about, cares for his own energy? Who, when he is deliberating, cares about his own deliberation, and not about obtaining that about which he deliberates? And if he succeeds, he is elated and says, How well we have deliberated! Did I not tell you, brother, that it is impossible when we have thought about anything, that it should not turn out thus? But if the thing should turn out otherwise, the wretched man is humbled. He knows not even what to say about what has taken place. Who among us, for the sake of this matter, has consulted a seer? Who among us, as to his actions, has not slept in indifference? Who? Give a name to me, one that I may see, the man whom I have long been looking for, who is truly noble and ingenuous, whether young or old. Name him. Why then are we still surprised? If we are well practiced in thinking about matters, any given subject, but in our acts are low, without decency, worthless, cowardly, impatient of labor, altogether bad. For we do not care about these things, nor do we study them. But if we had feared not death or banishment, but fear itself, we should have studied not to fall into those things which appear to us evils. Now in the school we are irritable and wordy, and if any little question arises about any of these things, we are able to examine them fully. But drag us to practice, and you will find us miserably shipwrecked. Let some disturbing appearance come on us, and you will know what we have been studying and in what we have been exercising ourselves. Consequently, through want of discipline, we are always adding something to the appearance and representing things to be greater than what they are. For instance, as to myself, when I am on a voyage and look down on the deep sea, or look round on it and see no land, I am out of my mind and imagine that I must drink up all this water if I am wrecked. And it does not occur to me that three pints are enough. What then disturbs me? The sea? No, but my opinion. Again, when an earthquake shall happen, I imagine that the city is going to fall on me. But is not one little stone enough to knock my brains out? What then are the things which are heavy on us and disturb us? What else than opinions? What else than opinions lie heavy upon him who goes away and leaves his companions and friends and places and habits of life? Now, little children, for instance, when they cry on the nurse leaving them for a short time, forget their sorrow if they receive a small cake. Do you choose, then, that we should compare you to little children? No, by Zeus, for I do not wish to be pacified by a small cake, but by right opinions. And what are these? Such as a man ought to study all day, and not to be affected by anything that is not his own, neither by companion, nor place, nor gymnasia, and not even by his own body. 
but to remember the law and to have it before his eyes. And what is the divine law? To keep a man's own, not to claim that which belongs to others, but to use what is given, and when it is not given, not to desire it, and when a thing is taken away, to give it up readily and immediately, and to be thankful for the time that a man has had the use of it, if you would not cry for your nurse and mamma. For what matter does it make by what thing a man is subdued, and on what he depends? In what respect are you better than he who cries for a girl? If you grieve for a little gymnasium, and little porticos, and young men, and such places of amusement. Another comes and laments that he shall no longer drink the water of Derchi. Is the Martian water worse than that of Derchi? But I was used to the water of Derchi, and you in turn will be used to the other. Then if you become attached to this also, cry for this too, and try to make a verse like the verse of Euripides the hot baths of Nero, and the Marcion water. See how tragedy is made when common things happen to silly men. When then shall I see Athens again, and the Acropolis? Wretch, are you not content with what you see daily? Have you anything better or greater to see than the sun, the moon, the stars, the whole earth? the sea. But if indeed you comprehend him who administers the whole, and carry him about in yourself, do you still desire small stones and a beautiful rock? When then are you going to leave the sun itself and the moon? What will you do? Will you sit and weep like children? Well, what have you been doing in the school? What did you hear? What did you learn? Why did you write yourself a philosopher when you might have written the truth as, quote, I made certain introductions, and I read Chrysippus, but I did not even approach the door of a philosopher, end quote. For how should I possess anything of the kind which Socrates possessed, who died as he did, who lived as he did, or anything such as Diogenes possessed? Do you think that any one of such men wept or grieved because he was not going to see a certain man or a certain woman, nor to be in Athens or in Corinth, but if it should so happen, in Susa or in Ecbatana? For if a man can quit the banquet when he chooses and no longer amuse himself, does he still stay and complain? And does he not stay as at any amusement only so long as he is pleased? Such a man, I suppose, would endure perpetual exile, or to be condemned to death. Will you not be weaned now like children, and take more solid food, and not cry after mamas and nurses, which are the lamentations of old women? But if I go away, I shall cause them sorrow. You cause them sorrow? By no means, but that will cause them sorrow, which also causes you sorrow. Opinion. What have you to do then? Take away your own opinion, and if these women are wise, they will take away their own. If they do not, they will lament through their own fault. My man, as the proverb says, make a desperate effort on behalf of tranquility of mind, freedom, and magnanimity. Lift up your head at last as released from slavery. Dare to look up to God and say, Deal with me for the future as thou wilt. I am of the same mind as thou art. I am thine. I refuse nothing that pleases thee. Lead me where thou wilt. Clothe me in any dress thou choosest. It is thy will that I should hold the office of a magistrate, that I should be in the condition of a private man, stay here or be an exile, be poor, be rich. I will make thy defense to men in behalf of all these conditions. 
I will show the nature of each thing what it is. You will not do so, but sit in an ox's belly and wait for your mama till she has fed you. Who would Hercules have been if he had sat at home? He would have been Eurythius and not Hercules. Well, and in his travels through the world, how many inmates and how many friends had he? But nothing more dear to him than God. For this reason it was believed that he was the Son of God. And he was. In obedience to God, then, he went about purging away injustice and lawlessness. But you are not Hercules, and you are not able to purge away the wickedness of others. Nor yet are you, Theseus, able to purge away the evil things of Attica, clear away your own. From yourself, from your thoughts, cast away instead of Procrustes and Chiron, sadness, fear, desire, envy, malevolence, avarice, effeminacy, intemperance. But it is not possible to eject these things otherwise than by looking to God only, by fixing your affections on Him only, by being consecrated to His commands. But if you choose anything else, you will with sighs and groans be compelled to follow what is stronger than yourself, always seeking tranquility and never able to find it. For you seek tranquility there where it is not, and you neglect to seek it where it is. How we must adapt preconceptions to particular cases. What is the first business of him who philosophizes? To throw away self-conceit. For it is impossible for a man to begin to learn that which he thinks that he knows. As to things, then, which ought to be done and ought not to be done, and good and bad, and beautiful and ugly, all of us talking of them at random go to the philosophers, and on these matters we praise, we censure, we accuse, we blame, we judge, and determine about principles honorable and dishonorable. But why do we go to the philosophers? Because we wish to learn what we do not think that we know. And what is this? Theorems. For we wish to learn what philosophers say as being something elegant and acute. And some wish to learn that they may get profit from what they learn. It is ridiculous, then, to think that a person wishes to learn one thing and will learn another. Or further that a man will make proficiency in that which he does not learn. But the many are deceived by this, which deceived also the rhetorician Theopompus, when he blames even Plato for wishing everything to be defined. For what does he say? Did none of us before you use the words good or just? Or do we utter the sounds in an unmeaning and empty way, without understanding what they severally signify? Now who tells you, Theopompus, that we had not natural notions of each of these things and preconceptions? But it is not possible to adapt preconceptions to their corresponding objects, if we have not distinguished or analyzed them, and inquired what object must be subjected to each preconception. You may make the same charge against physicians also. For who among us did not use the words healthy and unhealthy before Hippocrates lived? Or did we utter these words as empty sounds? For we have also a certain preconception of health, but we are not able to adapt it. For this reason one says, abstain from food, another says, give food, another says, bleed, and another says, use cupping. What is the reason? Is it any other than that a man cannot properly adapt the preconception of health to particulars? So it is in this matter also, in the things which concern life. Who among us does not speak of good and bad, of useful and not useful? For who among us has not a preconception of each of these things? Is it then a distinct and perfect preconception? 
Show this. How shall I show this? Adapt the preconception properly to the particular things. Plato, for instance, subjects definitions to the preconceptions of the useful, but you to the preconception of the useless. Is it possible, then, that both of you are right? How is it possible? Does not one man adapt the preconception of good to the matter of wealth, and another not to wealth, but to the matter of pleasure, and to that of health? For generally, if all of us who use those words know sufficiently each of them, and need no diligence in resolving or making distinct the notions of the preconceptions, why do we differ? Why do we quarrel? Why do we blame one another? And why do I now allege this contention with one another and speak of it? If you yourself properly adapt your preconceptions, why are you unhappy? Why are you hindered? Let us omit at present the second topic about the pursuits and the study of the duties which relate to them. Let us omit also the third topic, which relates to the ascents. I give up to you these two topics. Let us insist upon the first, which presents an almost obvious demonstration that we do not properly adapt the preconceptions. Do you now desire that which is possible and that which is possible to you? Why then are you hindered? Why are you unhappy? Do you not now try to avoid the unavoidable? Why then do you fall in with anything which you would avoid? Why are you unfortunate? Why, when you desire a thing, does it not happen, and when you do not desire it, does it happen? For this is the greatest proof of unhappiness and misery. I wish for something, and it does not happen. And what is more wretched than I? It was because she could not endure this that Medea came to murder her children. An act of a noble spirit in this view at least, for she had a just opinion what it is for a thing not to succeed, which a person wishes. Then she says, Thus I shall be avenged on him, my husband, who has wronged and insulted me, and what shall I gain if he is punished thus? How then shall it be done? I shall kill my children." but I shall punish myself also. And what do I care? This is the aberration of soul which possesses great energy. For she did not know wherein lies the doing of that which we wish, that you cannot get this from without, nor yet by the alteration and new adaptation of things. Do not desire the man, or Jason, Medea's husband, and nothing which you desire will fail to happen. Do not obstinately desire that he shall live with you. Do not desire to remain in Garinth, and in a word desire nothing than that which God wills. And who shall hinder you? Who shall compel you? No man shall compel you any more than he shall compel Zeus. When you have such a guide, and your wishes and desires are the same as his, why do you still fear disappointment? Give up your desire to wealth and your aversion to poverty, and you will be disappointed in the one, you will fall into the other. Well, give them up to health, and you will be unfortunate. Give them up to magistracies, honors, country, friends, children. In a word, to any of the things which are not in man's power, and you will be unfortunate. But give them up to Zeus and to the rest of the gods, Surrender them to the gods, let the gods govern, let your desire and aversion be ranged on the side of the gods, and wherein will you be any longer unhappy. But if, lazy wretch, you envy and complain and are jealous and fear, and never cease for a single day complaining both of yourself and of the gods, why do you still speak of being educated? What kind of an education, man? Do you mean that you have been employed about sophistical syllogisms? Will you not, if it is possible, unlearn all these things and begin from the beginning? 
and see at the same time that hitherto you have not even touched the matter. And then commencing from this foundation, will you not build up all that comes after, so that nothing may happen which you do not choose, and nothing shall fail to happen which you do choose? Give me one young man who has come to the school with this intention, who has become a champion for this matter, and says, I give up everything else, and it is enough for me if it shall ever be in my power to pass my life free from hindrance and free from trouble, and to stretch out or present my neck to all things like a free man, and to look up to heaven as a friend of God and fear nothing that can happen. Let any of you point out such a man that I may say, Come, young man, into the possession of that which is your own, for it is your destiny to adorn philosophy. Yours are these possessions, yours these books, yours these discourses. Then, when he shall have labored sufficiently and exercised himself in this part of the matter, let him come to me again and say, I desire to be free from passion and free from perturbation, and I wish as a pious man and a philosopher and a diligent person to know what is my duty to the gods, what to my parents, what to my brothers, what to my country, what to strangers. I say, come also to the second matter. This also is yours. But I have now sufficiently studied the second part also, and I would gladly be secure and unshaken, and not only when I am awake, but also when I am asleep." and when I am filled with wine, and when I am melancholy. Man, you are a god. You have great designs. No, but I wish to understand what Chrysippus says in his treatise on the Pseudomenos, the liar. Will you not hang yourself, wretch, with such your intention? And what good will it do you? You will read the whole with sorrow, and you will speak to others trembling. Thus you also do. Do you wish me, brother, to read to you and you to me? You write excellently, my man, and you also excellently in the style of Xenophon, and you in the style of Plato, and you in the style of Anisthenes. Then, having told your dreams to one another, you return to the same things— your desires are the same, your aversions the same, your pursuits are the same, and your designs and purposes you wish for the same things and work for the same. In the next place, you do not even seek for one to give you advice, but you are vexed if you hear such things as I say. Then you say, An ill-natured old fellow, when I was going away, he did not weep, nor did he say, Into what danger are you going? If you come off safe, my child, I will burn lights. This is what a good-natured man would do. It will be a great thing for you if you do return safe, and it will be worth while to burn lights for such a person, for you ought to be immortal and exempt from disease. Casting away, then, as I say, this conceit of thinking that we know something useful— we must come to philosophy as we apply to geometry and to music. But if we do not, we shall not even approach to proficiency though we read all the collections and commentaries of Chrysippus and those of Antipater and Archidemus. How We Should Struggle Against Appearances Every habit and faculty is maintained and increased by the corresponding actions. The habit of walking by walking. The habit of running by running. If you would be a good reader, read. If a writer, write. But when you shall not have read for thirty days in succession, but have done something else, you will know the consequence. In the same way, if you shall have lain down ten days, get up and attempt to make a long walk, and you will see how your legs are weakened. 
Generally, then, if you would make anything a habit, do it. If you would not make it a habit, do not do it, but accustom yourself to do something else in place of it. So it is with respect to the affections of the soul. When you have been angry, you must know that not only has this evil befallen you, but that you have also increased the habit, and, in a manner, thrown fuel upon fire. When you have been overcome in sexual intercourse with a person, do not reckon this single defeat only, but reckon that you have also nurtured, increased your incontinence. For it is impossible for habits and faculties, some of them not to be produced, when they did not exist before, and others not to be increased and strengthened by corresponding acts. In this manner, certainly, as philosophers say, also diseases of the mind grow up. For when you have once desired money, if reason be applied to lead to a perception of the evil, the desire is stopped, and the ruling faculty of our mind is restored to the original authority. But if you apply no means of cure, it no longer returns to the same state, but being again excited by the corresponding appearance, it is inflamed to desire quicker than before. And when this takes place continually, it is henceforth hardened or made callous, and the disease of the mind confirms the love of money. For he who has had a fever and has been relieved from it is not in the same state that he was before, unless he has been completely cured. Something of the kind happens also in diseases of the soul. Certain traces and blisters are left in it, and unless a man shall completely efface them, when he is again lashed on the same places, the lash will produce not blisters or wheels, but sores. If then you wish not to be of an angry temper, do not feed the habit. Throw nothing on it which will increase it. At first keep quiet and count the days on which you have not been angry. I used to be in a passion every day, now every second day, then every third, then every fourth. But if you have intermitted thirty days, make a sacrifice to God. For the habit at first begins to be weakened and then is completely destroyed. I have not been vexed today, nor the day after, nor yet on any succeeding day during two or three months, but I took care when some exciting things happened. Be assured that you are in a good way. Today, when I saw a handsome person, I did not say to myself, I wish I could lie with her, and happy is her husband, for he who says this, happy is her adulterer also. Nor do I picture the rest to my mind, the woman present and stripping herself and lying down by my side. I stroke my head and say, Well done, Epictetus. You have solved a fine little sophism, much finer than that which is called the master sophism. And if even the woman is willing and gives signs and sends messages, and if she also fondle me and come close to me, and I should abstain and be victorious, that would be a sophism beyond that which is named the liar and the quiescent. Over such a victory as this, a man may justly be proud, not for proposing the master sophism. How then shall this be done? Be willing at length to be approved by yourself. Be willing to appear beautiful to God. Desire to be in purity with your own pure self and with God. Then, when any such appearance visits, Plato says, Have recourse to expiations. Go a suppliant to the temples of the averting deities. It is even sufficient if you resort to the society of noble and just men and compare yourself with them, whether you find one who is living or dead. Go to Socrates and see him lying down with Alcibiades and mocking his beauty. Consider what a victory he at last found that he gained over himself. What an Olympian victory! In what number he stood from Hercules, so that by the gods one may justly salute him. Hail, wondrous man! You who have conquered not these sorry boxers and pancreatists, 
nor yet those who are like them, the gladiators. By placing these objects on the other side, you will conquer the appearance. You will not be drawn away by it. But in the first place, be not hurried away by the rapidity of the appearance, but say, Appearances, wait for me a little. Let me see who you are and what you are about. Let me put you to the test. And then do not allow the appearance to lead you on and draw lively pictures of the things which will follow. For if you do, it will carry you off wherever it pleases. But rather bring in to oppose it some other beautiful and noble appearance and cast out this base appearance. And if you are accustomed to be exercised in this way, you will see what shoulders, what sinews, what strength you have. But now it is only trifling words and nothing more. This is the true athlete the man who exercises himself against such appearances. Stay, wretch. Do not be carried away. Great is the combat, divine is the work. It is for kingship, for freedom, for happiness, for freedom from perturbation. Remember God. Call on him as a helper and protector, as men at sea call on Diaskar in a storm. For what is a greater storm? than that which comes from appearances which are violent and drive away the reason. For the storm itself, what else is it but an appearance? For take away the fear of death, and suppose as many thunders and lightnings as you please, and you will know what calm and serenity there is in the ruling faculty. But if you have once been defeated, and say that you will conquer hereafter, and then say the same again, Be assured that you will at last be in so wretched a condition and so weak that you will not even know afterwards that you are doing wrong, but you will even begin to make apologies or defenses for your wrongdoing. And then you will confirm the saying of Hesiod to be true. With constant ills, the dilatory strives. against those who embrace philosophical opinions only in words. The argument, called the ruling argument, appears to have been proposed from such principles as these. There is, in fact, a common contradiction between one another in these three propositions, each two being the contradiction to the third. The propositions are that everything past must of necessity be true, that an impossibility does not follow a possibility, and that a thing is possible which neither is nor will be true. Diodorus, observing this contradiction, employed the probative force of the first two for the demonstration of this proposition, that nothing is possible which is not true and never will be. Now another will hold these two, that something is possible which is neither true nor ever will be, and that an impossibility does not follow a possibility. But he will not allow that everything which is past is necessarily true, as the followers of Cleanthes seem to think, and Antipater copiously defended them. But others maintain the other two propositions, that a thing is possible which is neither true nor will be true, and that everything which is past is necessarily true but then they will maintain that an impossibility can follow a possibility. But it is impossible to maintain these three propositions because of their common contradiction. If then any man should ask me, which of these propositions do you maintain? I will answer him that I do not know. But I have received this story, that Diodorus maintained one opinion. The followers of Panthoides, I think, and Cleanthes maintained another opinion, and those of Chrysippus a third. What, then, is your opinion? I was not made for this purpose, to examine the appearances that occur to me, and to compare what others say, and to form an opinion of my own on the thing. Therefore, I differ not at all from the grammarian. Who was Hector's father? Priam. Who were his brothers? Alexander and Dephobus. 
who was their mother, Hecuba. I have heard this story. From whom? From Homer. And Hellenicus also, I think, writes about the same things, and perhaps others like him. And what further have I about the ruling argument? Nothing. But if I am a vain man, especially at a banquet, I surprise the guests by enumerating those who have written on these matters. Both Chrysippus has written wonderfully in his first book about possibilities, and Cleanthes has written specially on the subject, and Archidemus. Antipater also has written not only in his work about possibilities, but also separately in his work on the ruling argument. Have you not read the work? I have not read it. Read. And what profit will a man have from it? He will be more trifling and impertinent than he is now. For what else have you gained by reading it? What opinion have you formed on this subject? None. But you will tell us of Helen and Priam, and the island of Calypso, which never was and never will be. And in this matter, indeed, it is of no great importance if you retain the story. But I formed no opinion of your own. But in matters of morality or ethic, this happens to us much more than in these things of which we are speaking. Speak to me about good and evil. Listen. The wind from Ilium and Caconian shores brought me. Odyssey, section 939. Of things some are good, some are bad, and others are indifferent. The good then are the virtues, and the things which partake of the virtues. The bad are the vices, and the things which partake of them. And the indifferent are the things which lie between the virtues and the vices. Wealth, health, life, death, pleasure, pain. Whence do you know this? Hellanicus says it in his Egyptian history. For what difference does it make to say this, or to say that Diogenes has it in his ethic, or Chrysippus, or Cleanthes? Have you then examined any of these things and formed an opinion of your own? Show how you are used to behave in a storm on shipboard. Do you remember this division or distinction of things, when the sail rattles and a man who knows nothing of times and seasons stands by you when you are screaming and says, Tell me, I ask you by the gods, what you were saying just now. Is it a vice to suffer shipwreck? Does it participate in vice? Will you not take up a stick and lay it on his head? What have we to do with you, man? We are perishing, and you come to mock us? But if Caesar send for you to answer a charge, do you remember the distinction? If when you are going in pale and trembling, a person should come up to you and say, Why do you tremble, man? What is the matter about which you are engaged? Does Caesar who sits within give virtue and vice to those who go in to him? You reply, Why do you also mock me and add to my present sorrows? Still tell me, philosopher, tell me why you tremble. Is it not death of which you run the risk, or a prison, or pain of the body, or banishment, or disgrace? What else is there? Is there any vice or anything which partakes of vice? What then did you use to say of these things? What have you to do with me, man? My own evils are enough for me. And you say right. Your own evils are enough for you. Your baseness, your cowardice, your boasting which you showed when you sat in the school. Why did you decorate yourself with what belonged to others? Why did you call yourself a stoic? Observe yourselves thus in your actions, and you will find to what sect you belong. You will find that most of you are Epicureans, a few peripatetics, and those feeble. For wherein will you show that you really consider virtue equal to everything else, or even superior? But show me a Stoic if you can. Where or how? but you can show me an endless number who utter small arguments of the Stoics. 
for do the same persons repeat the Epicurean opinions any worse? And the peripatetic, do they not handle them also with equal accuracy? Who then is a Stoic? As we call a statue, Phidiac, which is fashioned according to the art of Phidias. Show me a man who is fashioned according to the doctrines which he utters. Show me a man who is sick and happy, in danger and happy, dying and happy, in exile and happy, in disgrace and happy. Show him. I desire by the gods to see a stoic. You cannot show me one fashioned so. But show me at least one who is forming, who has shown a tendency to be a stoic. Do me this favor. Do not grudge an old man seeing a sight which I have not yet seen. Do you think that you must show me the Zeus of Phidias, or the Athena, a work of ivory and gold? Let any of you show me a human soul ready to think as God does, and not to blame either God or man, ready not to be disappointed about anything, not to consider himself damaged by anything, not to be angry, not to be envious, not to be jealous. And why should I not say it direct? Desirous from a man to become a god, and in this poor mortal body thinking of his fellowship with Zeus. Show me the man. But you cannot. Why then do you delude yourselves and cheat others? And why do you put on a guise which does not belong to you? and walk about being thieves and pilferers of these names and things which do not belong to you. And now I am your teacher, and you are instructed in my school. And I have this purpose, to make you free from restraint, compulsion, hindrance, to make you free, prosperous, happy, looking to God in everything small and great. And you are here to learn and practice these things. Why then do you not finish the work, if you also have such a purpose as you ought to have? And if I, in addition to the purpose, also have such qualification as I ought to have? What is that which is wanting? When I see an artificer and material lying by him, I expect the work. Here then is the artificer, Hear the material. What is it that we want? Is not the thing one that can be taught? It is. Is it not then in our power? The only thing of all that is in our power. Neither wealth is in our power, nor health, nor reputation, nor in a word anything else except the right use of appearances. This right use is by nature free from restraint. This alone is free from impediment. Why then do you not finish the work? Tell me the reason. For it is either through my fault that you do not finish it, or through your own fault, or through the nature of the thing. The thing itself is possible, and the only thing in our power. It remains then that the fault is either in me or in you, or what is nearer the truth, in both. Well then, are you willing that we begin at last to bring such a purpose into this school and to take no notice of the past? Let us only make a beginning. Trust to me and you will see. Against the Epicureans and Academics The propositions which are true and evident are of necessity used even by those who contradict them. And a man might perhaps consider it to be the greatest proof of a thing being evident, that it is found to be necessary even for him who denies it to make use of it at the same time. For instance, 
If a man should deny that there is anything universally true, it is plain that he must make the contradictory negation that nothing is universally true. What, wretch, do you not even admit this? For what else is this than to affirm that whatever is universally affirmed is false? Again, if a man should come forward and say, Know that there is nothing that can be known, but all things are incapable of sure evidence. Or if another say, Believe me and you will be the better for it, that a man ought not to believe anything. Or again, if another should say, Learn from me, man, that it is possible to learn anything. I tell you this, and will teach you if you choose. Now in what respect do these differ from those? Whom shall I name? Those who call themselves academics. Quote, Men agree with us that no man agrees with another. Believe us that no man believes anybody. End quote. Thus Epicurus also, when he designs to destroy the natural fellowship of mankind, at the same time makes use of that which he destroys. For what does he say? Quote, Be not deceived, men, nor be led astray, nor be mistaken. There is no natural fellowship among rational animals, believe me. But those who say otherwise deceive you and seduce you by false reasons. End quote. What is this to you? Permit us to be deceived. Will you fare worse, if all the rest of us are persuaded that there is a natural fellowship among us, and that it ought by all means to be preserved? Nay, it will be much better and safer for you. Man, why do you trouble yourself about us? Why do you keep awake for us? Why do you light your lamp? Why do you rise early? Why do you write so many books that no one of us may be deceived about the gods and believe that they take care of men, or that no one may suppose the nature of good to be other than pleasure? For if this is so, lie down and sleep and lead the life of a worm of which you judged yourself worthy. Eat and drink and enjoy women and ease yourself and snore. And what is it to you how the rest shall think about these things, whether right or wrong? For what have we to do with you? You take care of sheep because they supply us with wool and milk, and last of all with their flesh. Would it not be a desirable thing if men could be lulled and enchanted by the Stoics, and sleep and present themselves to you and to those like you, to be shorn and milked? For this you ought to say to your brother, Epicureans. But ought you not to conceal it from others, and particularly before everything to persuade them that we are by nature adapted for fellowship, that temperance is a good thing, in order that all things may be secured for you? Or ought we to maintain this fellowship with some, and not with others? With whom then ought we to maintain it? with such as on their part also maintain it, or with such as violate this fellowship? And who violate it more than you who establish such doctrines? What then was it that waked Epicurus from his sleepiness and compelled him to write what he did write? What else was it then? That which is the strongest thing in men, nature, which draws a man to her own will though he be unwilling and complaining. For since, she says, you think that there is no community among mankind, write this opinion and leave it for others, and break your sleep to do this, and by your own practice condemn your own opinions. Shall we then say that Orestes was agitated by the Erinys or Furies, and roused from his deep sleep, and did not more savage Erinys and pains rouse Epicurus from his sleep, and not allow him to rest, but compelled him to make known his own evils, as madness and wine did the galley, or priests of Sibylla. So strong and invincible is man's nature, for how can a vine be moved not in the manner of a vine, 
but in the manner of an olive tree. Or on the other hand, how can an olive tree be moved not in the manner of an olive tree, but in the manner of a vine? It is impossible. It cannot be conceived. Neither then is it possible for a man completely to lose the movements or affects of a man. And even those who are deprived of their genital members are not able to deprive themselves of man's desires. Thus Epicurus also mutilated all the offices of a man, and of a father of a family, and of a citizen and of a friend. But he did not mutilate human desires, for he could not. Not more than the lazy academics can cast away or blind their own senses, though they have tried with all their might to do it. What a shame is this, when a man has received from nature measures and rules for the knowing of truth, and does not strive to add these measures and rules and to improve them, but just the contrary, endeavors to take away and destroy whatever enables us to discern the truth. What say you, philosopher? Piety and sanctity? What do you think that they are? If you like, I will demonstrate that they are good things. Well, demonstrate it that our citizens may be turned and honor the deity, and may no longer be negligent about things of the highest value. Have you then the demonstrations? I have, and I am thankful. Since then you are pleased with them, hear the contrary, that there are no gods, and if there are, they take no care of men, nor is there any fellowship between us and them, and that this piety and sanctity which is talked of among most men is the lying of boasters and sophists, or certainly of legislators for the purpose of terrifying and checking wrongdoers. Well done, philosopher. You have done something for our citizens. You have brought back all the young men to contempt of things divine. Well then, does not this satisfy you? Learn now that justice is nothing, that modesty is folly, that a father is nothing, a son nothing. Well done, philosopher. Persist. Persuade the young men that we may have more with the same opinions as you and who say the same as you. From such principles as these have grown our well-constituted states. By these was Sparta founded. Like Hercus fixed these opinions in the Spartans by his laws and education. That neither is the servile condition more base than honorable, nor the condition of free men more honorable than base. And that those who died at Thermopylae died from these opinions. And through what other opinions did the Athenians leave their city? Then those who talk thus, marry and beget children, and employ themselves in public affairs, and make themselves priests and interpreters. Of whom? Of gods who do not exist. And they consult the Pythian priestess, that they may hear lies, and they report the oracles to others, monstrous impudence and imposture. Man, what are you doing? Are you refuting yourself every day? And will you not give up these frigid attempts? When you eat, where do you carry your hand to? To your mouth or to your eye? When you wash yourself, what do you go into? Do you ever call a pot a dish or a ladle a spit? If I were a slave of any of these men, even if I must be flayed by him daily, I would rack him. If he said... Boy, throw some olive oil into the bath. I would take pickle sauce and pour it down on his head. What is this? he would say. An appearance was presented to me. I swear by your genius, which could not be distinguished from oil and was exactly like it. Here, give me the barley drink, or to sane, he says. I would fill it and carry him a dish of sharp sauce. Did I not ask for the barley drink? Yes, mister, this is the barley drink. Take it and smell. Take it and taste. How do you know, then, if our senses deceive us? If I had three or four fellow slaves of the same opinion, 
I should force him to hang himself through passion, or to change his mind. But now they mock us by using all the things which nature gives, and in words destroying them. Grateful indeed are men and modest, who, if they do nothing else, are daily eating bread, and yet are shameless enough to say, We do not know if there is a Demeter, or her daughter Persephone, or a Pluto, not to mention that they are enjoying the night and the day, the seasons of the year, and the stars, and the sea, and the land, and the cooperation of mankind. And yet they are not moved in any degree by these things, to turn their attention to them. But they only seek to belch out their little problem or matter for discussion. And when they have exercised their stomach to go off to the bath, but what they shall say, and about what things or to what persons, and what their hearers shall learn from this talk, they care not even in the least degree. Nor do they care if any generous youth after hearing such talk should suffer any harm from it. Nor after he has suffered harm should lose all the seeds of his generous nature. Nor if we should give an adulterer help towards being shameless in his acts. Nor if a public peculator should lay hold of some cunning excuse from these doctrines. Nor if another who neglects his parents should be confirmed in his audacity by this teaching. What then, in your opinion, is good or bad? This or that? Why then should a man say any more in reply to such persons as these? Or give them any reason to listen to any reason from them? Or to try to convince them? By Zeus, one might much sooner expect to make catamites change their mind than those who are becoming so deaf and blind to their own evils. Of Inconsistency Some things men readily confess, and other things they do not. No one then will confess that he is a fool or without understanding. But quite the contrary, you will hear all men saying, I wish that I had fortune equal to my understanding. But men readily confess that they are timid, and they say, I am rather timid, I confess, but as to other respects you will not find me to be foolish. A man will not readily confess that he is intemperate, and that he is unjust, he will not confess at all. He will by no means confess that he is envious or a busybody. Most men will confess that they are compassionate. What then is the reason? The chief thing, or the ruling thing, is inconsistency and confusion in the things which relate to good and evil. But different men have different reasons and generally what they imagine to be base, they do not confess at all. But they suppose timidity to be a characteristic of a good disposition, and compassion also, but silliness to be the absolute characteristic of a slave. And they do not at all admit or confess the things which are offenses against society. But in the case of most errors, for this reason chiefly they are induced to confess them, because they imagine that there is something involuntary in them, as in timidity and compassion. And if a man confess that he is in any respect intemperate, he alleges love or passion as an excuse for what is involuntary. But men do not imagine injustice to be at all involuntary. There is also in jealousy, as they suppose, something involuntary. And for this reason they confess to jealousy also. Living among such men who are so confused, so ignorant of what they say, and of the evils which they have or have not, and why they have them, or how they shall be relieved of them, I think it is worth the trouble for a man to watch constantly, and to ask whether I also am one of them. 
what imagination I have about myself, how I conduct myself, whether I conduct myself as a prudent man, whether I conduct myself as a temperate man, whether I ever say this, that I have been taught to be prepared for everything that may happen. Have I the consciousness which a man who knows nothing ought to have? That I know nothing. Do I go to my teacher as men go to oracles, prepared to obey? Or do I, like a sniveling boy, go to my school to learn history and understand the books which I did not understand before, and if it should happen so, to explain them also to others? Man, you have had a fight in the house with a poor slave. You have turned the family upside down. You have frightened the neighbors. And you come to me as if you were a wise man. And you take your seat and judge how I have explained some word and how I have babbled whatever came into my head. You come full of envy and humbled because you bring nothing from home and you sit during the discussion thinking of nothing else than how your father is disposed towards you, and your brother. What are they saying about me there? Now they think that I am improving and are saying, He will return with all knowledge. I wish I could learn everything before I return, but much labor is necessary, and no one sends me anything, and the baths at Nicopolis are dirty. Everything is bad at home and bad here. Then they say, No one gains any profit from the school. Why? Who comes to the school? Who comes for the purpose of being improved? Who comes to present his opinions to be purified? Who comes to learn what he is in want of? Why do you wonder, then, if you carry back from the school the very things which you bring into it? For you come not to lay aside your principles or to correct them, or to receive other principles in place of them. By no means, nor anything like it. You rather look to this, whether you possess already that for which you come. You wish to prattle about theorems? What then? Do you not become greater triflers? Do not your little theorems give you some opportunity of display? You solve sophistical syllogisms. Do you not examine the assumptions of the syllogisms named the liar? Do you not examine hypothetical syllogisms? Why then, are you still vexed if you receive the things for which you come to the school? Yes. But if my child die, or my brother, or if I must die or be racked, What good will these things do to me? Well, did you come for this? For this do you sit by my side? Did you ever for this light your lamp or keep awake? Or when you went out to the walking place, did you ever propose any appearance that had been presented to you instead of a syllogism? And did you and your friends discuss it together? Where and when? Then you say, theorems are useless. To whom? To such as make a bad use of them. For I, salves are not useless to those who use them as they ought and when they ought. Fomentations are not useless. Dumbbells are not useless, but they are useless to some, useful to others. If you ask me now if syllogisms are useful... I will tell you that they are useful, and if you choose, I will prove it. How, then, will they in any way be useful to me? Man, did you ask if they are useful to you, or did you ask generally? Let him who is suffering from dysentery ask me if vinegar is useful. I will say that it is useful. Will it then be useful to me? I will say no. Seek first for the discharge to be stopped, and the ulcers to be closed. And do you, O men, first cure the ulcers and stop the discharge? 
be tranquil in your mind. Bring it free from distraction into the school, and you will know what power reason has. On Friendship What a man applies himself to earnestly, that he naturally loves. Do men then apply themselves earnestly to the things which are bad? By no means. Well, do they apply themselves to things which in no way concern themselves? Not to these either. It remains then, that they employ themselves earnestly only about things which are good. And if they are earnestly employed about things, they love such things also. Whoever then understands what is good can also know how to love. But he who cannot distinguish good from bad, and things which are neither good nor bad from both, how can he possess the power of loving? To love then is only in the power of the wise. How is this, a man may say, I am foolish, and yet I love my child. I am surprised indeed that you have begun by making the admission that you are foolish. For what are you deficient in? Can you not make use of your senses? Do you not distinguish appearances? Do you not use food which is suitable for your body? And clothing and habitation? Why then do you admit that you are foolish? It is in truth because you are often disturbed by appearances and perplexed, and their power of persuasion often conquers you. And sometimes you think these things to be good, and then the same things to be bad, and lastly neither good nor bad. And in short you grieve, fear, envy, are disturbed. You are changed. This is the reason why you confess that you are foolish. And are you not changeable in love? But wealth and pleasure, and in a word, things themselves, do you think sometimes them to be good, and sometimes bad? And do you not think the same men at one time to be good, at another time bad? And have you not at one time a friendly feeling toward them, and at another time the feeling of an enemy? And do you not at one time praise them? and as another time blame them. Yes, I have these feelings also. Well then, do you think that he who has been deceived about a man is his friend? Certainly not. And he who has selected a man as his friend, and is of a changeable disposition, has he good will toward him? He has not. And he who now abuses a man, and afterwards admires him, this man also has no good will to the other. Well then, did you never see little dogs caressing and playing with one another, so that you might say, there is nothing more friendly? But that you may know what friendship is, throw a bit of flesh among them and you will learn. Throw between yourself and your son a little estate and you will know how soon he will wish to bury you, and how soon you wish your son to die. Then you will change your tone and say, What a son I have brought up! He has long been wishing to bury me! Throw a smart girl between you, and do you, the old man, love her, and the young one will love her too. If a little fame intervene or dangers... It will be just the same. You will utter the words of the father of Admetus. Life gives you pleasure, and why not your father? Do you think that Admetus did not love his own child when he was little? That he was not in agony when the child had a fever? That he did not often say, I wish I had the fever instead of the child? Then when the test or the thing came and was near. See what words they utter. Were not Eteocles and Polynices from the same mother, 
and from the same father. Were they not brought up together? Had they not lived together, drunk together, slept together, and often kissed one another? So that if any man, I think, had seen them, he would have ridiculed the philosophers for the paradoxes which they utter about friendship. But when a quarrel rose between them about the royal power, as between dogs about a bit of meat, see what they say. Polynices, where will you take your station before the towers? Eteocles, why do you ask me this? Polynices, I will place myself opposite and try to kill you. Eteocles, I also wish to do the same. Such are the wishes that they utter. For universally be not deceived. Every animal is attached to nothing so much as to its own interest. Whatever then appears to it an impediment to this interest, whether this be a brother or a father or a child or beloved or lover, it hates, spurns, curses. For its nature is to love nothing so much as its own interest. This is father, and brother, and kinsman, and country, and God. When then the gods appear to us to be an impediment to this, we abuse them and throw down their statues and burn their temples, as Alexander ordered the temples of Aesculapius to be burned when his dear friend died. For this reason, if a man put in the same place his interest, sanctity, goodness, and country, and parents, and friends, all these are secured. But if he puts in one place his interest, in another his friends, and his country, and his kinsmen, and justice itself, all these give way being borne down by the weight of interest. For where the I and the mine are placed, to that place of necessity the animal inclines. If in the flesh, there is the ruling power. If in the will, it is there. And if it is in externals, it is there. If then I am there where my will is, then only shall I be a friend such as I ought to be, and son, and father. For this will be my interest, to maintain the character of fidelity, of modesty, of patience, of abstinence, of active cooperation, of observing my relations towards all. But if I put myself in one place, and honesty in another, then the doctrine of Epicurus becomes strong, which asserts either that there is no honesty, or it is that which opinion holds to be honest or virtuous. It was through this ignorance that the Athenians and the Lacedaemonians quarreled, and the Thebans with both, and the great king quarreled with Hellas, and the Macedonians with both, and the Romans with the Gete. And still earlier the Trojan War happened for these reasons. Alexander was the guest of Menelaus, and if any man had seen their friendly disposition, he would not have believed anyone who said that they were not friends. But there was cast between them, as between dogs, a bit of meat, a handsome woman, and about her war arose. And now when you see brothers to be friends appearing to have one mind, do not conclude from this anything about their friendship, not even if they swear it, and say that it is impossible for them to be separated from one another. For the ruling principle of a bad man cannot be trusted. It is insecure, has no certain rule by which it is directed, and is overpowered at different times by different appearances. But examine not what other men examine, if they are born of the same parents and brought up together, and under the same pedagogue, but examine this only, wherein they place their interest. Whether in externals or in the will, if in externals do not name them friends, no more than name them trustworthy or constant 
or brave or free. Do not name them even men if you have any judgment. For that is not a principle of human nature which makes them bite one another and abuse one another and occupy deserted places or public places as if they were mountains and in the courts of justice display the acts of robbers. Nor yet that which makes them intemperate and adulterers and corruptors, nor that which makes them do whatever else men do against one another through this one opinion only, that of placing themselves and their interests in the things which are not within the power of their will. But if you hear that in truth these men think the good to be only there where will is, and where there is a right use of appearances, no longer trouble yourself whether they are father or son or brothers, or have associated a long time and are companions. But when you have ascertained this only, confidently declare that they are friends, as you declare that they are faithful, that they are just. For where else is friendship than where there is fidelity and modesty, where there is a communion of honest things and of nothing else? But you may say, Such a one treated me with regard so long, and did he not love me? How do you know, slave, if he did not regard you in the same way as he wipes his shoe with a sponge, or as he takes care of his beast? How do you know, when you have ceased to be useful as a vessel, he will not throw you away like a broken platter? But this woman is my wife, and we have lived together so long. And how long did Eryphile live with Amphiaris? and was the mother of children and of many. But a necklace came between them. And what is a necklace? It is the opinion about such things. That was the bestial principle. That was the thing which broke asunder the friendship between husband and wife. That which did not allow the woman to be a wife, nor the mother to be a mother. And let every man among you who has seriously resolved either to be a friend himself or to have another for his friend, cut out these opinions, hate them, drive them from his soul. And thus, first of all, he will not reproach himself. He will not be at variance with himself. He will not change his mind. He will not torture himself. In the next place, to another also who is like himself, he will be altogether and completely a friend. But he will bear with the man who is unlike himself. He will be kind to him, gentle, ready to pardon on account of his ignorance, on account of his being mistaken in things of the greatest importance. But he will be harsh to no man, being well convinced of Plato's doctrine that every mind is deprived of truth unwillingly. If you cannot do this, yet you can do in all other respects as friends do, drink together and lodge together and sail together, and you may be born of the same parents, for snakes also are. But neither will they be friends, nor you so long as you retain these bestial and cursed opinions. On the Power of Speaking Every man will read a book with more pleasure or even with more ease if it is written in fairer characters. Therefore, every man will also listen more readily to what is spoken if it is signified by appropriate and becoming words. We must not say, then, that there is no faculty of expression, for this affirmation is the characteristic of an impious and also of a timid man. Of an impious man? Because he undervalues the gifts which come from God, just as if he would take away the commodity of the power of vision, or of hearing, or of seeing. Has then God given you eyes to no purpose? 
and to no purpose has he infused into them a spirit so strong, and of such skillful contrivance, as to reach a long way, and to fashion the forms of things which are seen. What messenger is so swift and vigilant? And to no purpose has he made the interjacent atmosphere so efficacious and elastic that the vision penetrates through the atmosphere which is in a manner moved. And to no purpose has he made light, without the presence of which there would be no use in any other thing. Man, be neither ungrateful for these gifts nor yet forget the things which are superior to them. But indeed, for the power of seeing and hearing, and indeed for life itself, and for the things which contribute to support it, for the fruits which are dry, and for wine and oil, give thanks to God. But remember that He has given you something else better than all these. I mean the power of using them, proving them and estimating the value of each. For what is that whom gives information about each of these powers? What each of them is worth? Is it each faculty itself? Did you ever hear the faculty of vision say anything about itself? Or the faculty of hearing? Or wheat, or barley, or a horse, or a dog? No. But they are appointed as ministers and slaves to serve the faculty which has the power of making use of of the appearances of things. And if you inquire what is the value of each thing, of whom do you inquire? Who answers you? How then can any other faculty be more powerful than this, which uses the rest as ministers and itself proves each and pronounces about them? For which of them knows what itself is and what is its own value? Which of them knows when it ought to employ itself, and when not? What faculty is it which opens and closes the eyes, and turns them away from objects to which it ought not to apply them, and does apply them to other objects? Is it the faculty of vision? No, but it is the faculty of the will. What is that faculty which closes and opens the ears? What is that by which they are curious and inquisitive, or on the contrary, unmoved by what is said? Is it the faculty of hearing? It is no other than the faculty of the will. Will this faculty then, seeing that it is amidst all the other faculties which are blind and dumb, and unable to see anything else except the very acts for which they are appointed, in order to minister this, or faculty, and serve it, but this faculty alone sees sharp and sees what is the value of each of the rest. Will this faculty declare to us that anything else is the best? Or that itself is? And what else does the eye do when it is opened than see? But whether we ought to look on the wife of a certain person, and in what manner, who tells us? The faculty of the will. And whether we ought to believe what is said or not to believe it, and if we do believe, whether we ought to be moved by it or not, who tells us? Is it not the faculty of the will, but this faculty of speaking and of ornamenting words? If there is indeed any such peculiar faculty, what else does it do when there happens to be a discourse about a thing? than to ornament the words and arrange them as hairdressers do the hair. But whether it is better to speak or to be silent, and better to speak in this way or that way, and whether this is becoming or not becoming, and the season for each and the use, what else tells us than the faculty of the will? Would you have it then to come forward and condemn itself? What then? It the will says, If the fact is so, can that which ministers be superior to that which it ministers? Can the horse be superior to the rider? Or the dog to the huntsman? Or the instrument to the musician? 
or the servants to the king? What is that which makes use of the rest? The will. What takes care of all? The will. What destroys the whole man at one time by hunger, at another time by hanging, and at another time by a precipice? The will. Then is anything stronger in men than this? And how is it possible that the things which are subject to restraint are stronger than that which is not? What things are naturally formed to hinder the faculty of vision? Both will and things which do not depend on the faculty of will. It is the same with the faculty of hearing, with the faculty of speaking in like manner. But what has a natural power of hindering the will? Nothing which is independent of the will, but only the will itself when it is perverted. Therefore this, the will, is alone vice or alone virtue. Then being so great a faculty and set over all the rest, let it, the will, come forward and tell us that the most excellent of all things is the flesh. Not even if the flesh itself declared that it is the most excellent, would any person bear that it should say this? But what is it, Epicurus, which pronounces this, which wrote about the end or purpose of our being, which wrote on the nature of things, which wrote about the canoa or rule of truth, which led you to wear a beard, which wrote when it was dying that it was spending the last and a happy day? Was this the flesh or the will? Then do you admit that you possess anything superior to this, the will? And are you not mad? Are you in fact so blind and deaf? What then? Does any man despise the other faculties? I hope not. Does any man say that there is no use or excellence in the speaking faculty? I hope not. That would be foolish, impious, ungrateful towards God. But a man renders to each thing its due value. For there is some use even in an ass, but not so much as in an ox. There is also use in a dog, but not so much as in a slave. There is also some use in a slave, but not so much as in citizens. There is also some use in citizens, but not so much as in magistrates. Not indeed because some things are superior, must we undervalue the use which other things have. There is a certain value in the power of speaking, but it is not so great as the power of the will. When, then, I speak thus, let no man think that I ask you to neglect the power of speaking. For neither do I ask you to neglect the eyes, nor the ears, nor the hands, nor the feet, nor clothing, nor shoes. But if you ask me what then is the most excellent of all things, what must I say? I cannot say the power of speaking, but the power of the will when it is right. For it is this which uses the other, or the power of speaking, and all the other faculties, both small and great. For when this faculty of the will is set right, a man who is not good becomes good, and when it fails, a man becomes bad. It is through this that we are unfortunate, that we are fortunate, that we blame one another, are pleased with one another. In a word, it is this which, if we neglect it, makes unhappiness, and if we carefully look after it, makes happiness. But to take away the faculty of speaking, and to say that there is no such faculty in reality, is the act not only of an ungrateful man toward those who gave it, but also of a cowardly man. For such a person seems to me to fear, if there is any faculty of this kind, that we shall not be able to despise it. Such also are those who say that there is no difference between beauty and ugliness. 
Then it would happen that a man would be affected in the same way, if he saw Thersites, and if he saw Achilles. In the same way, if he saw Helen and any other woman. But these are foolish and clownish notions, and the notions of men who know not the nature of each thing. But are afraid, if a man shall see the difference, that he shall immediately be seized and carried off vanquished. But this is the great matter, to leave to each thing the power or faculty which it has, and leaving to it this power to see what is the worth of the power, and to learn what is the most excellent of all things, and to pursue this always. To be diligent about this, considering all other things of secondary value compared with this. But yet, as far as we can, not neglecting all those other things. For we must take care of the eyes also, not as if they were the most excellent thing, but we must take care of them on account of the most excellent thing, because it will not be in its true natural condition if it does not rightly use the other faculties and prefer some things to others. What then is usually done? Men generally act as a traveler would do on his way to his own country, when he enters a good inn and being pleased with it should remain there. Man, you have forgotten your purpose. You were not traveling to this inn, but you were passing through it. But this is a pleasant inn... And how many other inns are pleasant? And how many meadows are pleasant? Yet only for passing through. But your purpose is this. To return to your country. To relieve your kinsmen of anxiety. To discharge the duties of a citizen. To marry. To beget children. To fill the usual magistracies. For you are not come to select more pleasant places but to live in these where you were born and of which you were made a citizen. Something of the kind takes place in the matter which we are considering. Since, by the aid of speech, and such communication as you receive here, you must advance to perfection, and purge your will and correct the faculty which makes use of the appearance of things. And since it is necessary also for the teaching or delivery of theorems to be affected by a certain mode of expression and with a certain variety and sharpness, some persons captivated by these very things abide in them. One captivated by the expression, another by the syllogisms, another again by sophisms, and still another by some other in of the kind. And there they stay and waste away as if they were among sirens. Man, your purpose or business was to make yourself capable of using, conformably to nature, the appearances presented to you, in your desires not to be frustrated, in your aversion from things not to fall into that which you would avoid, never to have no luck, as one may say, nor ever to have bad luck, to be free, not hindered, not compelled, conforming yourself to the administration of Zeus, obeying it, well satisfied with this, blaming no one, charging no one with fault, able from your whole soul to utter these verses, lead me, O Zeus, and thou too, destiny. Then having this purpose before you, if some little form of expression pleases you, if some theorems please you, do you abide among them and choose to dwell there, forgetting the things at home, and do you say, these things are fine? Who says that they are not fine? But only as being a way home, as inns are. For what hinders you from being an unfortunate man? even if you speak like Demosthenes? And what prevents you, if you can resolve syllogisms like Chrysippus, from being wretched, from sorrowing, 
from envying, in a word, from being disturbed, from being unhappy. Nothing. You see, then, that these were inns, worth nothing, and that the purpose before you was something else. When I speak thus to some persons, they think that I am rejecting care about speaking or care about theorems. But I am not rejecting this care. But I am rejecting the abiding about these things incessantly and putting our hopes in them. If a man by this teaching does harm to those who listen to him, reckon me too among those who do this harm. For I am not able when I see one thing which is most excellent and supreme, to say that another is so in order to please you. To or against a person who was one of those who were not valued or esteemed by him. A certain person said to him, Epictetus, Frequently I desired to hear you and came to you and you never gave me any answer. And now, if it is possible, I entreat you to say something to me. Do you think, said Epictetus, that as there is an art in anything else, so there is also an art in speaking, and that he who has the art will speak skillfully, and he who has not will speak unskillfully? I do think so. He then who by speaking receives benefit himself and is able to benefit others will speak skillfully, but he who is rather damaged by speaking and does damage to others, will he be unskilled in this art of speaking? And you may find that some are damaged and others benefited by speaking, and are all who hear benefited by what they hear. Or... Will you find that among them also some are benefited and some damaged? There are both among these also, he said. In this case also, then, those who hear skillfully are benefited, and those who hear unskillfully are damaged. He admitted this. Is there then a skill in hearing also, as there is in speaking? It seems so. If you choose, consider the matter in this way also. The practice of music, to whom does it belong? To a musician. And the proper making of a statue, to whom do you think that it belongs? To a statuary. And the looking at a statue skillfully, does this appear to you to require the aid of no art? This also requires the aid of art. Then if speaking properly is the business of the skillful man, do you see that to hear also with benefit is the business of the skillful man? Now as to speaking and hearing perfectly, and usefully, let us for the present, if you please, say no more, for both of us are a long way from everything of that kind but I think that every man will allow this, that he who is going to hear philosophers requires some amount of practice in hearing. Is it not so? Tell me then about what I should talk to you. About what matter are you able to listen? About good and evil. Good and evil in what? In a horse? No. Well, in an ox. No. What then, in a man? Yes. Do we know then what a man is? What the notion is which we have of him? Or have we our ears in any degree practiced about this matter? But do you understand what nature is? Or can you even in any degree understand me when I say... I shall use demonstration to show you. How? Do you understand this very thing, what demonstration is? Or how anything I demonstrated, or by what means? 
or what things are like demonstration but are not demonstration? Do you know what is true or what is false? What is consequent on a thing? What is repugnant to a thing? Or not consistent or inconsistent? But must I excite you to philosophy? And how? Shall I show to you the repugnance in the opinions of most men, through which they differ about things good and evil, and about things which are profitable and unprofitable? When you know not this very thing, what repugnance or contradiction is? Show me then what I shall accomplish by discoursing with you. Excite my inclination to do this. As the grass which is suitable when it is presented to a sheep, moves its inclination to eat. But if you present to it a stone or bread, it will not be moved to eat. So there are in us certain natural inclinations also, to speak, when the hearer shall appear to be somebody, when he himself shall excite us, but when he shall sit by us like a stone or like grass, how can he excite a man's desire to speak? Does the vine say to the husbandman, Take care of me? No, but the vine by showing in itself that it will be profitable to the husbandman, if he does take care of it, invites him to exercise care. When children are attractive and lively, whom do they not invite to play with them, and crawl with them, and lisp with them? But who is eager to play with an ass, or to bray with it? For though it is small, it is still a little ass. Why then do you say nothing to me? I can only say this to you, that he who knows not who he is, and for what purpose he exists, and what is this world, and with whom he is associated, and what things are the good and the bad and the beautiful and the ugly, and who neither understands discourse nor demonstration, nor what is true nor what is false, and who is not able to distinguish them, will neither desire according to nature, nor turn away, nor move towards, nor intend or to act, nor assent, nor dissent, nor suspend his judgment. To say all in a few words, he will go about dumb and blind, thinking that he is somebody, but being nobody. Is this so now for the first time? Is it not the fact that ever since the human race existed, all errors and misfortunes have arisen through this ignorance? Why did Agamemnon and Achilles quarrel with one another? Was it not through not knowing what things are profitable and not profitable? Does not the one say it is profitable to restore Chryseus to her father? And does not the other say that it is not profitable does not the one say that he ought to take the prize of another? And does not the other say that he ought not? Did they not for these reasons forget both who they were and for what purpose they had come there? Oh, man, for what purpose did you come? To gain mistresses or to fight? To fight? With whom? The Trojans or the Hellenes? with the Trojans. Do you then leave Hector alone and draw your sword against your own king? And do you, most excellent sir, neglect the duties of the king, you who are the people's guardian and have such cares? And are you quarreling about a little girl with the most warlike of your allies, whom you ought by every means to take care of and protect? And do you become worse than inferior to a well-behaved priest who treats you these fine gladiators with all respect? Do you see what kind of things ignorance of what is profitable does? But I am also rich. Are you then richer than Agamemnon? But I am also handsome. Are you then more handsome than Achilles? But I also have beautiful hair. But had not Achilles more beautiful hair, and gold-colored? 
and he did not comb it elegantly nor dress it. But I am also strong. Can you then lift so great a stone as Hector or Ajax? But I am also of noble birth. Are you the son of a goddess, mother? Are you the son of a father sprung from Zeus? What good then do these things do to him when he sits and weeps for a girl? But I am an orator. And was he not? Do you not see how he handled the most skillful of the Hellenes in oratory, Odysseus and Phoenix? How he stopped their mouths? That is all that I have to say to you. And I say even this not willingly. Why? Because you have not roused me. For what must I look to in order to be roused, as men who are expert in riding are roused by generous horses? Must I look to your body? You treat it disgracefully. To your dress. That is luxurious. To your behavior, to your look. That is the same as nothing. When you would listen to a philosopher, do not say to him, You tell me nothing. But only show yourself worthy of hearing, or fit for hearing. And you will see how you will move the speaker. That logic is necessary. When one of those who were present said, Persuade me that logic is necessary. He replied, Do you wish me to prove this to you? The answer was yes. Then I must use a demonstrative form of speech. This was granted. How then will you know if I am cheating you by my argument? The man was silent. Do you see, said Epictetus, that you yourself are admitting that logic is necessary. If without it you cannot know so much as this, whether logic is necessary or not necessary. What is the property of error? Every error comprehends contradiction. For since he who errs does not wish to err, but to be right. It is plain that he does not do what he wishes. For what does the thief wish to do? That which is for his own interest. If then the thief is not for his interest, he does not do that which he wishes. But every rational soul is by nature offended at contradiction, and so long as it does not understand this contradiction, it is not hindered from doing contradictory things. But when it does understand the contradiction, it must of necessity avoid the contradiction, and avoid it as much as a man must dissent from the false when he sees that a thing is false. But so long as this falsehood does not appear to him, he assents to it as to truth. He then is strong in argument and has the faculty of exhorting and confuting, who is able to show to each man the contradiction through which he errs, and clearly to prove how he does not do that which he wishes, and does that which he does not wish. For if any one shall show this, a man will himself withdraw from that which he does. But so long as you do not show this, do not be surprised if a man persists in his practice. For having the appearance of doing right, he does what he does. For this reason Socrates, also trusting in this power, used to say, I am used to call no other witness of what I say, but I am always satisfied with him with whom I am discussing. And I ask him to give his opinion and call him as a witness, and though he is only one, he is sufficient in the place of all. For Socrates knew by what the rational soul is moved, just like a pair of scales, and then it must incline whether it chooses or not. Show the rational governing faculty a contradiction, and it will withdraw from it. But if you do not show it, rather blame yourself than him who is not persuaded.
of finery in dress. A certain young man, a rhetorician, came to see Epictetus. With his hair dressed more carefully than was usual, and his attire in an ornamental style. Whereupon Epictetus said, Tell me if you do not think that some dogs are beautiful, and some horses, and so of all other animals. I do think so, the youth replied. Are then not some men also beautiful and others ugly? Certainly. Do we then for the same reason call each of them in the same kind beautiful, or each beautiful for something peculiar? And you will judge of this matter thus. Since we see a dog naturally formed for one thing, and a horse for another, and for another still as an example a nightingale, we may generally and not improperly declare each of them to be beautiful then, when it is most excellent according to its nature." But since the nature of each is different, each of them seems to me to be beautiful in a different way. Is it not so? He admitted that it was. That then which makes a dog beautiful makes a horse ugly, and that which makes a horse beautiful makes a dog ugly, if it is true that their natures are different. It seems to be so. For I think that what makes a Pancratius beautiful makes a wrestler to be not good, and a runner to be most ridiculous. And he who is beautiful for the pentathlon is very ugly for wrestling. It is so, he said. What then makes a man beautiful? Is it that which in its kind makes both a dog and a horse beautiful? It is, he said. What then makes a dog beautiful? the possession of the excellence of a dog. And what makes a horse beautiful? The possession of the excellence of a horse. What then makes a man beautiful? Is not the possession of the excellence of a man. And do you then, if you wish to be beautiful, young man, labor at this, the acquisition of human excellence? But what is this? Observe whom you yourself praise. When you praise many persons without partiality, do you praise the just or the unjust? The just. Whether do you praise the moderate or the immoderate? The moderate. And the temperate or the intemperate? The temperate. If then you make yourself such a person, you will know that you will make yourself beautiful. But so long as you neglect these things, you must be ugly even though you contrive all you can to appear beautiful. Further, I do not know what to say to you, for if I say to you what I think, I shall offend you, and you will perhaps leave the school and not return to it. And if I do not say what I think, see how I shall be acting. If you come to me to be improved, and I shall not improve you at all, and if you come to me as to a philosopher— and I shall say nothing to you as a philosopher. And how cruel it is to you to leave you uncorrected. If at any time afterwards you shall acquire sense, you will with good reason blame me and say, What did Epictetus observe in me that when he saw me in such a plight coming to him, in such a scandalous condition, he neglected me and never said a word? Did he so much despair of me? Was I not young? Was I not able to listen to reason? And how many other young men at this age commit many like errors? I hear that a certain Polemon, from being a most dissolute youth, underwent such a great change. Well, suppose that he did not think that I should be a Polemon. Yet he might have set my hair right. He might have stripped off my decorations. He might have stopped me from plucking the hair out of my body. But when he saw me dressed like... What shall I say? He kept silent. I do not know, say, like, what. But you will say when you come to your senses, and shall know what it is, and what persons use such a dress. If you bring this charge against me hereafter, what defense shall I make? Why, 
Shall I say that the man will not be persuaded by me? Was Laius persuaded by Apollo? Did he not go away and get drunk and show no care for the oracle? Well then, for this reason, did Apollo refuse to tell him the truth? I indeed do not know whether you will be persuaded by me or not, but Apollo knew most certainly that Laius would not be persuaded, and yet he spoke. But why did he speak? I say in reply, but why is he Apollo? And why does he deliver oracles? And why has he fixed himself in this place as a prophet and a source of truth, and for the inhabitants of the world to resort to him? And why are the words, Know yourself, written in front of the temple, though no person takes any notice of them? Did Socrates persuade all his hearers to take care of themselves? Not the thousandth part. But, however, after he had been placed in this position by the deity, as he himself says, he never left it. But what does he say even to his judges? If you acquit me on these conditions that I no longer do that which I do now, I will not consent, and I will not desist. But I will go up both to young and to old, and to speak plainly to every man whom I meet, and I will ask the questions which I ask now. And most particularly will I do this to you, my fellow citizens, because you are more nearly related to me. Are you so curious, Socrates, and such a busybody? And how does it concern you how we act? And what is it that you say? Being of the same community and of the same kin, you neglect yourself, and show yourself a bad citizen to the state, and a bad kinsman to your kinsmen, and a bad neighbor to your neighbors. Who then are you? Here it is a great thing to say, I am he whose duty it is to take care of men. For it is not every little heifer which dares to resist the lion. But if the bull comes up and resists him, say to the bull if you choose, And who are you? And what business have you here? Man, in every kind there is produced something which excels. In oxen, in dogs, in bees, in horses. Do not then say to that which excels, Who then are you? If you do, it will find a voice in some way and say, I am such a thing as the purple in a garment. Do not expect me to be like the others, or blame my nature that it has made me different from the rest of men. What then? Am I such a man? Certainly not. And are you such a man as can listen to the truth? I wish you were. But, however, since in a manner I have been condemned to wear a white beard and a cloak, and you come to me as to a philosopher, I will not treat you in a cruel way, nor yet as if I despaired of you. But I will say, Young man, whom do you wish to make beautiful? In the first place, Know who you are, and then adorn yourself appropriately. You are a human being, and this is a mortal animal which has the power of using appearances rationally. But what is meant by rationally? Conformably to nature and completely. What then do you possess which is peculiar? Is it the animal part? No. Is it the condition of mortality? No. Is it the power of using appearances? No. You possess the rational faculty as a peculiar thing. Adorn and beautify this. But leave your hair to him who made it as he chose. Come, what other appellations have you? Are you man or woman? Man? Adorn yourself then as man, not as woman. Woman is naturally smooth and delicate and if she has much hair on her body, she is a monster and is exhibited at Rome among monsters. And in a man it is monstrous not to have hair, and if he has no hair, he is a monster. But if he cuts off his hair and plucks them out, what shall we do with him? Where shall we exhibit him? And under what name shall we show him? 
I will exhibit to you a man who chooses to be a woman rather than a man. What a terrible sight. There is no man who will not wonder at such a notice. Indeed, I think that the men who pluck out their hairs do what they do without knowing what they do. Man, what fault have you to find with your nature? That it made you a man? What then? Was it fit that nature should make all human creatures women? And what advantage in that case would you have had in being adorned? For whom would you have adorned yourself if all human creatures were women? But you are pleased with the matter. Set to work then upon the whole business. Take away, what is its name, that which is the cause of the hairs. Make yourself a woman in all respects, that we may not be mistaken. Do not make one half man and the other half woman. Whom do you wish to please? The women? Please them as a man. Well, but they like smooth men. Will you not hang yourself? And if women took delight in catamites, would you become one? Is this your business? Were you born for this purpose, that dissolute women should delight in you? Shall we make such a one as you a citizen of Corinth, and perchance a prefect of the city, or chief of the youth, or general, or superintendent of the games? Well, and when you have taken a wife, do you intend to have your hairs plucked out? To please whom, and for what purpose? And when you have begotten children, will you introduce them also into the state with the habit of plucking their hairs? A beautiful citizen, and senator, and rhetorician. We ought to pray that such young men be born among us and brought up. Do not so. I entreat you by the gods, young man. But when you have once heard these words, go away and say to yourself, Epictetus has not said this to me, for how could he? But some propitious god threw him. For it would never have come into his thoughts to say this since he is not accustomed to talk thus with any person. Come then, let us obey God, that we may not be subject to his anger. You say, no. But I say, if a crow by his croaking signifies anything to you, it is not the crow which signifies, but God through the crow. And if he signifies anything through a human voice, Will he not cause the man to say this to you, that you may know the power of the divinity, that he signifies to some in this way, and to others in that way, and concerning the greatest things and the chief, he signifies through the noblest messenger? What else is it which the poet says? For we ourselves have warned him and have sent, Hermes the careful watcher, Argus' slayer, the husband not to kill nor wed the wife. Was Hermes going to descend from heaven to say this to him? To Aegisthus. And now the gods say this to you and send the messenger, the slayer of Argus, to warn you not to pervert that which is well arranged, nor to busy yourself about it, but to allow a man to be a man, and a woman to be a woman a beautiful man to be as a beautiful man, and an ugly man as an ugly man. For you are not flesh and hair, but you are will. And if your will is beautiful, then you will be beautiful. But up to the present time, I dare not tell you that you are ugly, for I think that you are readier to hear anything than this. But see what Socrates says to the most beautiful and blooming of men, Alcibiades. Try then to be beautiful. What does he say to him? Dress your hair and pluck the hairs from your legs? Nothing of that kind. But adorn your will. Take away bad opinions. How, with the body? Leave it as it is by nature. Another has looked after these things, entrust them to him. What then? Must a man be uncleaned? Certainly not. 
but what you are and are made by nature. Cleanse this. A man should be cleanly as a man, a woman as a woman, a child as a child. You say no, but let us also pluck out the lion's mane, that he may not be uncleaned, and the cock's comb, for he also ought to be clean. Granted, but as a cock and the lion as a lion, and the hunting dog as a hunting dog. <laughs>